Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Donald and I'll be in the background answering any WebEx technical question. We do have a few housekeeping items before we get started. I just want to let everyone know that during today's presentations, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your first speaker for today, Brian Bernhans, Executive Director. Brian, you now have the floor. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the public. I want to thank the speakers that are joining us today. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers. Our session this morning will be primarily focused on chronic wasting disease. Uh, we have gathered together some nationally recognized experts in the field of dealing with chronic wasting disease. I want to thank the public on behalf of the commissioners for being and attending this, this meeting today. And at the end, after following the CWD presentations, we will also have a few additional staff reports with seasons and bags uh, information that will be provided. At this time, I'd like to turn the mic over to Dr. Matthew Schnoop, Bureau Director for Wildlife Management, who will moderate this session. Okay, Brian, thank you very much, and, and I echo that. Uh, I thank all the speakers today. Um, I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to be able to learn more about CWD, more importantly, what other states are doing for CWD, uh, what's working, what's not working, and I think that this is really going to help us uh, move forward with, with our plan and our, um, our response to CWD here in Pennsylvania. And so a little bit of background is we provided an original draft of this plan that was out for public review for the last 11 months. Over these 11 months, we've received a lot of comments from the public, from uh, PGC staff and other agency staff, uh, collaborators, and content experts. And we adjusted the plan accordingly and, uh, and are proposing the modified draft plan today. So staff will present the draft plan to the, B the Board of Commissioners at the end of, the, at the end of today's symposium and, and allow them to provide any questions back to us that we can answer. Uh, following the, the stages of the management plan approval process, this plan will go back out for a 30-day review. After a 30-day comment period, the Board of Commissioners will vote on the draft res CWD response plan, likely during the first week of May. If the plan is approved, the agency will put this plan into action. And so today, again, is, is to gain a better understanding of what this plan is, specifically for Pennsylvania Game Commission, as well as what are other states doing or not doing. And so to start off, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Lisa Murphy. Lisa is a co-director of the Wildlife Futures Program and co-directs that with Dr. Julie Ellis. Lisa is an associate professor of toxicology at the University of Pennsylvania and resident director of the Paddles New Bolton Center. So with that, I'll pass it off to uh, Lisa. All right, great. Good morning and thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate on behalf of the Pennsylvania Wildlife Futures Program and my co-director, Dr. Julie Ellis, the opportunity to not only coordinate today's meeting, but also give you an overview of the Pennsylvania Wildlife Futures Program and some really important and exciting updates. This program has been a really wonderful opportunity to both innovate and collaborate in a partnership between PennVets, Pennsylvania Game Commission, and other important stakeholders. Next slide, please. So as a brief overview of the program, and this is really from the very beginning in terms of its first concept, is to put in place a science-based wildlife health program with the goals of increasing disease surveillance, disease management, and also having a really important aspect of innovative research to better protect wildlife across our commonwealth. So the program is administered here at Penn Vet, the only veterinary school in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, in collaboration with and funded by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And really what we're trying to do is there's been historically lots of really amazing statewide wildlife health activities, but this is the first opportunity to bring them under a single umbrella in a unified program. And so the funding that we've received has been $11 million in the first five years from Pennsylvania Game Commission. Next slide, please. So this is actually just a, a very big organizational chart here, and I'm going to take you through um, a few of the different branches here and let you know what we've been up to in this past year. So the first one here on the left 
has been the chronic wasting disease testing that's been taking place here at New Bolton Center. Next slide, please. And so this is actually a new program. So prior to this, we had the capabilities to do IHC, so immunohistochemistry testing here at New Bolton Center, but to really increase the capacity and decrease the turnaround time for chronic wasting disease testing in the state, we also added the ability to do ELISA testing as well. So we began actually setting up the lab in earnest in July of 2019 and had all of the staff, all of the equipment in place and also proficiency tested by December 9th. And that proficiency test part is actually really important is to be able to do this test, not only do you need the right instruments and the right people, but those people actually do need to pass some federally regulated proficiency tests to have permission to do this important testing. In terms of the capacity that we've been able to add to the state is the ability to process 500 to 600 samples a week, and we were able to analyze nearly 5,000 samples with 31 positives. But most notably, we were very proud that we were able to bring the turnaround time to less than 21 days for Hunter submitted samples. Next slide, please. All right, so again, as I mentioned, you know, this is a very collaborative, partnership, stakeholder-driven program. And so that does mean that we've brought in some other, some other stakeholders, some other experts to actually help with us specifically in the area of chronic wasting disease. Next slide, please. And so here's part of the team, and you'll be hearing from this team today. So Dr. Kristen Schuler from Cornell as a renowned chronic wasting disease expert, and also Nick Pinizzato with the National Deer Alliance. And this is just here on the slide, without reading it to you, some of the several activities that the National Deer Alliance has been able to do um, on behalf of Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Wildlife Futures Program, and chronic wasting disease. And please be on the lookout um, for their special website with really a wonderful host of new interactive educational resources specifically targeting the hunting community. Next slide, please. And I'd also like to highlight our working dog program. So part of the concept of having this program at Penn Vet is really that further reach into other assets, other subject matter experts, and how they can contribute not just to wildlife health, but to chronic wasting disease in particular. Next slide, please. All right, so it's always good to start a Monday morning with a dog photo, right? So we are very proud um, to actually let you know about some new, newly funded research. It's a proof of concept using detection dogs to screen white-tailed deer feces for chronic wasting disease. So you'll notice all of the different participants there um, but just to give you a little bit more background is, you know, why or how or is this going to work? Is that like many other things that detection dogs are able to find and scent um, high, in a highly reliable manner, is that chronic wasting disease also has a unique volatile organic compound profile. The added bonus is there's also good research out there that is showing that dogs themselves are very resistant to prion diseases, meaning putting them into an environment where there may be positive material puts the dog at really no risk. So the value is for them to not only be able to detect positive chronic wasting disease samples, but also to be able to show when chronic wasting disease is not present. So our hope is the results of this pilot study will be able to actually use the dog in field settings. Next slide, please. So just to show you a little bit more in terms of this proof of concept, and this is actually some photos taken from the Working Dog Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so you're seeing on the bottom left, this is a training wheel. On the bottom right, one of the dogs, and you're getting a view of the canisters that are put in place in a way that protects the dogs and the handlers from any material, but will let the volatile organic compounds needed for the dogs to do their job to be detected during the training process. Next slide, please. So what we're hoping to do with these dogs is to use them for grid searches of areas of unknown chronic wasting disease status to try to see if they can detect any positive chronic wasting disease fecal material in those areas. So the hope would be, again, is not only would they be valuable for being able to detect the presence of chronic wasting disease, 
but also there's some value in being able to show that there is an absence of this material as well. So again, at the bottom, this is actually um, a funded by several agencies. It has received funding from both the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and also from the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Next slide, please. Also, just to, of course, realize that there are certainly other wildlife disease issues here in Pennsylvania. And while chronic wasting disease is taking really the bulk of it, our time and attention right now, as it should, there are certainly other things going on as well that we're also devoting time, resources, and subject matter experts to as well. So one of the exciting things that Dr. Aman Anis, who is the section head for our molecular diagnostics lab here at New Bolton Center, is working with Greg Turner at the Pennsylvania Game Commission on white nose syndrome. So really what we're trying to do is evaluate the impact of a specific antifungal agent on the growth in bats and to assess the fungal load using real-time PCR. Another important project is looking at West Nile virus in grouse with Lisa Williams, also of the Pennsylvania Game Commission, to try to look at the genetic characteristics of West Nile virus strains circulating here in Pennsylvania and to evaluate the impact of those strains are on the health of wild birds. There does seem to be currently some variability between the lesions and the mortality rate, and this seems to be related to both host and intrinsic viral, viral factors such as virus strains. So really to tease that out and to get a better handle on West Nile virus and its impact on birds here in Pennsylvania. Next slide. All right, and then this will be my last slide here coming up is just to give you an update on some of the additional new hires here at the Pennsylvania Wildlife Futures Program. Next slide, please. So I am very pleased to be able to, to share good news about all three of these very key important positions for our program. The Wildlife Communications Liaison is a very important position in this program. And this is a representative of the program that will be stationed full time in Harrisburg at Pennsylvania Game Commission headquarters to make sure that they really have their finger on the pulse of what's going on at the Game Commission and to make sure that there's good two way communication between Game Commission and PennVet, but also um, really a resource for other stakeholders as well. So we have gone through um, numerous highly qualified candidates. It's very important that we find the best fit and we will actually be completing our final two interviews at the end of this week. The board certified wildlife pathologist, so this is a veterinarian with specialty training in wildlife pathology that we plan to have posted here at New Bolton Center, but will be a resource to the entire state and all three diagnostic laboratories within the paddle system. We had five excellent applicants. We interviewed the best three, and I'm actually very excited to tell you not only have we completed the interviews, but this week we are preparing an offer letter for our selected candidates. And then last but not least, the wildlife disease ecologist, a program that we're actually especially excited about since this will be something very new for PennVet, but extremely important for this program when it comes to disease modeling, planning passive and active surveillance, and other integrative approaches for this program. We have identified two excellent candidates and we will be interviewing them later this month. That's all I have, and with that, I will pass the ball back to Matthew and the moderator. Thank you for your time, and I'll be here for the question session this afternoon. Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate um, you catching us up on all the great things the Wildlife Futures Program is doing. Um, I'm personally very excited, and I can speak for um, the rest of the agency when I say that, that we're very excited about this program and, and what you've already been able to do with, um, with the time that you've been given, and so uh, keep up the good work. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our, our, our next speaker, who's Brian Richards. Brian is uh, an Emergent Disease Coordinator at the USGS in Madison, Wisconsin. And so, uh, Brian has been around CWD um, and, and seems to have uh, his hand in, in, in every facet that involves CWD. And so, we're excited to have Brian here today. He's going to give us a little bit of a background about CWD across the nation, as well as um, some more specifics on management. So, Brian? Good morning. Just want to make sure you can hear me there, Matthew. Everybody else? I've got you loud and clear, Brian. All right, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Um, from uh, not very sunny south central Wisconsin this morning, but uh, it's uh, there's no snow on the ground, so it's a good thing. Um, 
Uh, my name is Brian Richards. I'm a wildlife biologist at the U.S. Geological Survey's National Wildlife Health Center here in Madison, Wisconsin. Our science center, uh, we conduct diagnostics and wildlife disease research and provide epidemiological and technical assistance to state, tribal, and federal partners. Uh, we're, the, we're the only federal facility with a focus solely on wildlife health to benefit wildlife. So we've been around since uh, 1975 and involved with a number of wildlife disease issues since that time. Uh, some of those disease issues, which you see up there on the, on the timeline in front of you, strictly involve wildlife. Others have the potential to cross over into domestic livestock. And others, disease issues that we refer to as zoonoses, have the potential to spill you know, from wildlife into humans and sometimes from, from humans back into wildlife. Uh, we've been involved with, with CWD since 2002, immediately after it was detected, first detected in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so I mentioned the main reason we work with wildlife disease and health issues is truly, you know, for wildlife. But we're also concerned about the potential for wildlife disease to spill over into these other sectors. It's estimated that probably some 60 to 70 percent of emerging infectious diseases of humans come from animals, and the majority of these are from wildlife. This map from a 2004 publication in, in the journal Nature uh, shows many of these types of events. And actually, I thought it was kind of interesting that you may recognize the author of note of this article from 2004, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, he's uh, come really into prominence in the last, in the last couple of weeks and months. So, so today we're hearing about another of these emerging infectious diseases of humans, the, the SARS um, um, coronavirus 19 and the human disease caused by it, the COVID-19. The origin of that virus is, is uncertain at this point, but it's likely that it originated in a bat and potentially with an intermediate mammalian host before it jumped into humans. And I think we're all pretty aware of what it's doing now that, it, now that it's established in human populations. Um, just very, very briefly, the, the National Wildlife Health Center, we've, we've been extremely, extremely busy, as most other agencies have since the detection of COVID-19. And just a couple highlights, you know, the things we're involved with. First, I think really importantly, uh, while the majority of our employees are teleworking, we remain open and, and can pull staff in to investigate mortality events in wildlife. So we're still here providing services. Second, we're involved with a host of other agencies attempting to collectively assess the various potential risks posed by this virus, not only to human health, but in the case of potential spillover back into wildlife. I don't know if anybody caught the news yesterday or maybe even this morning, but we had the first cases uh, of, uh, of what looks obviously like spillover from humans into great cats at the Bronx Zoo. And so that uh, just, just clarifies that there is that risk of disease spillover or reverse zoonotic of, uh, spillover back to wildlife. Along that line, we're planning several inoculation trials to determine whether some of our North American wildlife species could become spillover hosts for this virus. And we're also looking at conducting passive surveillance, looking for evidence of these coronaviruses in wildlife that are submitted to us during mortality events. So again, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to, uh, to present today. I think when we first talked about this, it was going to be in person, uh, but under the circumstances, we're going to do the best we can with these remote presentations. Um, I was asked to give two real short presentations today. The first is kind of a primer on CWD before we, we head into you know, management and experiences in the states, things like that. So we'll start just with this very short primer. Um, first, you know, what is CWD? CWD is a member of a family of diseases we call TSEs, or transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Great big long words, but it boils down very, very simply if we look at even Webster's Dictionary as a disease that makes holes in the brain that can be given from one individual to another. That's what a TSE is. Now, the photo on the right side of this slide is a section of an animal's brain with a TSE. And in it, you can see both the cause and the effect of these diseases. At, at the very center of that scan is what we refer to as an amyloid plaque. 
which is an aggregate of disease-associated prion protein. And around the outside of that plaque, you can see some white holes forming. And these are the vacuoles that are associated with prion deposition. And in these holes, there is where neurons used to reside. The prions facilitate the death of neurons, literally leaving microscopic holes in the brain. And when enough neurons have been killed, the animal dies. So this slide lists some of the, the characteristics of CWD. First, CWD is a TSC, or that transmissible sponge form encephalopathy, in the same category of diseases, which include things like Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease in humans and bovine sponge form encephalopathy, or mad cow disease in cattle. The hallmarks of all TSCs are extended, long incubation periods, progressive neurological degeneration, a relatively brief clinical phase, followed by death. CWD and its cousin Scrapie and sheep are quite unique among TSEs in that diseased animals shed infectious agent via bodily fluids and could directly infect other members of their species. Transmission can be via direct contact or indirect with a contaminated intermediate environmental fomite. Vertical transmission has been documented, but it's likely that it plays a quite small role in nature. Incubation period for CWD, like the rest of the TSEs, is protracted. Um, we figure maybe close to two years on average, followed by a very brief clinical phase before death. Infected animals shed infectious agent long before the onset of clinical disease, and these shed prions can persist in the environment for years, likely even decades. We tend to see higher infection rates in males and in older age classes of each sex. And this is something we may be able to leverage, these, these characteristics, these sex and age demographic characteristics are something we may be able to leverage in management interventions. At this time, other than, than harvest-based tools, we don't have a lot of, of, of tools available for you know, actively addressing CWD on the ground. There's little evidence of widespread genetic resistance as well. So when you look at the combination of these characteristics, CWD is extremely challenging to manage in free-ranging populations, especially once it becomes established in those populations. So uh, this is the last slide in this introductory set. And it talks about you know, steps or kind of tenets of, of wildlife disease management. It was put together in 2004 in this document called the Multi-State CWD Guidelines. And this was you know, wildlife health experts from the various states and some of the federal entities and laboratories out there uh, that, that put together kind of the first, first swing at, at kind of the tenets. How should we deal with wildlife disease? But I would argue that these are important not only from wildlife disease management, but also apply very much so to domestic livestock, to companion animals, and actually to human medicine as well. So first, prevention is key. Do everything you can you know, to try and keep from getting CWD or other diseases, maybe COVID-19. But if those preventative measures are not successful, then the next thing you need to, to really consider is minimizing the potential for disease spread. Try and keep it where it is. Monitor for new outbreaks, conduct surveillance. And when you discover it in a new area, Try and measure it. Determine the magnitude and the extent of that outbreak in a new geographic area. Manage infection rates within affected areas. This is a tough one. We are finding it's tough with some human diseases today, and it's very, very challenging with regard to CWD, especially with the limited tool set that we have. Support research. That one should go without saying. If we don't have the tools that we need to be effective today, we were not likely to have them tomorrow, next week, or next year unless we invest in research. And finally, provide timely, complete, accurate information to all stakeholders. I, I think it's very clear that a, that a well-informed populace is in a much better position to provide us support for the management activities, management interventions that we want to undertake. So that's it for the first section. 
And Matthew, I don't know if you want to open it up for, for any questions from, from board members at this point in time or whether we want to roll directly into you know, the, next, uh, the next portion of this. But I wanted to provide an opportunity um, if there are questions on that very brief disease background. Brian, I think we'll, um, we'll hold the questions till the end. Um, and I've, I've asked the board that they hold uh, detailed questions until the panel discussion where you all can respond at the same time uh, at two o'clock today. And so what we'll do is we'll just hold, uh, unless they have any clarification questions, we'll hold questions until the panel discussion. That sounds good. All right, so I will roll then into you know, the next section here. And this second presentation is, uh, the part I'm gonna cover is the first half of a presentation that Nick Pinizzato and I gave uh, to the Southeastern Deer Study Group earlier this year. And, and it focuses on what I believe is perhaps the biggest challenge with regard to chronic wasting disease. I, I absolutely believe we have the tool today that can alter disease outcomes. But we have, we've been less than successful implementing that tool, largely because we have not achieved buy-in and support from stakeholders, specifically our hunters and landowners. So, so I'm going to start out discussing more about, you know, the biology of, of CWD and how harvest-based tools could be implemented. Then Nick is going to cover some of the reasons why we have been so challenged in, in being successful. Before I start, I really do need to add, a, you know, a bit of a disclaimer. I personally uh, do not have management authority anywhere except for the small tract of land where I live and the couple hundred acres where I hunt. And even those are constrained by the regulations of the state where I live. I'm gonna be discussing active management, but clearly it is your prerogative, not mine, how or indeed whether you decide to manage CWD. So with that, um, I regularly hear, you know, that people referring to CWD as an existential threat. Well, I don't believe the, the biology of this disease suggests that CWD is an existential threat to deer themselves. It's not likely to eliminate every last deer, but it, it could well be an existential threat to the North American model of wildlife conservation. And on this slide, you see the, the tenets of the North American model, which you know, your board is very, very familiar with. And back in 2012, the Wildlife Society and the Boone and Crockett Club published a paper where they identified and really discussed the tenets of the North American model. Um, I highly suggest you know, reading it. It's, a, it's an excellent background on, on how we go about wildlife management in North America and especially in the United States. So the model was implemented when wildlife really were in a lot of trouble. And that model has shown time and time again, it works very, very well to restore wildlife, to restore habitat, and to manage habitat in wildlife. But that model, I believe, is very challenged by something like chronic wasting disease. The model requires stakeholder support in order to function. And while it's not a tenet of the model, the model relies heavily on the concept of user pay, user benefit. Hunters provide fiscal support for all of wildlife management. The hunters are the biggest contributor to you know, the, the, uh, the model, the economic model uh, that supports all of, white, of, of uh, wildlife management in North America. And so if we lose hunters, if they stop hunting, not, not only will it affect game species themselves, but it'll affect all wildlife conservation. Some characteristics, observations, characteristics of CWD. In the beginning, in that first slide deck, we started about kind of out with kind of the biology, you know, the background biology of CWD. Here I'm talking about things that we see out there on the landscape. Number one, dramatic geographic spread. Um, CWD, when I started looking at this, was you know in a you know in southeastern corner of Wyoming, the northeastern corner of Colorado, and a little bit of spillover into Nebraska, and was in a very small number of captive cervid facilities. Today, um, some 20 years later, CWD has been detected in in 26 states in the United States in captive and/or commercial commercial uh, facilities, uh, three Canadian provinces. It's been picked up in South Korea, 
in in uh, captive elk that, uh, curiously enough, had Canadian ear tags in them. Also picked up most recently in three different Scandinavian countries, in Norway, Finland, and Sweden. Increasing prevalence, at least in a local area. So in areas where CWD has been established the longest, we tend to see quite high prevalence in some sectors of that population. Out in uh, Wyoming in a couple study areas um, where, uh, where doctoral theses were prepared, we see prevalence you know, in that 40 plus range, percentile range, or 40, 50% of adult males being affected with CWD. In the southwestern portion of Wisconsin, in the, in the hot zones there, we see prevalence in adult males uh, essentially at 50%. So if you, if you kill a three-year-old buck out there in that country, take a quarter out of your pocket, flip it in the air, and that's the chances that that animal has CWD. Um, prevalence in adult females in maybe one out of three deer in that same geographic area. So uh, it, it, prevalence rising up to, to areas that are likely challenge the sustainability of, of the, those herd units. CWD, as, as all members of all TSEs or prion diseases, always fatal, but we tend not to see a lot of deer dying of CWD, and that's because they've already died of something else. CWD, because the hallmark is progressive neurological degeneration, predisposes those affected animals to virtually every other source of mortality. We know that CWD-positive animals are more likely to uh, fall to predators. We know that CWD animals, at least in, in a couple of heavy zones, are more likely to get hit by Fords or Buicks or Chevys. And it's likely that, that, um, that CWD positive animals are susceptible to hunting because hunting is merely another form of predation. So, so these animals die of all the things that deer die of normally, but at a much faster rate, and they die much earlier in life. Consequences of these characteristics we see out there on the landscape. We've identified, demonstrated, you know, or we have demonstrated population impacts. And these have been published in, in a couple of areas out west for both mule deer, white-tailed deer, and Rocky Mountain elk. But I want to be clear here that population decline or disease driving populations down to unsustainable levels are at the far end of what I refer to as population impacts. Initially with disease, um, CWD would be what we would think of as a compensatory source of mortality. As prevalence increases, CWD will likely move from being compensatory into additive. And that's where we start seeing declining herd performance, and at some point we'll see harvestable surpluses start to diminish. And that will happen long before we would see actual population decline. Herd structure shifts or demographic shifts. These have been experienced in a couple of areas out west, um, and it likely is occurring in other high prevalent zones. And this is where if you are managing for older aged deer, especially males, you know, trying to manage for, you know, four, five, six year old males, if your prevalence is up around 40 to 50 percent in adult males, it turns out very few will, will make it into those age categories. So if, you're, if, you're try, if your business model is, revolves around managing for older age males, it's likely to fail in the long term. Hunter behavior and participation changes are predicted. The human dimensions research has time and time again identified that when prevalence starts rising, when it gets up into those, you know, those larger figures, that either an individual hunter or that hunter's family will alter their behavior for them. And either they will decide to go hunting elsewhere, or in some cases, unfortunately, it looks like some hunters may hang it up altogether. And certainly the last, they're the fiscal impacts to natural resource agencies. That's certainly both an immediate uh, concern, um, as, as the Commonwealth found out, when you had to divert a large amount of resources, including staff time, over to CWD-related activities. That's a very large immediate cost. 
but the potential long-term costs. If hunters alter their behaviors, stop purchasing hunting licenses, that's where it comes back to threatening the North American model itself. So what do we do? Um, Dr. Mike Miller with the state of Colorado and Dr. John Fisher at the uh, Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study presented a paper at the North American Natural Resources Conference back in 2016. And, and in that paper, they boiled down why we might care about CWD into two overarching reasons. The first is that CWD is, is pretty hard on deer. The second is that we cannot rule out that CWD might cross a species barrier and cause disease in humans. I'm really going to focus on that first one. So, so based on the characteristics, the consequences, I would argue that it, it's prudent to attempt to alter outcomes, to try and manage this disease, to, to not let it do what it does on its own on the landscape. The Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, tends to agree. Um, they put out a document about uh, reg regarding management um, of CWD in 2018. In that document, they recognize that we are not likely to eliminate disease, but they do also stipulate that opportunities remain for responsible management agencies to stabilize or suppress CWD outbreaks and thereby minimize impacts and potentially irreparable harm. Strong words, irreparable harm to the resource. This slide is, is all about the be, kind of the beginning of a discussion about human dimensions. And, and Jordan Pachenik is a, is a very strong human dimensions researcher who recently retired from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. He was around when CWD was first um, detected in Wisconsin and, and put together just volumes of, of very valuable HD work. And so early on, and this has been repeated time and time again, that, that suggests that there is attitudinal support out there from both landowners and hunters to take more deer. In the face of CWD, our agency's missions typically are to protect the health and integrity of the resource, and landowners and hunters supported doing something about it. So, so here is the documented distribution of CWD back in 2005. This is a couple years after the initial detection in Wisconsin in 2002. Uh, note that CWD had just been picked up in New York, both in captive and in, in two free-ranging animals uh, adjacent to those captive facilities, and in West Virginia. But at that point in time, there was no evidence that CWD was in Pennsylvania. I'm going to flash forward to a current distribution. Again, 26 states. Um, those dots on the map represent commercial captive facilities, and there's nearly 130 of them in the, in the lower 48 where CWD has been detected. So, so that change in distribution between 2005 and current clearly suggests that the attitudinal support on the part of landowners and hunters was not enough. If we had the behavioral support, potentially this map would not look that way today. So, so what happened? Well, it turns out that support was conditional. Landowners and hunters had to be convinced that their efforts would make a difference in order to support and participate. And it turns out we were very challenged in, in obtaining and maintaining that support. And because they were not convinced, the attitudinal support did not trans translate into behavioral support. Hunters and landowners did not, did not follow through with that attitudinal support by altering their behaviors with active management. Now, there's a host of restraining forces. And I think you know, this, is, this list on the right-hand side here is there's likely no surprises to folks like yourselves, the Board of Commissioners. And I'm not going to further discuss these, as, as that's what Nick is going to, uh, to delve into a little bit. But it's very clear that the, the restraining forces have countered and, and outweighed the attitudinal support. We just have not seen the behavioral support across the board necessary to be successful. 
Now, there have been what I would identify as some success stories, and I have three of them up there, the ones that, that I refer to most, uh, most of the time. There are other success stories as well, but I'll focus in on these three. New York, they identified CWD before it became established. They removed two positives from the wild and never found another one after you know, 15 years of additional surveillance have not found another one. That's success. Norway. Norway mounted the most aggressive response to disease in a free-ranging population possible. They removed an entire herd unit. Over 2,000 reindeer from a single geographic area were lethally removed. And they have collected over 60,000 additional samples from the surrounding areas and have found no more affected reindeer. So again, has, has the has the, uh, very much a, an appearance of success. Illinois. Illinois detected CWD uh, just a couple months after we detected it in Wisconsin, and they implemented targeted removals with what I would refer to as surgical precision. They find positives on the landscape and remove all deer in the immediate vicinity. It's very challenging to do, especially over the long haul, but there's evidence suggesting it works. And I believe you'll hear more about this approach a little bit later this morning. We can add to that. What about the states that don't have CWD? They're clearly successful. But I have to you know, issue a bit of a caution comes with that. As a couple states have very recently discovered, CWD can go undetected for protracted periods of time if your surveillance is inadequate. And in a couple cases, when these states first detected it, disease was clearly established, had been on the landscape for a long period of time, and it kicks their management efforts into that much more of a challenging uh, paradigm as opposed to New York that found it clearly right away. So to date, no other state or province has been able to implement what Norway did, trying to re re essentially remove all the animals in a single herd unit. A couple have tried, and those, those efforts were not successful. They did not have the added, or behavioral support of landowners and hunters, and that translated into essentially you know, these, areas, these uh, uh, jurisdictions had to retract their efforts and, and stop doing what they were trying to do. Also recognize that not all states can implement the strategy that Illinois has used over the course of almost 20 years, but there are a couple that are really trying to do the similar things, and you're going to hear from them a little bit later today as well. A couple observations. When we look at that limited list of places that, that I would argue constitutes success, uh, it's quite clear that the absence of management, there's a couple states and jurisdictions out there that uh, have m merely conducted surveillance. Surveillance is not management. Surveillance is, is, is monitoring. It's watching what's going on. And in the absence of management, uh, the outcomes are quite predictable. I'll even go a step further. There are several jurisdictions that have attempted quite low intensity interventions. Things like adding a couple days to a hunting season or, or adding a doe tag here or there. Uh, these are not likely to be very effective once disease is established in a free ranging population. Opportunities. I think there's a, when we think about CWD management, I like to boil it down into two separate um, categories. The first is that prevention, prevention, prevention thing. If you don't have CWD, I think the states that do have CWD would suggest to you to do everything you can to keep it that way. And so these are, are fairly obvious things we can do. Identify how infectious material could come to your jurisdiction typically brought in by humans, and then address those risk factors, things like moving live deer, things like moving deer, hunt, you know, hunted carcasses, things like lures and attractants, um, you know, things like carcass management on the landscape, 
some of these, uh, many of these, many states have, have been quite successful at implementing these things, and, and they are quite, are actively reducing the risk that humans will move disease around the landscape. The second category is that active management. If your efforts to prevent disease are not successful and you have disease in, on the landscape in free-ranging you know, um, free populations, that's where you would want to move into active management. And here's something where you, know, you would establish goals and your goals would, would hopefully alter outcomes. But I urge you to think about your goals in very, very measurable terms. Kind of a pet peeve of mine, um, a number of states um, have identified a goal as slowing the spread. Well, that sounds good, and, and it's a lofty goal, but it's really challenging to measure. How can you determine whether the activities, whether the measures you have implemented on the ground are actually slowing the spread. And if you're, if, and, and if five years down the road, if your goal was slow the spread and you can't measure whether you were successful, it'll be much more challenging to keep that goal in place. You won't have support. You won't keep support if you can't measure your goals and show your stakeholders that you, in fact, have been, have been successful. So I keep coming back. The, the tool we have available today is harvest-based. It's, it's the gun, to be quite honest. So, but, but it's not just merely hunting. Using that tool, harvest-based management, you would need to be aggressive. Uh, look at what Norway did. Look at what Illinois has done. Must be sustained. Look at what Illinois has done. I think that uh, Illinois... Um, you know, Dr. Shelton will talk a little bit in, in another area um, is bovine tuberculosis in, in northwestern part of Minnesota, where they essentially tried every way to take every deer off the landscape that they could in the disease-affected area. And they kept finding out that, you know, it, there were more deer out there than, than what they could kill. So you have to be aggressive. You have to be sustained. You will not alter outcomes overnight. Removing impediments to removing deer. How many states, and I'm not sure what Pennsylvania has because I'm not that familiar with your rules, how many states limit harvest to a single male animal, a single buck? Now, we know bucks are most likely to be CWD positive, but yet we tend to protect them more than any other cohort of deer. Creating incentives to remove deer. And this one, I think, requires thinking outside the box. Uh, hunters and landowners don't support um, any sort of a, a direct putting a bounty on deer, and that's understandable. But I thought it was real interesting. I was at a meeting a, a year or so ago where there were some folks there that were not involved with deer management, and they were thinking outside the box. And we started talking about how do you create incentives for landowners to allow more harvest on their land? And this uh, non-hunting related person said, well, what do landowners hate worse than anything? Property taxes. And so what about the possibility? This was just mentioned in passing. I thought it was a great out-of-the-box type idea. What if for participating and allowing public to access your land, your property taxes were cut down by some sizable proportion? Could landowners buy into some sort of an effort like that? I don't know, but it, it takes that type of thinking outside the box in order to be successful. So getting back to the harvest. Now, if we're going to be successful, we would like to select the animals that are most likely to be positive for disease. You want to focus on the positives now. You want to focus on the cohorts of animals that are most likely to become positive in the near, in the near future. And also, I would argue, we'd want to focus on cohorts of animals who are most likely to move disease from location A to location B on their own. So the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the Western states, the, uh, um, the wildlife health professionals from these states and provinces put together uh, these guidelines, uh, recommendations for adaptive management of CWD in the West. 
the first set of harvest management tools uh, is based on, you know, recall that bucks tend to have that higher prevalence. So it might make sense to focus harvest efforts on them. Kill more bucks or bias your harvest towards bucks. Next, shift the timing of your harvest to increased harvest of, of those males. And I'll use the example from, from out east or, or here where I live in Wisconsin, perhaps using the most effective weapons we have during the peak of the rut. Leverage what you have in deer in order to increase that harvest. And finally, you know, targeting places where there's a lot of disease or places where disease looks like it's recent and gaining a foothold. Maybe what I refer to as those sparks around the outside. Uh, leveraging harvest to try and extinguish those sparks before they take hold and become you know, extensions of your endemic area. The, uh, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is a, uh, um, a non-governmental entity uh, uh, comprised of the, of the natural resource management agencies from all 50 states and the provinces. This group has been around for over 100 years, and Pennsylvania is a member of AFWA. Again in 2018, the, the, the wildlife health professionals from the 50 states developed a set of what are referred to as best management practices for CWD. And this document is available online as well. Uh, one section of the document is entitled Managing CWD Prevalence, and, and it's quite similar to the WAFLA guide. So we'll take a look at the first four, you know, targeting the portion of the population most likely to have CWD, targeting animals in known CWD hotspots, adjust the timing to, remote, to most effectively remove infected animals, and reducing cervid density in CWD-positive areas with high animal density. So remember, you know, this is the challenge. Deer with CWD, until that very bitter end when they display clinical signs, look just like every other deer out there on the landscape. And by the time they reach that clinical phase of disease, if they live that long, they've been actively shedding disease for likely over a year. So how do we selectively harvest to alter outcomes? We use what we know about disease patterns in different sex and age cohorts. So which ones? Well, adult males. Remember, adult males are the most likely to be positive. So if you're in a CWD zone, they're an obvious thing to remove. What about yearling males? Well, before they become adults, we know that they're, in a year they're going to be in that highest prevalence cohort out there on the landscape. So maybe it makes sense to remove them before they get to that cohort. Adult females, again, uh, higher prevalence than younger females, but here it's pretty challenging for at least some hunters to identify the difference between you know, younger and older age females. What about yearlings, all yearlings? Well, these are the animals who are most likely to have recently dispersed. So if you were on an area immediately adjacent to where CWD is, um, it, may, it seems to make sense to remove these animals, to forestall the movement of disease and into your area as long as possible. And males clearly are the identifiable ones. What about fawns? Well, these make sense before they disperse at 12 months of age and could move disease. But again, really, really challenging for at least you know, some hunters to be able to identify. It's easier if they're standing next to an adult but a fawn standing alone at you know, a couple hundred yards out is pretty challenging for most folks to be able to identify you know, what that animal is. So what would, we, what would we be looking for? What are the anticipated outcomes of using you know, these harvest-based strategies? So first, reducing deer density. If, if you reduce deer density in a CWD endemic area, you will end up with fewer positive deer you will end up with fewer deer transmitting disease. You will end up with fewer deer shedding infectious agent. You will end up with fewer deer dispersing and likely a shorter on average dispersal distance. Now what we're trying to leverage in addition is that, is that observation that hunters are likely selecting for positive deer, much as predators are. And if they are, we have an opportunity to impact prevalence and disease transmission itself. The longer, the harder you hunt, 
the more likely you are to impact prevalence and transmission. Male-focused harvest. We're trying to leverage the fact that we observe higher prevalence and sometimes substantially higher prevalence in males than we do females. And there, we're trying to impact prevalence and disease transmission. Younger animals, especially yearlings, we're trying to leverage a couple things. One is that we know they're going to be in the highest prevalence category next year. So reduce the number of animals entering into that higher prevalence cohort. We're also attempting to leverage dispersal patterns of deer by removing animals likely to have recently actively moved disease. So let's say on opening day you're you know, really, really fortunate and all three of these animals make themselves uh, available to you at the same time. Which one do you remove? Or maybe which one do you remove first? I would argue it depends on where you are, whether CWD is present where you are, whether CWD is right next to, adjacent to where you are, or whether it's distant from you. Open question. So in summary, it's very clear that chronic wasting disease is spreading geographically and increasing in prevalence, at least in the areas where it has been established the longest. And I believe the, uh, uh, the data that you've collected in, in Pennsylvania mimics these. It's spreading geographically. It's increasing in prevalence. I would argue that long-term outcomes without intervention are largely predictable. I would also argue that outcomes can be altered, but likely only with aggressive and sustained effort. And I'll leave you with that. And I, and I believe now it's... Uh, we're going to pass it over to uh, to Nick, who will identify some of the some of the reasons we've been so very challenged. So thank you. And again, I guess our, our Matthew, did you say we're going to wait till the end for all questions? Yeah, yeah. I've asked the commissioners um, to put together any questions they have, uh, and, and we can bring that stuff up uh, during the panel discussion when all speakers will be available. So you're right. I'd like to pass this over to Nick Penizzato. Nick is the uh, president and CEO of the National Deer Alliance. So, Nick, thank you for your time today. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, and it's my, my pleasure to be here. I only wish that we could be uh, doing this in person, but we will we'll get through it. And thanks, Brian. As, as Brian had said, we had presented together earlier this year on this issue, and I'm happy to give my side of it. Um, and and the, the human element is obviously a critical, critical part of this plan, and um, I'm going to go through some of that today. I'm much more the social scientist as opposed to the, uh, the the biologist here, so I think it'll be a unique perspective for you. I just want to mention briefly that the National Deer Alliance, we focus on a policy that impacts deer hunting and the hunting industry across the country, and we are nationwide, so we actually look after all deer species across the country, represent all hunters. Uh, but ironically, I am in the unique position of being a Pennsylvania native, and I live in western Pennsylvania. And I hunt in Pennsylvania, so I'm uh, kind of uniquely positioned to to be talking about this. So, and I also want to mention that we're very shortly going to be uh, introducing our CWD Resource Center, where we have tons of great information uh, about this issue. We're about to release a 14-part video series, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, later on. So. Uh, with that, I'll just say that uh, having the opportunity to work across the country on this issue, I have really just about seen it all, and I'm going to present some of that uh, to you here today. So how did we get here? And one of the biggest challenges with this disease is it really is the land of misinformation. It's really difficult for the average sportsman to understand what part of the story they're to believe, and also people are naturally biased uh, and skeptical. So there are a lot of reasons we are sort of where we are today with the information challenge. So public figures, for example, and this is one that, that I pulled that I thought was pretty relevant. You know, CWD is a scam, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out why it's being jammed down our throats, stand up and fight, us against them. Uh, very divisive kind of words here. So uh, people see this. People um, are sort of uh, they're the fans of, of, of some of these folks that say these things, and so therefore they've got an affinity bias and they want to believe it. 
Uh, the problem with it is though, I think it's great and wonderful to be skeptical and ask questions, but being divisive is ends up being destructive and it makes it harder for us to do our jobs here. So be, be passionate, but be careful and courteous about your questions. And uh, many people on the, on the uh, stream today will, will remember this. And I think, again, it's just another caution to say it's really dangerous to say more than you actually know and to make promises that you, that you likely can't keep. Um, you, you can't throw something out and say, well, the reason we haven't achieved it yet is because we just don't have the money. We could say that about anything. I could come up with a cure for, say that I have a cure for COVID-19 right now and say the only thing stopping me is more money. Um, I think that ultimately people really do want to help. They want to be helpful. But I had to answer questions all across the country when, when this had happened about, the, I heard that the Pennsylvania Game Commission came out with a cure on CWD. So um, again, I think people really do want to help, but the perception is really important here. And it's why it's so hard for us to uh, convince people that, about the issue and to educate them. Uh, this is more of a national story. So over the last winter, uh, there was some pressure to stop some of the uh, some of the elk feeding uh, program, uh, which is really popular out west to, to, with the harsh winters to try to keep some of these animals, uh, help them get through the winter, keep them alive. And, and this is just from a local blogger there. And again, some of these big important words that people get. Pressure is misguided. It's dangerous. Um, activist groups, uh, CWD is fear mongering. So they actually... The, the fear the issue of not feeding deer and elk more than they fear the issue of the potential spread of CWD. So again, it's very passionate, but the words matter here and we have to be careful about that. And we also have this new challenge. So these are just a few properties that I pulled from Pennsylvania to show that now we are really living in this world of more micromanagement of deer and wildlife. So people buy their own little slice of heaven. Uh, and then there's so local management can, can really be great. I think it's great to put management into the hands of, hands of people, but the downside of that is, um, so you have all these companies now out there s selling these properties, which is good, uh, but the problem now is you, if you're a person that has done this, you've sort of poured your life savings out into buying your, your little slice of heaven. It's really difficult then if someone comes to you and says, well, in the area that you have your property, we may want to reduce the deer herd a little bit. That's a really hard pill for people to swallow, and I totally get that. Uh, so when you go to someone and say, hey, we may need to, to shoot more deer in a particular area, you drew the bad card, you happen to be in a, in a disease management area, it's a really tough conversation to have, and I 100% get that. So there are these competing interests, and here's an example from Buffalo County, Wisconsin, uh, where the Deer Advisory Council there, they've got a growing deer herd, and people frankly, just aren't shooting enough does because, let's be honest, people don't go to Buffalo County, Wisconsin, or Iowa, or Illinois to shoot does. They're going there to shoot mature bucks, which I totally get. Um, and as you can see, this person says, um, it's killing restaurants, it's killing taxidermists, um, if, if, if we say we're not going to have a buck season, which is what was suggested here. Now, ultimately, we understand they really weren't going to cancel the buck season, but when you, they throw this out there to say, listen, we have a deer problem here, and part of it is we're not killing enough deer. Um, so uh, very similar to what you may be seeing today or what we are seeing today with COVID-19, it's, it's economy versus, versus people. So what's better for the deer? What's better for the economy? And it's very challenging. So there are these competing interests there. And then also... How hunters perceive the issue really varies across the country. So, or or even within. So, if we're looking at Pennsylvania, you may live the, as as far as you can possibly be from a disease management area, and chances are you're not going to look at this disease the same way as someone that is living in a DMA. So, here's an example from a study that we did with Cornell University, and I'll reference this again later. That shows uh, this is a, a survey of, of National Deer Alliance members who are. People that join the National Deer Alliance are typically people who uh, want to just know more about the policy end of things. They want to know more about these issues. And it's deer and deer hunting is more than just about hunting for them. So they're very educated on this issue because we talk about it all the time. So when you ask them about CWD risk, they say it's dreadful, increasing, observable. Uh, it's something that we need to worry about and be concerned about. Uh, interesting though, in, interestingly, though, when you talk to people in Maine, where this information comes from, from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Conservation, 
they're more concerned about things like harsh winters, coyotes, habitat loss, uh, food. CWD is, is much lower on the list of concerns for them because they have not detected it in that state, so therefore it's, it's really uh, perceived differently. And then there's also the seeing is believing aspect of this. So, um, you know, the precautionary principle is, is, is a very interesting one. So, uh, so you hear all the time people say, well, where are all the dead deer? Because they don't see it. And if I don't see it, I don't believe it. And this is actually, as we're going through the COVID-19, uh, the, the pandemic, I have seen this if you, if you are scouring Twitter and you see some of the things people post. Some people that aren't in the areas like New York City or even in Pennsylvania, eastern Pennsylvania, where they don't see it, it's, it's very hard for them to believe it. They may live in a county that has one or two cases, uh, so they almost don't believe it and they think it's an overreaction. Um, but by the time you're seeing it, whether it be COVID-19 or CWD, it's too late at that point. Uh, we're actually in the process right now putting together an article on this very issue when people say, well, where are all the dead deer? And I think it'll be interesting when we put it out there. And I always, I always go to Twitter. Twitter's a great place for, um, you can learn a lot, but it's also very entertaining at times. And so um, uh, our, our friends at the Pennsylvania Game Commission are the target of the tweet you see there. So um, at any rate, my point in all of this is to say that there's a really deep psychology to this. And I'm going to get into that here in a little bit more detail. So you may have seen the movie The Founder. And one of the one of the big take home points from that movie was that Ray Kroc from McDonald's said McDonald's is one of the biggest real estate companies in the world. And so all this time we thought, no, they just sell really tasty hamburgers that are terrible for you and uh, that we all uh, drive through and enjoy. Uh, but his point was they're not actually in the food business. They're in the real estate business because they have all of their stores in the most high traffic areas all across the country. And so chronic wasting disease is very much that same way in that we are in the people business here. And ultimately, we have to do what's right for wildlife. But our number one tool for, doing, for managing wildlife is hunters. And if you were to look across this room of hunters right here, and you just pulled 10 of them aside and say, tell me what you think we need to be doing for managing deer and wildlife, you're going to get 10 different answers. And that makes this very, very challenging uh, for our wildlife managers that try to deal with this disease. Um, so plenty of information out there. Look up biases. Uh, you can, you can be, you can learn a lot really quickly, but ultimately we're all biased to interpret informations that are consistent with our desires. And I've, one of the things that I've always entertained about in politics is a great example of this, where, uh, they'll take somebody who's more, um, conservative leaning and they'll read them a bunch of quotes that, that, uh, that a prominent Republican they say that it was said by a pro prominent Republican, but it was actually said by a Democrat. They don't know it. And they say, oh, yeah, I agree with all those points. And then they do the same thing. They, they take somebody uh, who's left-leaning, and they say a bunch of things that was said by a prominent Republican, but then say this was done by uh, a more liberal-leaning person. And they agree with all the points because that's just what they want to believe. Um, so that's just a very common uh, current example of that. But we have some other examples to look to to help us um, understand why we struggle to get the point across with chronic wasting disease. And I'm going to use uh, CTE, uh, which is a, a brain disorder. This is very um, hit the news big time with NFL players and, of course, climate change. And so my point is not in to get into a discussion about climate change and CTE specifically. I'm just bringing these up to say uh, these are... Uh, matters that I think are relative to, to CWD, so please don't send me a bunch of emails, uh, hate mail, because of your feelings on climate change. Uh, so here's an example, and this one hurts me a little bit having grown up a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Um, so people who deny CTE, and here's an example of a, a celebrity type, Merrill Hodge, talking about uh, CWD is bad science, despite the fact that there is so much published and peer-reviewed science out there um, that it's, it's impossible to ignore or dismiss it. So uh, that being said, people will still try to dismiss it because it's inconsistent with their desires. So again, public figures have a lot of sway in this. Uh, this is an interesting uh, article from the Union of Concerned Scientists where it talks about intimidation. And uh, originally the NFL had tried to do that. They tried to deny that it was an issue and tried to intimidate the people putting the information out there. But eventually the science became overwhelming on this issue 
and they had to backtrack and you see some of the things that are going on. So then uh, back out to Twitter again. So you see these references to fake news. Uh, uh, do, you, do you believe everything you see on the internet? Um, so you can just read the quotes there. I'll read them to you. But um, you know, everyone everyone else wants to believe CT is fake news, like climate change. So I'll talk about climate change in a second. Um, so again, people are confused and they are biased. Climate change, another example, fake news. Um, this person, I, I get a kick out of it, says the climate change lie will destroy the economy. And then he says, check facts, F-A-X. And so uh, Twitter is definitely a grammar and spelling graveyard, but again, entertaining nonetheless. And then uh, you have the person at the bottom that says, you know, hey, if I, if I saw that there was proof that, that climate change could hurt my family or whatever, I'd be the first first person to uh, to step in and do something about it. So it's interesting. And then now we have the very unfortunate matter of COVID-19. And so you have people who are, they're actually deniers that this is a real problem. And there's, there are examples of that, which I'll show you, but they try to do things because it's inconvenient. They try to equate things like COVID-19 to the flu. And they make excuses as to why, for example, well, I don't really have to social distance. And we saw some of the videos from the young people. Well, I can't, I'm, it's unlikely that I'll get it, so I don't need to practice these things. And like I said, it's very inconvenient. Unfortunately, there are already more 4,000 people who have died uh, in New York alone on this matter. And the fact that they have to uh, have coolers to deal with uh, just an overwhelming number of deaths, it's very real for people there who see it, not as real for the people who don't see it. So, uh, there's never been a time like that uh, in, in recent history where the flu has caused that issue. So there is no comparison. Um, and But yet you have people that say, I believe this will show that it was the biggest worldwide panic overreaction in the history of humankind. Um, and then you've got the opposite where I think the second person here really just has questions. So they're confused. They want to know, you know, just help me understand this. So it's complicated. It's, it's stressful. And none of us want to have to deal with it. And that's, that's the issue with chronic wasting disease. So as research has shown, it's difficult for people because we're predisposed to focus on short-term benefits. Even if we know, even if we know down the road, the outcome is bad. And, and Brian Richards had referenced some of these things uh, when, when he just spoke. So um, at any rate, it's inconvenient. We don't want to deal with it. And also, it's going to impact what I want to do today. I don't care so much about the future. You know, I've seen some really disappointing things where uh, people have said, well, I'm only going to hunt for 10 more years anyway. Why do I care? And that's just an incredibly selfish and disappointing way to think of it. Uh, so again, CWD is fake news. Uh, put that alongside of global warming. So again, that's why I make the connection here. Um, and then, again, uh, you, you can read the, the quote below there. Again, it's just misinformation overload. Uh, everybody has an opinion, and because of social media, we all have a place to, to share them with everybody. Uh, so is there a path forward? I've kind of given you the gloom and doom. Why is it so challenging for us to get this point across? And I, I am. I, I want this to you leave this with an optimistic feeling because I do believe there is a path forward here. So big game is king for all of wildlife conservation. 80% of everybody who hunts, hunts big game. And if you want to look a little more closely at deer, and I, I love this picture in the background because here is an, a brand new Bass Pro Shops opening. And you have all of these people lined up outside. They cannot wait to get in there and spend their money, which is what we love to do, right? We love to buy all the, all the new deer and, and whatnot. But the point is, this is really driven by deer. 70% uh, of all hunters hunt deer specifically, so uh, they spend about almost $16 billion annually. So deer really are the straw that stir the drink for conservation. And has been referenced earlier, what is the influence of CWD going to be on our hunters? And what is it going to do to that big crowd of people who are lined up there to spend their money and keep the sport going forward? Because at the end of the day, hunters really just want to hunt, and myself included in that. Uh, CWD is inconvenient for all of us. We don't want to spend time doing our homework to learn about it. We want to learn about all the, the latest new calls or the new strategies and so on. But really, you know, for most people, most of the people that buy a hunting license, it, hunting is still kind of a casual hobby. 
And they do it to get away from the more serious of the things in the world. So it's very challenging. But when does it go too far? So when I show this picture across the country, and uh, even in, in, when I presented in Canada, I showed, I showed this. And I asked the crowd, was this, was this sign erected by hunters or anti-hunters? And they all assume it's by anti-hunters. So I show this as an example of to say, number one, I love the passion here. I absolutely love that people are engaged with their wildlife and that they care about deer. And one of the things being a Pennsylvanian, nobody cares about deer quite the way that we do. And that can be good and that can be bad. But we have to be careful about the passion. And the way forward is not this. The way forward is let's get in the room together. Let's talk about it. Because remember, the disease is the enemy. We have the common enemy. It's not the people who are trying to save and protect wildlife. So are there mistakes made? Absolutely. Can we learn from them by working together and move forward? I believe we can, and I think we've seen some progress uh, since that time. Changing behaviors is important. So the education, consistent messaging, bad words that we can't be using, eradication or impossible, nobody's going to respond to those. Number one, eradication right now is fool's gold. Uh, this is what I, what I refer to more now as a, it's a forever disease. We're all going to have to deal with this, and it's going to change the way we hunt and deal with deer. So let's not talk about eradication. Uh, but leadership, ownership, and success, those are words we all like, and we need to celebrate small wins. Uh, a lot of human dimensions research supports this, and we need to model these desired behaviors. And how we frame the issue really matters. So it's, it's personal for people. We have to frame the solutions in the form of short-term benefits because, again, people, um, that's what they're focused on, the short-term short term here. And we need to appeal to people's intrinsic values. So ultimately, leaving a better pe uh, uh, hunting in a better place for future generations is important. And who delivers the message and how it's delivered is critical here. And I'll reference again the study that we did with, with Cornell University. Uh, ultimately, there is a higher psychological resistance to state wildlife agencies. And that doesn't matter if it's Pennsylvania or if it's Oregon or if it's, if it's Texas. So in, in our study, groups like the National Deer Alliance, QDMA, and others were perceived as more similar, uh, so we, we, uh, which leads to a lower re reactance and higher intention of cooperation. So in, in other words, people are more likely to listen to the message if it's, if it's delivered by us. And so because of that, in our partnership with the Pennsylvania Wildlife Futures Program, which was introduced to you earlier today, um, we're off to a running start. And not only uh, you can see the list of supporters there, we've got private foundations uh, chipping in to help support this. And this is a national effort. And so we've got other states that are interested in chipping in, and it's, it's sort of a growing movement here. And so it, one of the goals will be we will be interfacing with hunters directly. So there's an in-person aspect to this. But ultimately, our goal here is to really dig in and do as much for hunters and deer as, as we can as part of this. And so it has to be broader than just hunters, though. We can't just talk about chronic wasting disease if we do this because it's a, it's a, it stinks. Nobody wants to deal with it. We don't want to talk about it. So it has to be palatable and creative. And this, again, understanding this is a forever situation. We need to empower hunters to lead. And these images here, uh, so hunters really are the ultimate conservationists. And we have saved deer and deer hunting once, about 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago with deforestation and the challenges that were put on deer. It was hunters who came to the table and ultimately said, no, we can do better than this. And so we did a lot of things to give us the, the beautiful opportunities that we have now. Chronic wasting disease is the new frontier. So again, we can look at this as the end of the world and say, woe is me and throw our hands up. Or we can say, you know what? This is our opportunity to raise up and do right by deer, again, being our most prolific and, and uh, recognizable wildlife uh, figure that we have in the country. So it's really all about hunters. Hunters must lead this, and I believe hunters will lead it. And uh, I mentioned earlier that we have a 14-part video series on chronic wasting disease, 14 of the most commonly asked questions and answers. That's going to be uh, rolled out here very soon as part of this project. You can go to nationaldeeralliance.com slash CWD. I'm sure our friends at the, at the Pennsylvania Game Commission will be sharing these as soon as they come out. Uh, we're also working on a series of articles, and I mentioned the in-person part of this. But this, again, goes beyond 
just what we'll do in Pennsylvania. So if you can imagine, and this is just all preliminary here, a nationwide campaign for deer, and it's not just about chronic wasting disease, but if you imagine you, you know, your local diner not existing because there are no deer and there are no people to hunt deer, you can't do that without deer. Uh, your, lo your local uh, gas station and so on that, that are supported by deer. So it's not just wildlife that are supported by deer. It's a whole, uh, it's communities, it's small businesses, and it's our way of life that are impacted by deer. So if you can imagine this national movement where it's can't without deer, it's stand for deer or hunt for facts. Um, we're, we're very serious about this and we, we plan to make this happen. Now don't call me and say, hey, where do I get one of those cool shirts? Because these are just conceptual at this point. But if you can imagine people across the country, maybe they're not even hunters standing for deer because they understand how important deer are. So again, it has to be broader than chronic wasting disease. And uh, we intend to do something uh, to the level that nobody's ever seen before on this issue. So again, division is not gonna help solve the problem. We have to find a way to bridge the gap and we have to work together recognizing that the disease is the enemy, not each other. And ultimately, uh, what you can't see here is my little animation, but what happens here is the disease, I have deer on the landscape that just sort of fade away, if you can imagine that. And, uh, and I'll be, if you can come to one of the public meetings that we'll have, hopefully later in the year, you'll see this. But essentially, the deer dissolving off the landscape, and it just says, if we, don't, if we can't win the people, we can't win. And I know that's very sobering. We are in the people business, and I like to close with this image because, to me, this image represents everything that's at stake. There are a lot of things here, from a young woman hunting uh, to a really beautiful deer that she shot, admiring it, and all of the uh, other elements involved here with conservation. Uh, you know, that rifle purchase, money going to the Pittman-Robertson Act to support wildlife conservation. This isn't just about deer people. This is about hunters. This is about all wildlife conservation that are supported by deer. And again, I'm looking forward to being part of this team that's creating a movement for deer all across the country like we've never seen before. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wrap it up, and I appreciate everybody's time and the opportunity to present to you today. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. We appreciate that. That, that looks like a lot of uh, exciting stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to pass it off next to uh, Dr. Kristen Schuler. Kristen is a wildlife disease ecologist at Cornell, uh, Cornell Wildlife Health Lab up in Ithaca, New York. And so uh, Kristen has a lot of experience with CWD, so we look forward to, to hearing about what New York has done and, and will do um, in managing CWD. So Kristen? All right, thank you. There we go. Um, so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to you today. I'm really uh, hopeful that we can come out of this with some good information, and I want to make sure that uh, Nick doesn't get the only credit for being a native Pennsylvanian. I'm also from Western PA, having grown up in Bradford. So um, with that, uh, I think it's important to register that um, what happens in Pennsylvania is not just important for Pennsylvania, that we really need to think about this in a regional approach and that New York really has its eye on what's happening with the CWD situation in Pennsylvania. And right now what we're dealing with with the COVID outbreak is um, we've learned from several of these disease outbreaks that we need to act quickly on them. New York's already de dealt with things like white nose syndrome and West Nile virus starting here. So we take disease very seriously and, and we hope that other states will as well. New York is the lone state right now known to have eliminated CWD once it's been found in uh, free ranging deer. But I think it's important to recognize that we're not the only one that's had success in this area. There are a lot of other states that have CWD, but they've also had one or two deer in different areas that they've been able to successfully manage. And so there are uh, those types of stories out there. And every time I say that, you know, that we're the only one to have eliminated it, I do knock on wood because there is some element of luck to that. So going back to the detection in 2005, it was first in Oneida County, which was essentially right in the middle of the state. And I have to point out that I wasn't in New York at this time, so I deserve absolutely no credit for the actions taken. 
but it was uh, the quick action and testing by the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets in their captive cervid facilities that detected the first positive in this uh, Verona, Westmoreland area, and then an epidemiological traceback found it in a second captive cervid facility. Subsequent actions found CWD in two free-ranging white-tailed deer that were about seven miles away from that first index location. And we actually really had the trifecta with this because the owner not only had captive deer, but he also moved animals around. He was a well-regarded taxidermist and also a wildlife rehabilitator. So he was the one who pointed out different areas where he had released uh, white-tailed deer in the past. And all of these different activities actually mixed in his shop and then he spread some of the, the waste, the salt that he used to tan hides around the border of his fence. So it was really a lot of different activities that could spread disease. And we learned from that and put a, a stop to a lot of those. But with this containment area that was set up in sort of an oval around those two facilities, they, there was intensive population reduction completed in these areas and mandatory sampling with no subsequent detections. So some of the important points to uh, register with this is that both the Department of Environmental Conservation <clears throat> and the Department of Agriculture and Markets have joint authority over white-tailed deer in New York State. The Department of Agriculture and Markets have, has sole authority over all other species, but for white-tailed deer, it's, it's jointly held. So when this detection happened, because it was in both free ranging and captive deer, an incident command system was stood up. And this involved uh, the Department of Health and the uh, US Department of Agriculture, the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service as well. The reason the, de the Department of Health was involved was because one of these first captive animals was actually given to a fire hall for one of their social events, and a large number of people actually consumed that CWD positive animal. The Department of Health has been following up with those people and is monitoring them, and there hasn't been any abnormal deaths associated with that, but that um, made this a, an immediate One Health type issue where you do have human health risks. So for this incident command uh, structure set up in the containment area, the multi-agency participation was really critical. And to manage this many agencies, it was actually the DEC's forest rangers that took control and were the incident commanders. Within the containment area, there was mandatory testing of all hunter harvested animals, all roadkill, and all deer management permit taken animals. There was a check station and mobile lab set up on site so that nobody could take animals out, that they could be sampled and tested right there. There was a movement ban and other regulations put in place in this containment area. So whole carcasses were not able to be moved, no use of deer, natural deer urine, and no uh, removal of road kill from the containment area. There was a ban on rehabilitation of white-tailed deer. And the estimated cost for just this first year alone was well over a million dollars. Now, there wasn't an actual after action report for these uh, for this incident, but I put together the, as best I could what uh, we had for a timeline, because I think it's important to see how quickly some of these actions were taken. So by March 30th of 2005, confirmation came through that both of uh, those herds had, cap, uh, had CWD positive animals. By April 5th, those herds were being depopulated. They were depopulated in, over a period of 48 hours by USDA Wildlife Services. That took out 20 additional animals and three more were found to be positive for a total of five animals. And one of the keys here, I think, is that uh, the DEC actually paid to depopulate these captive cervids. And so it wasn't a matter of going through federal indemnity through USDA. There was no cap on the uh, amount. These animals were assessed by an independent um, assessor. And so the owners were receiving the funding through that for their indemnity payments. 
starting on April 11th uh, that ran through the 22nd then another four day period. Sharpshooting commenced by the Department of Environmental Conservation and USDA Wildlife Services taking out another 292 deer, including um, road kills in that containment area. There was shooting done during the day and at night. And so that um, immediate action was really important. There was another action that was taken a few years later um, in 2008, I believe, where they removed another small number. And then by the end of April, emergency regulations, all those regulations that I mentioned with uh, movement of carcasses and roadkill were in place. And these restrictions were held up, uh, held in place for five years. So just like anything uh, that we're dealing with, especially with COVID right now, you have a lot of people that are saying things might be overkill, that um, the actions were not enough to uh, really take um, that you needed to do at that time. But I think it's important to note that it's easy in hindsight to go back and say that these were overkill when um, now we're calling it a success story. So since that time, how has CWD remained uh, out of New York? Well, in 2011, we formed an interagency CWD working group comprised of the DEC, Department of Agriculture and Markets, and uh, Cornell University. And I might point out that this included uh, DEC law enforcement as well, which is a really important factor to know what we, what we were capable of putting in regulations and enforcement. We had a pretty serious jolt when CWD was detected in Pennsylvania in 2012, both in captive and free ranging deer. And luckily, because we were already working with our ag department and could give them information, they put in place a ban on all captive service into New York from all states in 2013. And this was after we looked at the data and saw that the majority of captive service coming in from Pennsylvania were originating uh, from or through Pennsylvania. We implemented a risk waste, weighted risk-based system uh, for surveillance with county point quotas. And so these go back to the, the sex and age characteristics of the animals. And we did a intensive field-based risk assessment. Our response plan uh, also included aggressive action to determine the extent of the outbreak and decreased local deer densities. And then this is one that I'm, I'm most proud of, that we are one of the few states that's actually implemented a very comprehensive interagency risk minimization plan. So this goes back to the being proactive rather than reactive. Recently, we banned the import of intact deer, deer carcasses from any state. We strengthened the regulations banning feeding of uh, deer and moose statewide and then also are working on better education to stakeholders. A little bit more detail on the CWD surveillance. We had to put um, a higher emphasis on the collection and testing of suspect clinical animals. And this really involved education of the DEC field staff to make sure that they understood when they got a call about a deer that was acting abnormally that they needed to drop everything and, and try to get that deer and go out and euthanize it if necessary to get it in for testing. As I mentioned, we did a risk assessment and this comprised a field survey of taxidermists and meat processors where the DEC biologists went out, met with the proprietors of these businesses and gave them information, asked questions about what they got in, their disposal methods, and also inquired if taxidermists were interested in collecting samples and partnering with us on CWD surveillance. And we've had really good success with our taxidermy partnership program. Working with the Department of Agriculture and Markets, we gathered information on their captive service herds and uh, applied that in our risk model as well. For the weighted sex and age values, this was something we uh, borrowed from Wisconsin, where adult bucks two and a half years and older are the most valuable sample that we can get. 
and counties have a quota, which are demonstrated by these circles uh, for each county. And they can reach those quotas by getting these higher uh, value animals. So it consequently decreased the number of testings, tests that we had to run, but increased the probability in disease detection. So uh, to show you the numbers associated with that field survey, we identified 782 businesses, and there's no license necessary for taxidermists or meat processors through DEC. So we had to identify these independently, went out and verified whether they were in business or not, did site vi visits to those and interviews. Um, for anybody who is willing to be interviewed, and then also distributed fact sheets as well. And this is part of the outreach effort to, to put a face to that, where the owner of that business can identify the biologist and say, yeah, if I have a problem, I can call up that biologist. I've seen them. I know their name. So out of all those businesses that we identified, we were hoping that there would be some sort of structure uh, that we could identify where these businesses were and, and how much of a risk they were. But really, we had a pretty intensive distribution minus the Adirondacks region up in northern New York, where there's not a lot of people, there's not a lot of deer, and so consequently, there's not a lot of taxidermists or processors. As far as the captive servid premises, we have just under 300 of those that are active in New York State. So a smaller industry than what you have in Pennsylvania. But it was important for us to identify out of these, you know, where they were coming from, if people were importing uh, deer to New York before we had the import ban, if they were running shooting operations, if they had escapes in the past, and how they were disposing of their waste. So when we look at those captive servid uh, facilities, there are a number that follow the USDA herd certification program, which allows them to bring in live captive cervids from uh, anywhere in the country prior to the import ban. We have a second category, which is called a special purpose herd. And these are for herds that don't have any animals that leave alive. These are more likely to be those high fence shooting operations. And what we found by adding 46% and 60% together was that we had owners that owned both types of herds, and that presented a risk to us in that an unscrupulous owner could actually move animals from a certified herd to a special purpose herd. That animal could be shot um, by a paying customer, and that animal might never be tested for CWD. We also identified that 58% uh, of the facilities had high quality fence. So if we do the math there, that leaves us with 42% that do not have high quality fencing, 16% ran shooting operations. We saw a number had uh, escapes in the recent past, and out of those 38 facilities that had escaped captive cervids, 11 of those were unsuccessful in actually getting those cervids back. And then a number had uh, issues with compliance and record keeping. Not that many had routine veterinary care. So when we put all these different risk factors together, we identified that where our risks were was not necessarily where our deer population was the highest. And factoring both of those in, it allowed us to determine what level of surveillance we needed to do. So you can see starting uh, in 2005, the numbers uh, for surveillance went way, way up, and that was primarily in that containment area in Oneida County. Following that, the numbers dropped off, and then since we implemented this risk-based surveillance in 2013, they've been steadily uh, at remaining steady at around 2,500 animals, and this is financially manageable for the state. So when we put together our interagency team to talk about CWD response, we put together a plan for 10 years and uh, we'll revisit that plan regularly to update it as needed. And I think some of the most important points in this plan are that uh, we put together an ARC GIS toolkit. 
and if you look at the map, it kind of looks like uh, what we're used to seeing with the home range. And this actually is the disease probability area. So if we detected a CWD positive deer in the town of Dryden, and we can look at the habitat, we can look at the season uh, that that deer was detected, and the sex and age, and identify areas on the landscape where that deer was likely to be, where it shed prions, and then we can draw our uh, restrictive boundaries around that more tightly. And it also allows us to go in and do sharpshooting with a, a high degree of precision that we're going to get animals that likely interacted with that deer. We got uh, a little bit of fire drill last uh, in 2018 with a CWD suspect that we had in Cattaraugus County. It was only 10 miles from the PA border and about 70 miles from the closest known CWD positive in Pennsylvania. So that was where we had been looking pretty intensively for CWD in the past. So we got to um, have a few days before it was confirmed that that deer did not have CWD to test out this response plan and see where the holes were in it, see what we needed to do differently. So that was a, a pretty good practice run for us. But that ARC uh, toolbox is available to other states if they'd like to put in their data to it and see how it works for them. And then going to the interagency risk minimization plan. After sitting together with the biologists and veterinarians uh, over a period of several months working on the response plan, we said, well, this isn't very smart. Why are we just sitting around waiting to get CWD? We should do things so that we don't get it. And it was really the time spent in the room together that the biologists and the veterinarians could understand the different philosophy and the different mission statements of each agency in what they needed to do um, around this so that we could wrap our arms around all the risks associated with CWD and that we weren't just uh, sort of picking low hanging fruit or picking on one particular group. So as far as the changes related to captive service, I already mentioned the ban on live captive imports. One of the easy ones was that our law enforcement officer told us that it was really difficult for GEC to enforce uh, the ag regulations and it was a lot more paperwork for the for them. So we just mirrored the regulations in uh, DEC to make it easier for enforcement. We started doing joint site visits of the captive service facilities with the biologists and veterinarians, and our ag department offered a one-time closure option. Now I should mark the check marks are the ones that we've done. Uh, the numbers are the ones that we're still working on, which is a moratorium on new white-tailed deer facilities testing all captive cervids shot behind high fences. As I mentioned, there's that loophole where these special purpose herds, especially the shooting operations, don't necessarily have to test all the animals. We looked at herd closure plans and license renewal, uh, bonding legislation to cover CWD events, because if CWD is detected in a captive herd, it still costs uh, the wildlife agency quite a bit to have to go out and sample around that herd and potentially respond to an event. Having penalties for escape captives related to uh, wild deer. Last year, we did have a regulation put in place to prohibit the whole carcass import from any state or province. Uh, prior to that, it had been any CWD positive area and any states or provinces west of the Mississippi River. So that really helps out to simplify our enforcement. In our plan, we did have a ban on natural deer urine products, uh, both the sales and use of those. That was taken out of the plan with uh, a new recommendation to re-review the science associated that and make a recommendation in the future, which was unfortunate, but that's the path we're taking. We're also working with uh, solid waste operators to ensure that they remain open because the businesses that we have, taxidermists and processors, need a way to dispose of carcasses in a safe manner. And land, lined landfills are still the best way to do that. So we want to make sure it's possible for them to do that. And then I mentioned the statewide uh, feeding ban, which was strengthened. 
Related to education, we've been working quite a bit on identifying a risk communication strategy. We want to make sure that we're including stakeholders in our discussions and recently completed a human dimension survey. And then with law enforcement, we had some issues where law enforcement wasn't necessarily consistently seizing and destroying all illegally carcass, uh, imported carcasses. And so we wanted to make sure that hunters were clear that if you bring something back, we're going to take it and it's going to be incinerated and you're not going to get the antlers back or anything else. No, no ifs, ands, or buts with that. So just to uh, demonstrate that risk communication strategy, as Nick already mentioned, we asked hunters about how they described these CWD risks in a survey with the National Deer Alliance. And I think the points here that Nick already made about who's delivering the message is really important. But also along with that, I find some comfort to see that hunters actually think by a very small margin that CWD is controllable and that they also think that it's known to science. And that gives me hope that we can really communicate the importance of this issue to them and get them on board with management. So to wrap up, I think New York's keys to success, one, I have to point to luck. Uh, New York was very lucky that we don't think CWD was on the landscape for very long. Therefore, we didn't have that environmental contamination issue that a lot of states were dealing with. Um, the other part of that luck is that the soil conditions weren't necessarily conducive to binding prions. The major thing that I hope I've gotten through to you is the immediate action to depopulate these infective captive herds. Uh, I know that Pennsylvania right now has a number of herds on the landscape that are known to be infected that are continuing to operate, and that is problematic. And I think that waiting for federal indemnity isn't necessarily a good strategy because it is so limited and because of Pennsylvania's situation of being a CWD positive state is unlikely to receive that limited amount of indemnity. So I would look for new mechanisms associated with depopulation. Also, the sustained effort uh, to remove and test wild deer in this area around where we knew that we had positive sites to keep that effort up is really difficult. And you might have noticed in that surveillance graph that the numbers tailed off by year three. And it's not only just with the hunters, it's with the agency too. And you get fatigue in your biologists dealing with this because biologists don't necessarily love the CWD like a lot of the rest of us are, are interested in disease when you have people that are, are uh, dedicated to other species. And it really pulls people away from all that other work that they need to be doing. So you're affecting all these other species by having CWD in your area or in your state. I think it was really important for New York to identify the risks in the state and then take the mitigation measures necessary to be um, in a better place. And it's taken a number of years to get those through. So starting now is never too late to do that. And the final one I'll mention is the interagency task force that um, we were very lucky that the DEC and Department of Agriculture and Markets had a joint authority over white-tailed deer, that we could work together on our response and prevention planning. But I think it might be worth considering in Pennsylvania having some sort of joint commission or legislatively mandated task force to work on this problem because one agency is not going to solve it alone. You really need to work in concert together. And like I said, there's differences in philosophy and mission, but by having a group that's dedicated to working on this problem and doing that over a period of time, you start having that understanding and cooperation that can actually be really uh, vital. So my last slide, um, you know, just to point out, we're all in this boat together. Right now in New York, we're really watching along the borders um, of our southern tier, and we're dedicating 
more financial and personnel resources to that because New York's long-term CWD risk is really linked to Pennsylvania's success or lack thereof. So we can't ignore this regional approach. And I know that um, as commissioners, you are tasked with doing what's best for the Commonwealth, but I would really encourage you to hearken back to what Brian Richards talked about with the North American model, to think about this in the long term and to think about the intergenerational fairness. You know, when I start, first started talking about CWD, I would say, you know, think about your grandkids and whether you want them to hunt. Right now, I have a seven-year-old little boy, and I really want him to be able to hunt and not have to think about, you know, CWD all the time and whether he actually wants to go out hunting or not because of it. So with that, I would, um, I'll just end up, um, and I will be around for questions later on. And thank you for this time. Thanks, Chris, and that was that was great. I appreciate the uh, the background on New York, um, and and so to keep with the, the timetable, uh, and since folks are free to move about and come back and catch on, and we'll also uh, record this as well, and this will be available. So if anybody misses any parts of this, uh, they can come back later. But we're going to try to skip the breaks to maintain our timetable. So uh, with that being said, I'm, we're going to move on to Lou Cornicelli. So Lou is the Wildlife Research Manager for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And Lou, we appreciate your time today, and I'm going to pass it over to you. I appreciate that. Hopefully folks can hear me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to, uh, as the first agency person on deck, I'm going to kind of link back a little bit to what you've already heard. So hopefully it's not redundant. We hadn't shared each other's presentations before. So um, I, I've been doing this a long time at the state agency level, over 20 years. I think it's fair to say that that a lot of us who are in the nuts and bolts of management of chronic waste and disease have aged in dog years. So um, I'm just going to kind of get get through a go through an overview of what Minnesota does and how we've approached this disease since it was first discovered in August of 2002. Um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through more of the high level stuff that we that we deal with. I'm not going to get too much uh, into the, the nuts and bolts or the um, uh, the dots on the map, so to speak, but I'll talk a little bit about our, our surveillance. So with that, I'll get started. If I can advance the slides. So first thing I really wanted to talk about were legal authorities. I think those are really important because as we go through the day, and if you've done any sort of research on this topic, uh, per the states, we all vary in what we can and can't do. Um, we often get, um, you know, get in these these back and forths with our hunting our hunting community that, well, how come I was not doing this, or how come Wisconsin is doing that, and and you guys are doing this, and you know, the 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 basis for that is that white-tailed deer are managed by the individually by the states. So we can't tell Wisconsin how to manage their deer any more than. Uh, Wisconsin can tell us, and then we also all, we all operate within those legal authorities that are given to us by our various legislatures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we are a fairly aggressive state when it comes to this disease, and uh, hopefully by the end of this you'll you'll know why. So I'll talk about that. I'm also going to talk a little bit about surveillance uh, uh, since the topic of today is a management plan. I'm going to talk about Minnesota's management plan and how we came about. Uh, uh, generating it and implementing it as well. And then just a couple of highlights on research projects. Um, I'm happy to hear the, the folks really starting starting to talk about the human dimension side of CWD. It, it's critically important. And there's, there was a real gap in that knowledge really from the early 2000s up through today, but it's getting um, more and more prominent as we get down, um, deal with this disease. So quick test with these five deer in the, in the picture. Uh, as, as Brian Richards said at the beginning, most deer are asymptomatic until the, the very last few months of their life. And the only deer in this slide that's not positive is the one that has the red ear tags. And those red, those red ear tags, uh, some comedian released a deer in our CWD zone, and those two tags say don't and miss. So um, somebody didn't miss, but that deer came back CWD not detected. But the point of this this slide really is that that you really don't know until the very end that these animals are carrying the disease. So with that, I'll kind of I'll kind of go through my stuff. So legal 
local authorities, and, I, and again, this is often lost as we get down into the weeds of who's doing what. Um, you know, how you respond is, is dependent on the governance structure of your state. It's as simple as that. How are those rules and laws implemented? What can you do with what amount of public process or who makes those decisions? So with, when CWD was found in my state in 2002, in August, in a captive elk facility, actually, uh, we started working with uh, our, legisl our legislature about giving DNR some additional authorities to manage disease. And in 2004, the statute was actually passed. So if the commissioner, and also important to note for my, for my case is that my agency has a commissioner, so a single uh, decision-making person uh, who has deputy commissioners and those powers get passed down through the divisions. We don't have a board or a commission like you do in Pennsylvania. So our decision-making is, is a little bit different because we have a single commissioner. Um, so basically the statute says we can prevent and control wildlife disease. Um, and that, that translates more than just deer. It can be any, any species really. And we can do that by limiting, closing, expanding, opening seasons throughout the state, reducing or increasing bag limits. We can establish disease management zones. We can give free licenses. We can issue replacement licenses for sick animals. Uh, we can require collection of, of uh, samples. So in other words, we can make it mandatory to, to the hunter has to submit a sample. Uh, we can limit possession of wild animals. So in other words, if, if uh, there was, let's say raccoon rabies going through, we could ban people from, from owning raccoons. Uh, you can't actually own, you cannot own a skunk in the state because of skunk rabies. So we have that ability, we can restrict movements of animals and we can also restrict wildlife feeding. Uh, important to note though, as I go through this, everything says wild animals, right? Wildlife disease, wild animals. That's because the, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources regulates the, our, our protected wildlife species. In the case of, of captive cervids, they're regulated and managed by uh, an agency called the Board of Animal Health. So real broadly, if it's outside the fence, it belongs to me, if it's inside the fence, it belongs to the Board of Animal Health, although we do uh, cooperate on a, on a variety of issues. So um, the skip B, go to C, commissioner uh, can control wildlife diseases by emergency rule adopted under a separate statute. So what that means is that we actually have the ability to change rules very quickly. Uh, I've seen it done in as little as a week. Uh, oftentimes it takes three to four weeks, uh, but we can expedite a rule. So if we were to find a disease in early November during the deer season, we could easily have a special hunt in, in December with largely no public no public input. Now we don't we we what we try not to do is abuse that privilege. However, it's important to note that we have authorities that allow us to do a lot of stuff relatively quickly. So what do, what do we do? Um, sorry, I got there we go. So um, we also have another statute that got passed last year that actually restricts the importation of, of, of hunter harvested survey day from anywhere in the country. I'll kind of, the next slide is gonna talk about some of the other authorities that we have and what we do, but uh, the legislature took this one seriously enough that they, they took it out of our rulemaking and put it in statute. So now it's actually against the law to in, import uh, hunter harvested carcass into Minnesota. So I think that the, the point of this is that our legislature is really taking this issue very seriously and, and extending some of our rule authorities in the, in the statute. So this can't change unless the legislature decides to change it. So I think we, we have a, a pretty good set of mechanisms that we can, that we can use. So how have we used these authorities? You know, uh, we have, again, broad authority. So before the statute was changed, we did ban uh, car, uh, carcass importation. In 2016, we actually banned them, banned carcasses from across the, the across North America. Before that, it was tied to where the Board of Animal Health indicated there was CWD in in, in captive or wild populations. So we, recognizing that the game was changing on a da almost daily basis, disease found in Tennessee, Arkansas, expanding in Missouri, uh, Iowa, other places that we just couldn't keep up with the rulemaking in terms of specific locations. So we went with a statewide ban, much like New York just recently did. Uh, we typically uh, establish CWD management zones, and I'll show a couple of those. So we draw off a part of the state, uh, and that's our new CWD management zone. With it in and around that zone, we ban feeding, and in some cases we ban attractants. 
it is legal to recreational recreationally feed deer in Minnesota, and we're starting the conversation of a statewide ban, which will take probably a couple of years to to really work through the system. But we do ban feeding and attractants. We do require mandatory sampling of hunter harvested deer, and I'll get a little bit into that. So if you kill a deer in a CWD area or an area that we're doing surveillance because we think we might have disease, you have to submit a sample. We also uh, ban the export of carcasses from a CWD management zone uh, it, until a not detected test is found. You can still take out the meat and quarters and stuff, but we don't let you take a carcass out of the zone until that not detected test was reported. Clearly we do that because what we don't want to do is take a carcass, drop it on somebody's back 40 and start a new disease location. So we take that pretty seriously. And then we also do what everybody else does. We try and reduce uh, populations through harvest, whether that's late season hunting opportunity, uh, more tags and other hunting opportunities in the fall, um, landowner shooting permits where we, let, where we give permits to landowners to distribute to, to, to folks to, to harvest deer. And as Brian talked about uh, right up front, this is a, a law of diminishing returns. We know through our, our harvest uh, analysis, we track down to the individual. We know that most people are only taking a deer. They might take two. And that increasing that opportunity really doesn't substantially lead to an increase in, in noticeable harvest. A few people kill a few more, most people, most people don't. But we do provide that opportunity. And then finally, agency culling by USDA. We don't do any culling in my state with employees. We, we, we contract all that work. So we, we focus on that in areas of disease. So uh, I appreciated what Kristen talked about with, with risk, and I'll, I'll touch on that too. Um, in, from 2002 to 2004, we, we did a surveillance program across the state. The disease was new in Wisconsin. It was new in a captive elk facility in Minnesota. So we designed a, a surveillance program that rolled across the state um, in a three, over a three-year period. Uh, we spent probably close to $3 million on that back in the early 2000s and recognize that we just couldn't sustain that level of activity uh, over time. So we really switched to a risk-based surveillance program, uh, looking at deer that were exhibiting uh, CWD uh, symptoms, looking at recent or expanding infections in other states, you know, clearly Wisconsin and now in Northeastern Iowa. And then we wanted to look at, this. my slide's actually old, we're up to I think nine or 10 captive servant facilities, but um, we also look at the association of, of uh, uh, wild deer in relation to, to CWD positive uh, facilities. We've had um, mostly in white-tailed deer, one red deer farm, three elk farms. Uh, we're actually down to about 300 cervid farms in Minnesota, and about half of those are considered uh, recreational. So um, still lots of animals, still a lot of animals behind the fence, still a lot of risk related to movement of those animals uh, um, across the state and from other states. But we really switched how we do surveillance based on those elements of risk, just because we couldn't um, we couldn't just keep we couldn't keep up with it and couldn't afford it over time. So uh, my one slide really talking about uh, surveillance. I wanted to make the point that in my state we do a lot of surveillance. Just last year we did eight we collected eighteen thousand samples across across the state. Um, we've done everything from working during the firearm season, whether that's opening weekend in the surveillance area or throughout the whole season in a CWD management zone. Stations are open every day of the firearm season. Um, and we also started a program largely based off what Wisconsin was doing that is technically called Adopt a Dumpster, but it's, it's not really, there's, we've had some real good cooperation from our deer groups and the backcountry hunters and anglers. Uh, however, most of the our dumpster program is paid for using state funds. But what we did is we set up quartering stations, uh, dumpsters uh, uh, were available oftentimes at, our C at where we were collecting our CWD samples. So the hunter could register their deer, have a, have a lymph nodes taken out, drive over to a spot, hang the deer, court, uh, skin it, quarter it, throw it into the dumpster and go home. Um, we processed a lot of deer this way uh, and, and it was a very successful program. One of the one of the few things we get complimented on in our CWD program is the the fact that we had places for people to drop their carcasses off. Uh, then we also did we also do self service stations during our archery and muzzleloader seasons because we know that uh, um, 
we don't see a lot of samples during those seasons, but it's important to collect them. We have a fair number of archery positive samples in our zone. So the same thing is set up. We have a secure location where a hunter can can uh, drop their the deer head off, uh, core of the animal, throw in the dumpster, take off. So the, the key here, we, we do a lot of surveillance in the state uh, for a variety of reasons. And we work really closely um, with our stakeholders to get this done. So I wanted to touch on our management plan. We had one uh, back in 2011 that was really designed to, to articulate what, what does the Minnesota DNR do when we find CWD? And it didn't really go beyond that because we, we, had the, we found the disease in 2010 uh, in close association with a positive elk farm. We uh, drew off a, a, a management zone. We intensively collected samples for three years. We never and we never found the disease again. We've we have gone back several times since then, and we still haven't found the disease. So I would actually consider that one a success story, um, even though it wasn't noted noted today. Even though we have the disease in my state, uh, we've not found it in the one place uh, in where we found the single positive wild deer. But our plan really didn't address what to do to, for if the disease becomes established. So we worked over about an 18 month period and broke a, developed a new plan and broke it out into four main sections. You know, first one being the, the honeymoon phase, you know, you find a positive deer, what do you do? Uh, what does it mean? Is there more than one? Is it the only one? Where do you find that infection? Uh, early versus mid versus late. Um, but we also needed to include some other things. So we have a section on transitioning to what we call a persistent infection, which basically means what decisions do we make um, when we know that we can't eliminate the disease. And I think we're seeing that, in, we're obviously seeing that in southeastern Minnesota. We may not be seeing that in north central Minnesota, uh, where we've only had one positive deer a half mile from a captive servant farm that was, that was highly infected. So uh, what do we do when we transition to that? And, you know, what are those decision points when we finally say, okay, we're going to have this disease at some level, where do we go? So when we decide we have a persistent infection, we can't eliminate it, but hopefully it stays at low levels using the management actions that folks are talking about. And then finally, endemic disease. Think about uh, the disease, a disease that has environmental contamination. It's self-maintaining in, in that population. It doesn't matter how many samples you collect or how aggressive your management interventions are going to be, uh, the disease is here to stay. And what do we, what do, we do there? And we basically, what we're trying to do is working to avoid that situation. However, we have to acknowledge that it might happen. So our plan tries to address all four of these components. And it's available on the website. This link in the lower right-hand corner of the screen is actually um, a link to our CWD response plan. So kind of laying it out graphically, you know, looking at initial, initial CWD response, we try and do an aerial survey. Uh, we create a zone. We establish those carcass movement restrictions outside of the zone. Um, like everybody else, we try and reduce densities to reduce contact, in, you know, with the hopes of reducing contact rates through through densities, even though we recognize that we're talking about a disease that operates at the frequency level. Um, we also implement those feeding bands and then design a program that helps us uh, manage that, that disease and mo monitor and manage the disease. And we're looking at that as a prevalence of less than 1%. And obviously that's our call. As Brian said, it's up to the state. Some states might look at the prevalence estimate a different way and come up with a different number. So these persistent infections, uh, we're gonna try and maintain that younger age structure. I won't go back and, and, and rehash what Brian said. He did it better than, than I could. But we're also incre looking at increasing antler deer harvest because we know they're the, the delivery systems for disease. Um, we're looking at, you know, we do all those incentives, the uh, um, not for non-financial incentives, but permitting uh, incentives if, if they become available. Uh, also targeted culling, shooting permits, uh, designating core areas, and then again, still collecting adequate samples. So we, we look at it a little bit differently once we're outside that honeymoon phase. Um, endemic CWD, this is a shot in the dark for us because we don't have an area that with prevalence over 5% right now. But again, it's still aggressively responding to new detections and kind of um, looking at, at, from the endemic perspective, looking at the disease of trying to, to, to slow its spread uh, on the periphery. If we can't manage it fully inside um, through our liberal harvest recommendations and harvest seasons, 
we're going to start focusing on that uh, on that 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 periphery. And I know Brian talked about how difficult that can be, and it is difficult. That's why this is kind of theoretical at this point. And how do we uh, um, move on to new areas and make that decision to move move on to areas, but that but still continuing monitoring. And, and the point of that is that agency budgets are finite, and should we continue to spend those finite resources in an area that is going to have disease forever, or should we spend those resources in areas that we could perhaps eliminate the spread? So these are be tough decisions that obviously folks may need to make down the road. They're not decisions we make today. So with our plan, we recognize a real need for engagement. And we wrote this plan in two ways. First, it's prescriptive. Um, in that those are the steps we need to take in a disease event. And you could think, it, for those of you who've taken a human dimensions course, you can kind of look, think about that as a uh, um, uh, uh, that expert authority, where we have experts in the agency who know how to respond to disease. We're going to make these immediate decisions to, to best mitigate disease and figure out where we are. So we have a prescriptive element in the plan, but we also have a collaborative element and that's where we're working really closely with our stakeholders you know both groups and individuals as we evaluate these these alternatives whether that's on the human dimension side or even on the population management side so the plan is again is both prescriptive and it's collaborative um, we've been engaging uh, our tribal partners our stakeholders um, on on our plan and on our response uh, we took a lot of public comment uh, we didn't do uh, in-person meetings, we took web web uh, comments and then met individually with our groups. And then we're doing a lot of survey work the, on the HD side, uh, trying to put more emphasis on fostering those relationships at the lower at the local level. Um, and that whole piece about evaluating these different alternatives so we can make better decisions. Because obviously that's the ultimate goal to make a good decision and and manage this disease over the long, long term. So just uh Briefly, we're doing a lot of HD work in my state. We hired a, a human dimensions research scientist uh, about a year and a half ago who's solely focused on working on deer, uh, deer issues right now. So uh, in 2018, we did hunter and landowner studies looking at regulatory alternatives. One of the things that's come up in, in Wisconsin, it's called pay, paying, uh, pay for positives or payment for positives, where there's a, a couple of retired DNR folks who are really pushing uh, uh, for lack of a better term, a bounty system for, for managing, you know, for managing this disease. Uh, that that evokes a fairly visceral reaction from many of us who work in the public trust field. Uh, and bounties are just not a good good word for a lot of us. And so we, but we wanted to evaluate those potential uh, uses of incentives and and would they be accepted by hunters and landowners? Because maybe we're wrong. Uh, then also evaluating satisfaction. I'm not going to touch on that in, in this talk. But we we are seeing fairly high satisfaction of hunters, at least in the short term, with um, with deer populations deer, and deer hunting opportunity. So in 2019 and 20 uh, and 2020 this year, we're looking at a lapsed deer hunter survey because we're losing hunters in a variety of ways, just like everybody else is. We're doing a general public survey of CWD, and we're also doing a statewide uh, deer hunter CWD survey. So those results are still ongoing. I don't have anything today. Um, I just wanted to make the point that we're trying to uh, capture as much information in a, in a scientifically sound way as we can to help us make these big decisions. So just a couple information, couple nuggets from our um, uh, our HD survey of, of hunters and landowners. So we basically asked, you know, an attitude scale: Do you agree or disagree with these with these items? And what we found is that Folks really agree with the, with the big things that the regulation should be designed to limit disease spread. They really should impact hunter participation. We don't want people to quit because the regs are so complicated and so onerous that they just go bowling instead. Um, we don't want regulate hunters and landowners don't want regulations that impact local economies. Uh, um, they do like things that maybe provide non financial incentive for harvesting deer, like a walk-in access program or something like that. But what we saw some pretty strong, neg a pretty strong negative reaction to is that they don't think we should provide a financial incentive for So that payment for positives or any kind of a, a quote bounty program is not popular among our stakeholders. 
In fact, it's the least popular among among our stakeholders. They don't want want it to be passive and let nature take its course. It's not a doing nothing. Does not appear to be a good idea for our stakeholders. Um, and they disagree with being different, uh, no different than regs in the, in the surrounding area. So in other words, folks acknowledge that the regulations in a disease area need to be probably uh, more robust than an outside of disease area. So we have a pretty good frame of reference as to what people either like or don't like. So what about supporting regulations? So we'll find out that like Ernebuck, um, they don't like unlimited, uh, unlimited takes of deer in our CWD uh, management zone, even though we know most people don't kill more than one or two, they don't like culling. Uh, and this is important to note that, that we don't just go with what the survey says. We recognize that culling is a, is a very useful tool when applied appropriately. And we use culling in our CWD core area, uh, even though we know the public doesn't like it. It's, it's, a, it's an important piece of the management puzzle. So what folks do like is they wanna prohibit carcass export and carcass movement. Um, they want to expand a venison donation program, and we've done that. They also showed an interest in taking more than one buck per season. In Minnesota, you can only take one buck per year. We allow party hunting, or what we call cross-tagging, where you can actually kill and tag deer for other people. So you can already kill more than one buck in the state if you hunt with somebody. Um, but hunters really wanted to see one buck per season eat, for, you know, one buck per tag. And we actually uh, made a change last year, and hunters can do that in our CWD zone. But you know, this slide kind of gives you a, an attitudinal display of what folks support or don't support. And this kind of gives you a good base of where to, where to go. So we took it to the next step and we're doing a lot of these, not only for deer, but also in, in turkeys and other species. And we're gonna do a waterfowl survey that uses uh, something called discrete choice. This is a, it's kind of a marketing tool that forces a person to use a, a choice when, when oftentimes the, the, there isn't a choice of not doing anything. In other words, I can easily say, do you, do, do you like broccoli or not? That's, a, that's an attitude. I'm evaluating an object. I like broccoli, I don't like broccoli. So it doesn't really mean anything. If I don't like broccoli, I can eat asparagus or some other, or I don't like green vegetables. So uh, evaluating someone's attitude is important, but it doesn't really help you make um, a long-term decision because you don't know how people are going to react. If we know that, and, and Nick talked about this a little bit, I think it's it's difficult to change behavior just simply based on your attitude. There needs to be a normative component in that what are other people doing? It needs to be uh, repeated messaging to change behavior. So we're looking at this really from the perspective of choice. Um, and what I'm going to show one slide on this. Um, when we looked at the, the landowner payment piece about offering uh, payments for positives, more than half the landowners rejected it outright. It was, in fact, it was the most strongly held item in our choice survey. Uh, hunters and landowners really don't want to be paid for positives. So that's off the table from, my, from the perspective of my agency. Um, what's on the table are some of the other stuff, like one, one buck per season. But, this enabled this survey enabled us to say, you know what, we're not even going to address the, the financial incentive piece. It's just not it's just not wanted. So that's a human dimensions project that we're doing. We're also doing a biological uh, project where we're collaring deer in and around our CWD management zone and looking at uh, documenting dispersal. And Brock talked a little bit about this in that um, we're looking at these animals that dispersed twice a year, uh, once in the spring, again in the fall. Are they potentially spreading disease to new areas. So we're looking at juvenile dispersal, looking at survival, and trying to inform some of the, these movement corridors as they relate to, to uh, these deer movements across the landscape. And what we're learning is, is, at least in our study, females move a little bit more than we thought they did, and they're moving longer distances than we thought we did. Now, understanding they tend to be uh, less infected than males, but them moving across the landscape is also very important. Um, we see with GPS technology, we know exactly where these deer are going, and we're seeing these males move fairly long distances, and in this case, into Iowa, because it's right on our border, and then come, spending a, a period of time and then coming back along the exact same travel route that they went into Iowa using. Um, and so we're seeing these short-term movements that are fairly long distance, where it'd be fairly easy for a male to walk 15 miles into Iowa, pick up disease, and walk it right back into Minnesota. 
So we're looking at, at these natural movements and how they might influence long-term disease transmission. And I think this is an important piece um, of, the, of the puzzle. So the take home, I think a lot of this is pretty obvious for folks. Early detection is key. That would get into Kristen's uh, uh, use of the word luck. You know, what, what brings us to the point where we can find disease early? Uh, I think I feel very strongly about this, that we need, you need legal authority to implement strategies. You just, if you can't do it legally, you can't do it. Um, I think that, that, that you have, we have to, as managers, we use the tools that are available until something better comes along. And in this case, it's oftentimes agency culling. It's not popular, but simply waiting for the next best shiny object to come along just isn't a very good idea. I think, again, Brian talked about coronavirus and, and there's all sorts of diseases out there that show you how important early detection is. And then once the disease is, is established on the landscape, as, especially in the wild environment, it's impossible to eliminate. Um, I feel also real strongly uh, that it needs to incorporate an HD component. I did my, my, did my undergrad and master's degree in the biological sciences, but I did my, my PhD in the social sciences looking at regulatory alternatives related to to deer management. So um, I've done a lot of work in this area, and I think if we're going to be successful, we need to incorporate that. Um, and that biological research that approximates those local conditions is, is really important. What a deer does in northern Minnesota, where they, they yard up in the winter, has very little applicability to the farmland zones of my state or the southeast, where, where we have really good habitat, high densities in deer that, that don't seasonally migrate. Um, we need public support. We just can't do this stuff by ourselves. Um, we recognize how much, and Nick talked about talked about this as well, that that we just can't we just can't uh, do this without public support or public funding. In my state, this this slide we're now up to well we're going to be about 11.7 million dollars after FY20 ends. But at the end of F FY19, we spent uh, about eight and a half million dollars. 86 percent of that came from license fees. So that's taking from that's taking from one fixed account and moving it to the to a different area of the same fixed account. So we're not doing things because we're spending so much on disease management out of our game and fish fund. We also know uh, we're losing hunters naturally. They're, they're aging out like they are everywhere else, but it appears we're losing them at a faster rate in our CWD management zone. Um, our hunters quitting, and this is where we're going to try and get to in our statewide survey, are hunters quitting because it's not worth the risk perception related to potential human health? Are they quitting because they don't like the regulations? Uh, why, are they, why are they quitting? But if you have a, a statewide CWD problem, you're going to lose hunters because of that, and none of us can afford to do that um, as state wildlife managers because our funding is so strong, highly based on, on license sales. So real briefly, we have a lot of disease going on in our state. A lot of it's related to captive service detections. Those are the gray areas with the orange circles around them. Um, we have a couple of disease management zones in, in Minnesota. Uh, we also found uh, CWD positive deer on, in our South Metro just about three weeks ago. Uh, we don't know where that one's coming from. We're doing a, a, a kind of our own little epi investigation now, looking at captive servant operations and their risk, uh, looking at you know, deer densities and where a deer might have come from. So we're dealing with a lot of disease in my state um, from different uh, from different uh, areas or different reasons, um, but we're we're implementing our plan uh, in all cases. And not to pick on my friends to the east, I I think this is an important slide to show. I think folks should spend some time looking at uh, on Wisconsin's website. They have a, they have a lot of data, a lot of graphs, a lot of maps to show what they're dealing with. So these are pulled right off Wisconsin's website. Um, and this is what we're trying to avoid. You know, look at, look again, look, go back to coronavirus and exponential increase in positive detect detections, although we can argue about, you know, testing. I think if you look at what Wisconsin's done, what's happened in Wisconsin since they took, since they were uh, uh, mandated to take that passive approach, you've seen a large, almost exponential increase in, in, in percent prevalence. Uh, there's a there's study in Southwest Wisconsin looking at deer mortality. Uh, they see a higher mortality rate of animals that are infected but not symptomatic. So we're we're working as a state agency to avoid avoid this situation where we don't have endemic disease and leave that disease for future generations to deal with. It's our it's our turn now, and we do what we can to mitigate, manage, and hopefully eliminate that disease. 
So with that, I'll wrap it up and I'll also be around for the, the discussion later this afternoon. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Cornicelli. That was great. Um, good presentation. I appreciate all that. And, and so I'd like to move on next to uh, Dr. Paul Shelton. Uh, Paul works for the Division of Wildlife for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So, Paul, we'll pass it over to you. Uh, hey, thanks. Th thanks. Uh, I forgot to turn my mute off. Can you hear me okay now? Got you loud and clear, Paul. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take a slightly different approach than Blue did. I, I'm going to tend to focus much more on one particular aspect of our program. We've been dealing with CWD uh, now for 18 years in the state of Illinois. Let's see, how do I get control of this? There we go. We, we identified our first positive deer in October of 2002, uh, so following up on Wisconsin's find about six, six months earlier. This was a suspect animal uh, just south of the Illinois-Wisconsin border in the north central part of the state. We were already geared up at that time to do a fairly large uh, surveillance program during our firearm deer season, which came right on the heels of finding that suspect. So we we had check stations across the our northern tier of counties that we were going to sample fairly intensively uh, for CWD at that time. Now, uh, we found CWD in three of those counties during that sampling, Winnebago, Boone, and McHenry County. And so in those counties, we had sampled 701 deer and we identified six positives in two distinct clusters. So this kind of set the stage, well, what are we gonna do now? We, we needed to gather some more, some additional information. So right after the close of hunting seasons, we immediately implemented a program of what we called follow-up surveillance. We wanted to get additional data on those two cluster areas. And so we immediately set out contacting landowners and we deployed sharpshooters into those two areas and took 181 deer and identified five more positives from those 181 deer. Now, during the course of the time when we were also doing sharpshooting, we, we had an additional couple of suspect animals in the in one of those cluster areas, and we identified another two positives from suspect animals. So we closed out the year with a total of 14 positives in two distinct clusters, and these were affecting three counties. Now, some of the observations, just from this small amount of data, some of the things that struck us was, okay, we, we took 181 sharp shooting samples, 701 hunting samples. Sharp shooting only comprised about 20% of our overall samples. And yet compared to hunting, it, it accounted for 45% of the pos positives that we identified. So this struck us, so, okay, when we focus in on those areas where we've identified CWD positives is coming from, we can be very effective at removing positive animals from the landscape with this focused, this targeted sharpshooting approach. So we, we discovered that sharp shot deer were more than three times more likely to be positive than hunter harvested deer in those counties. And of note to us was that the 181 sharp shot deer that we took only came from 20 sections. So 20 square mile sections is where all those deer came from, which is 1.4% of the total land area. There's more than 1,400 square miles of, of land in those three counties. So our take home messages from this were, well, targeting culling, uh, you just, you have to kill far fewer deer in order to remove the same number of positive animals as, as hunter harvested deer. 
and the sharpshooting affects only a very small proportion of the landscape and, and it is very effective for removing sick animals. So looking at the number of, of hunter harvested deer that we had, we would have had to ha have had almost that number again in order to come up with those five more positives that we picked up. So we theorized that if we could focus our culling only on high risk portions of the population, leave the remainder of the deer population alone in that county, then, then we have a, a really good chance of influencing prevalence rates of CWD. So anyway, those, those take home messages carried over into, into shaping our long-term program. And, and the trends that we saw during that first year remain true today. Now, we're not trying to minimize the importance of hunter harvest. Hunter harvest is critical to us. It, it helps us get our, our deer population levels at, the, at a management unit scale. It helps, them, helps us keep them at appropriate levels. So at the county level, it's, it's just critical that we get our hunters to harvest enough deer. And, and the samples that are generated from those deer are, are also critical. They're the backbone of our CWD surveillance program. However, when it comes right down to it, we're just not aware of any program anywhere that's been successful at controlling CWD prevalence using hunting programs alone. So we set up our CWD program, and unlike Lou, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus just almost entirely on on a single aspect of our management program. I'll touch briefly on our surveillance program, and unfortunately, outreach I'm I'm gonna have to pass up on today because of the time constraints. But these three components are, you know, critical to any uh, basic. CWD program. And, and as Brian mentioned, and I want to reiterate, surveillance and management are clearly not the same thing. Surveillance is to provide you with data to inform your management, but simply the taking of samples and collecting of that testing information is, is not in itself management. Just touching briefly on our surveillance program, we we take samples from just virtually every source that we can come up with in order to get the data that we need. We, we want to test enough samples so that we know how distribution is changing, how prevalence rates are changing, where CWD is and where it is not. We collect samples from check stations. We have cooperating meat lockers and taxidermists that collect for us. We have self-serve kiosks, drop-off places. Uh, for when check stations are not open. Uh, we collect samples from our sharpshooting, uh, special permits that we issue, whether they're nuisance deer removal permits or, or uh, urban deer population control permits. And in high risk areas, we also collect from road kills and, and of course suspects everywhere because if, if you get a suspect, you know, that's, uh, clearly a good way of identifying new areas. We get a very high high hit rate off of suspects. They're clearly worth following up on each and every time. Now our location information, we collect, we collect data and, and record it down to the private land survey section, so one square mile. And when we detect a positive, we'll, we'll follow up with the hunter. We'll confirm exactly where that positive came from for our data set. In recent years, we've we've tested eight to nine thousand deer per year. Two thirds of those come from our CWD zone up north, and one third is is a, is a more cursory examination downstate. But in our CWD areas and the areas adjacent to them, this this gives us a good coverage of essentially all deer habitat in those counties, and. Northern Illinois, particularly the, the central and northeastern portion of it, are not highly forested. I mean, you're talking counties that may have two to 10% forest cover in, in some of these areas. And so uh, as you move to the west, we have much more forest cover. But in, in our initial 
uh, find area, which was along our Winnebago and Boone County line, uh, much much more fragmented, much smaller woodlots. So anyway, get, getting this level of information in our CWD area gives us the information that we need to identify where we need to work, how things are changing, what the critical areas are that we need to look at, and, and where we need to focus our efforts. Now, uh, you, you've heard many different uh, regulatory changes and things you can do to, to manage, uh, whether you're uh, trying to increase harvest pressure or whether you're doing things to encourage social distancing, if you will, among deer, whether it's feeding vans and, and also restrictions on deer movements, carcasses, that sort of thing. But I'm going to focus on the things that Illinois is best known for, our targeted culling program. We have all these other things in, in place as well, and I'm happy to discuss them with you uh, if you have questions about them later on. But let's talk about our targeting culling program. Our direct management strategies, those that, those that deal with deer removals, changing density, that sort of thing, we, we have two, two overall strategies. And one, one is to have our regulations such that we can increase hunter harvest during our hunting seasons for a, for a widespread lowering of overall deer densities at the county level. Now, in addition to that, we, we follow that up with this focused intensive sharpshooting in known CWD areas. And this allows for a removal of a high proportion of deer in a, in a very small, specific, and strategically important area. Now, the assumptions on, on which that is based, and, uh, as Brian touched on earlier, one of them is that there, there are many benefits to lower deer densities. And, you know, that means that we have the potential for lower direct disease transmission rates, less environmental contamination, less emigration, or, or long range movements. And I'll touch on that last one there uh, a little bit uh, towards the end, because as, as Brian said, you know, talking about slowing the spread and that sort of thing, it's a very difficult thing to document. And, uh, but th this last one is more or less a truism that CWD will decline if we remove sick deer faster than, than deer are getting sick. And, and th that's what it is that we're trying to do. Now, many of you have heard this question before. You'll hear it again. We, we hear it. You know, why are you using sharpshooting? Let, let the hunters take care of it. Just tell us what you want to do. And, and, and we'll take care of it for you. So how do you answer that question? Well, there are a number of reasons why we use sharpshooting. And, and one of the first ones is, is that we made a number of changes to our regulations as far as liberalization and offering more and doing away with bag limits and, and encouraging harvest. And, and we found that those different changes that we made did not result in any measurable increases in harvest whatsoever. Uh, we also have to consider the fact that a significant portion of our CWD area is, is very urbanized. It represents some of the fastest growing portions of the state. And uh, access for hunting can be difficult. In many of these counties, archery hunting is significant. Is, a significantly larger contributor to our harvest than firearm hunting. And so it's difficult to get that access, but we have found that our staff can access many of the properties that are that are not open to hunting. So we can get into areas that, that in many cases hunters cannot. And then this last consideration that I've listed is, is that sharpshooting has a very small footprint. And that it's actually, if, if you're concerned about overall depletion of the deer herd, uh, it's, sharp shooting is very advantageous because, because you're only affecting a, a very small portion of the overall landscape. But at the same time, you're able to, to have a very large impact on, 
on how many positives that you take. How do we operate? Well, every year we, we delineate CWD management zones, and we do that by buffering all our recent positives with a two-section buffer around each one, and, and that results in, in what you see here on the map. Uh, this is from fairly recent years in which and shows the distribution of CWD management areas that are generated off those recent positives. So if, if, if a section has been positive and has been in a management zone, but we haven't found CWD in, in, in four or five years, then this drops out and we only work in those active zones. We, we fly each one of those zones every year, when, if possible, weather cooperating, because we typically fly over snow cover. And, uh, and record all deer numbers and locations into, into a GIS. And then we prioritize which one of these zones are, are more important to work in than others, where we have to really focus our efforts. And, and this is based primarily on a combination of, of prevalence and deer density. Uh, in some cases, it may be simply uh, we may simply have to overlook an area because of lack of access because as you all know we can't accomplish this without landowner cooperation so every year what we do is we we begin uh, mid-january after the close of our deer hunting seasons and continue until the end of March with our shark shooting, typically shoot four nights a week. All the deer that we remove are tested. Uh, we take a number of different tissue samples, not just for testing, but for various research projects that we're working on. And uh, when we get back our CWD test results, we destroy all positives and uh, the remainder of deer are processed and donated to uh, food pantry. We do two types of shark shooting. Uh, one is in the newly discovered spark areas. What we do is more of a follow-up surveillance. We wanna have a look at it, make a determination of whether this is in fact a new spark or, or whether we have some disease that we previously overlooked. So it's, it pretty much allows us to make an assessment of what CWD status is in that newly discovered area. And, and then in areas where we know that we have significant CWD, uh, then uh, that's more of a herd reduction type of effort. It's not, we're past the data gathering stage. We're, we're trying to actually enact, enact some change, do some herd reductions in that area. And, and instead of just taking a, a more cursory look and, and gathering data, uh, we'll take deer that are gonna be, the numbers are gonna be more constrained by how much time, how much manpower we have in order to, to put in on that particular area. In a typical year, uh, we'll take oh, 1,000 to maybe 1,200 deer from our CWD areas using shark shooting. And in one of those typical years, you, those deer would come from anywhere from 100 to 125 sections based on priority. And so 100 sections compared to the 7,000 plus square miles of our CWD area shows what a really small proportion of the landscape that we are impacting. Now, what are some of our findings? Well, looking at the areas where we're shooting, uh, recently our CWD research team uh, looked at 16 years of data uh, from our shark shooting data and our prevalence data. And, and based on their findings, uh, managers have a decision to make when they find a CWD positive section. And, and that decision has the potential to cause a 20% swing in CWD risk in that section the following year. And so the question they have to answer is, is will targeted culling be implemented or not? Because what they found was, is that if we found CWD and we followed it up by shark shooting, then the risk of CWD in that section decreased by 9% annually while we were shark shooting. If we, if we didn't get around to shark shooting, we're unable to access 
properties in that section, uh, the, the risk of CWD infection with no shark shooting water increases annually of 11% per year. So it's a pretty big difference, particularly in, and it, and it accumulates over time. Now, on a, on a wider scale, what are, what are we seeing? Well, if you look at the first, oh, 10, 11, 12 years of data, there was really no significant increase in prevalence that we could see across our CWD area. But in more recent years, we've seen some increases. Uh, it, it has been trending upward. Uh, this, our overall prevalence rate uh, in 2019 was uh, in the neighborhood of 1.6%. Uh, this is disturbing, but, but not really unexpected. And I, and I think part of, part of the explanation is, is that we have, we, we have done an excellent job of keeping prevalence rates at very low levels, but, but that part about uh, slowing spread or stopping spread, uh, we've definitely come up short there. Uh, here in the highly agricultural fragmented lands of, of the Midwest are, are very mobile. It's not uncommon for us to see a positive deer pop up 30, 40 plus miles away from where we originally knew that it was. And, and finding these new spark areas quickly and getting on to them is, is very challenging. But not only that, as, as we've seen these increases over time in more recent years, we simply have much more difficulty uh, deploying enough people and having access to enough properties uh, in order to keep sharpshooting uh, having the same overall effect that we had when, when our CWD area was much smaller than it currently is today. And you see of note, uh, this is just for both sexes. Uh, our, our male prevalence rates tend to be uh, pretty much two times what female prevalence rates are. So male prevalence rates in recent years would be up in the neighborhood of 2%, while female prevalence rates would tend to be less than 1%. This shows you the extent of spread that we have seen in Illinois. Uh, we've now found CWD in with one or more case in, in 18 counties. Uh, our most uh, heavily entrenched areas remain in the in the northern tier of counties, although although we have some areas of real concern along the Illinois River towards the south as well. So we've seen quite a bit of spread. So just to summarize this quickly, we, we've been very effective at keeping prevalence rates low, and and for that we're really grateful. However, uh, spread of the disease is, is a huge problem for us. And uh, some of the biggest challenges that we have right now are the spread, uh, the ability to access enough cooperating properties, and, and whether or not we have enough manpower and funding to, to maintain our efforts over a much larger CWD management zone. And with that, I'll uh, call it quits. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Shelton. That was a lot of great information. Uh, we're going to move right along um, to uh, Jasmine Batten. And Jasmine is the Wildlife Disease Coordinator for the Missouri Department of Conservation. And she's going to give her uh, a presentation. And then I think we'll try to take a 15-minute break for lunch so we don't get too far behind schedule. And then we'll pick back up with uh, Courtney Colley and Andrea Corman, both from the Game Commission. So <clears throat> before that, uh, Jasmine, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. And Matthew, I know we had some difficulties with my presentation this morning, and we're back to the old, the old one. So I'm going to quick share my screen here for you all. Okay, no problem. And let me get the right thing open. All right, can you see my presentation? Yep, I've got it and I can hear you loud and clear, so you're good to go. Great, 
All right, well, I'm, I'm very thankful that, that, that Missouri was invited to come and share our CWD story to date. Um, I'll try to keep this right around 20 minutes because I know we've, we're probably getting a little bit tired and hungry at this point. So I've been um, coordinating and leading chronic waste and disease efforts in the state of Missouri for going on seven years. Um, and what I'm gonna share with you today is just a really quick overview of kind of where we've come from and, and where we are now today, and then just highlight some of our approach to our surveillance and management, as well as share some challenges and lessons that we've had to date. So our CWD story kind of began in Missouri um, a few years before I came on board when in 2010 and 2011, we had two big game hunting preserves up in the northeast part of the state. You can see those orange dots um, that did test positive for chronic wasting disease. However, CWD surveillance was not new um, to the state of Missouri at that point. By no coincidence, we started heavy surveillance in 2002 um, as concerns of CWD um, spreading into the Midwest were growing. So when we detected chronic waste and disease at these two facilities, uh, we had already tested about 30,000 deer in the state, including a big push of about 200 deer, deer um, per county. So the following year, we did in, increase surveillance in those areas, um, very similar to what other states have done, zero radius and sharp shot and um, increased hunter harvested samples. And, and lo and behold, we did find five CWD um, free ranging deer within a mile or two of one of those hunting preserves. Um, so that's kind of when management in, or CW, the CWD story really, really uh, took hold here in our state. Fast forward to today, just to kind of see where we are. Um, what you're looking at is the, the, the point locations of all the positives that we've had to date in our state, as well as um, right across our state borders in Iowa and Arkansas. And so we've had 162 CWD positive free ranging deer since 2012, um, and we sampled actually over 160,000 deer. I can't take credit for any of the surveillance and management plan that was put into place originally in our state uh, because it was before my, my time working here. Um, but you'll see that definitely the folks that, that put this plan together here in Missouri um, were, were paying attention to what was happening in other places. You know, a lot of the kind of things that Brian Richards went over, I think, were taken into consideration when this plan has, was put into place. I mean, I will say, I'll talk a little bit about some of the adaptions and changes that we've made over time, but at the heart of, at the heart of everything we're doing here, our basic goals have remained pretty steadfast. Um, so I, I know Brian made a good point earlier about goals needing to be measurable, and we're still trying to figure out what those actual measures are. Um, so these might be a little annoying to him with his, the, their kind of loftiness, but at the heart of everything we're doing since since we found CWD, we've been aiming to detect the disease early, uh, minimize long-term impacts over time by applying management actions, uh, monitoring changes in part so that we can provide accurate information to our stakeholders, but also um, so that in the longer run, we can assess our management actions and either do a better job or make hard decisions about what the biggest priority for our resources is. And then finally, providing that information for our hunters and, and the rest of the public so that they can feel confident um, in our actions, in, in our accountability for how we're spending our resources, and so we can keep hunters on board and feeling confident in hunting in the state of Missouri. So, you know, one of those first goals that I mentioned was detecting the disease early and then monitoring changes over time. Um, the way that we've done our surveillance certainly has changed over the years. When we first detected CWD in Northeast Missouri, uh, we implemented enhanced surveillance in counties within 25 miles of CWD detections. At the time, increasing surveillance primarily meant putting our staff at meat processor stations uh, during our fire, firearm season and voluntary collecting samples from hunters that were bringing deer in for processing at those locations. Um, a few years after our first detection of CWD, when we started to detect CWD in new areas of the state, uh, we made the decision to dramatically increase our surveillance. Um, you know, we had questions ourselves about what the status of CWD was in our state. Um, our hunting public was becoming more concerned as we 
found new areas um, in new regions of the state. And so in 2016, we did pass a regulation requiring hunters in any CWD management zone county to present their deer if it was harvested from opening weekend of our firearm season in November um, for testing. And so what that has done is in these management zone counties dramatically increased our sample surveillance. When what you're seeing on the map, um, it just looks like a bunch of a, a bunch of dots or blobs. Those are all square mile sections um, where we collected samples from this past season. Um, I will note, I'll explain this in a second, but these are only samples where we have that, that location down to a square mile. And so what this means is that in a very short period of time, in two days, uh, we are, uh, are able to sample upwards of about 18,000 deer. Um, you'll see that really good distribution gives us a real confident handle on the distribution of, of CWD in those areas where it's been detected. Um, but a really important thing about our, the way that we are survey, surveying for CWD in Missouri is that we have not forgot those other counties further away from, from our known detections. And so we have continued to sample deer throughout our entire state annually. Um, outside of those management zone counties, most of our samples are coming from hunter harvested deer collected by participating taxidermists. So we are currently working with about 100 and 25 taxidermists, and although we do not have a specific weighted surveillance system like Dr. Schuler talked about in New York, um, these are all samples coming from adult male deer, so that is increasing our detection probability even though we have smaller sample size. And so this map is just our annual total surveillance of samples from, from this past season. Um, the darker red, the color, the more samples we'll have, and you can see the the, um, the, the high number of samples in those management zone counties that we have. And we really feel strongly that this continued surveillance is important so that when the disease spreads to new areas of the state or is introduced um, to a new area, we can find it as early as possible. So that kind of covers how we are monitoring and um, detecting the disease over time, but as pointed out by several several folks already. You know, testing for the disease, monitoring really is simply surveillance and and just testing deer is not is not going to change the outcome of this disease progression over time. And so we've kind of taken a two tier approach to um, slowing the impacts of the disease or, or potentially slowing spread. And the first is the implementation of a bigger scale, broad preventative regulation. And I mean, I mentioned that CWD management zone idea. I just want to make one point that when we started our CWD regulations, we did use um, all the counties within a 25 mile radius of detections. And over time, we've shrunk that radius. So today, our management zone county includes counties within 10 miles of detections, and we've got um, 29 counties in that zone. So what are the first regu regulations that was passed um, in 2012 was a prohibition on the use of feed and minerals in our management zone counties. We felt strongly that there's plenty of evidence that feeding deer and the use of minerals um, can congregate deer and, and, and expedite disease transmission. Uh, Missouri has not had baiting, um, so you can't shoot deer over, over, over a feed pile anywhere in the state. Um, but now in these counties, you're not allowed to feed them either or use minerals. And for the most part, we haven't gotten a real strong pushback on the feeding side of it. We do get some heartache over the removal of the use of minerals um, because as many hunters in other states also enjoy using those minerals with their camera surveys on their own property. Another regulation change that we utilize in our CWD management zone counties, again, with that goal of of slowing the spread of the disease is the removal of our antler point restrictions. So Missouri has had antler point restrictions um, since 20, 2004. In 2004, in 29 counties in our state, a four point antler point restriction was put in place. The intent of this antler point restriction really was to address some very quickly growing deer populations in some key areas. Um, so the antler point restriction was an attempt to slow the population growth in those counties. 
um, when we found CWD in the state, we recognized that keeping that antler point restriction in place for those counties where we find CWD or nearby um, might not be the best disease management decision. We know that the antler point restriction was protecting a very large percent of our yearling males. Um, we, we knew that yearling males annually disperse long distances, and so we knew that those, those individual deer uh, were a risk for introducing disease into new areas of the state. So for our CWD management zone counties that have an antler point restriction, once they're in that zone, we do remove, remove that, that APR. Um, and so what I'm going to just really briefly show you is what that impact of, of APR removal was on our, our deer harvest. Um, so the first figures here, this is from 2012, the first year that we removed, removed antler point restrictions in our zone. So, so what we're showing on, on the graph here is what our composition of our harvest looked like in 2012 in the counties where we did have an APR, so you see a significantly higher uh, buck harvest compared, or I'm sorry, doe harvest compared to antler bucks, 51% does, 35% antler bucks. For that year, when we compared to those counties where we did not have an APR, um, there was not surprisingly a very, or a, a significantly closer ratio, pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio of does to antler bucks being harvest, harvested. And for those counties in the CWD zone where we had an antler point restriction, and then we removed it for disease management purposes, um, that harvest very quickly in that first year reflected the, the counties where there had never been an APR. Um, so what this demonstrated to us was that our hunters were pretty flexible in their behavior. Certainly the antler point restriction has been a popular regulation, hunters like it, but it turns out that our hunters really just like the opportunity to, to shoot a deer, and so they have been flexible in in changing their behavior and their selection out in the field. The good news is it does not seem that this APR regulation removal or the, the other CWD regulations that, we're in, that we are um, applying in our CWD management zones is impacting our hunter satisfaction. Um, so when we look at since our CWD regulation started and we compare how our hunters rate our deer management program here in the state comparing our CWD counties in blue and, the, and the, the neighboring border counties outside of the zone in red, we see that that hunter satisfaction um, really is quite similar. Um, we'll also, what this graph tells us, you'll see that big dip um, in relation to our a big hemorrhagic disease outbreak we had. So I think this graph also demonstrates, again, that fact that hunters in Missouri um, most link their satisfaction with deer management on that opportunity to harvest a deer and not, not so much for our particular regulations that we've, that we've passed. So as we've heard a few folks say, also, you know, surveillance is not management. And so the next tier um, in our CWD surveillance and management approach really is active management. And Paul Shelton just did a great job of setting up um, what active management it looks like for us in Missouri. Um, so we very much have taken the playbook from Illinois. And as we've detected CWD in new areas, we've created a one to two square mile buffer. And we call those CWD core areas. We have attempted to allow our hunters to help us with that increased harvest in those areas uh, by offering them more opportunities during the regular season to harvest harvest year, but as, but has, as, as has been observed in other states, you know, we really aren't getting enough of an increase to feel like we're influencing the disease. So we have also um, relied on sharpshooting or postseason targeted pulling in these areas very near CWD detections as a very significant part of our disease management or treatment over time. So, you know, since Paul really gave the whys, I don't really need to spend much time on that. Like I said, we very much have appreciated appreciated the way that Illinois has paved, paved the road for us. So we've really, really followed suit in a lot of their techniques. Um, the goals are the, exactly the same as, as he laid out, you know, removing sick deer or infected deer at a higher rate than they can be infected, um, over time minimizing accumulation of CWD in the environment, and then really only focusing those population impacts in those areas directly where the disease has found and not impacting um, the deer populations 
in the in the remainder of the county. So what I'm showing here is our CWD core areas from this past winter. Uh, we operate as soon as our regular deer seasons close for two months. Um, so for the winter 2020, we we collectively harvested 23. 99 deer. Um, one important point that I will mention about our, our technique for target killing that differs from Illinois and some of the other states in Minnesota, um, we are not contracting with USDA Wildlife Services at all. So we are using our staff time um, through a training and certification program. And most notably, we're allowing uh, landowners during this time to harvest deer as well. Um, so we allow them to be authorized to take deer out of season. We also allow them to use methods very, very much outside of regular, regular hunting methods. So they can use bait during this time. They can use lights at night. This really is a, a management tool and not, not, um, not hunting. So, like Paul, like like Illinois, we really are only culling deer in a very small part of our state. Um, you know, those those red boundaries or the areas that we could potentially put put culling into place, but we're certainly not removing deer from all of those areas. Um, within those red boundaries that you see, there's, it's only about 40% of the square miles that deer are being culled from. Um, and really that amounts to significantly less than 1% of the state in terms of square mile where we're, where we're doing management. So one thing I wanted to point out is that we definitely have adapted over time as we've gone on. Um, you know, we certainly didn't get everything right or get everything the way we thought was a perfect world for disease management in the in the in the first swoop. Um, so over time, we're we continue to reevaluate to find risk factors and try to fill the hole in the bucket, so to speak. So one area that has been a work in progress is mitigating some perceived risks of disease spread through confined service or confined deer. Um, we, when we passed our CWD regulations, we did not pass any regulations related to confined service. We do have joint jurisdiction with our Department of Agriculture. Um, in 2012, our commission did approve a moratorium on breeder and big game hunting preserve permits when the disease was found in the state. Um, we also filed an emergency order with the Secretary of State, which was a denied request. And then we followed up with meetings with our Department of Agriculture and deer breeders. Um, and ultimately the outcome was our agency deciding not to move forward with filing any um, final order rulemaking related to confined service regulations. Fast forward to 2014, our Conservation Commission did approve a suite of regulations uh, related to confined deer and elk, including a ban on the importation of these animals into the state, uh, enhanced fencing requirements, as well as additional testing and record keeping requirements. Um, however, these regulations were put on hold because of litigation. We did have a lawsuit filed against us. It ultimately ended up in our state Supreme Court. And in 2018, our state Supreme Court did rule that deer and elk in Missouri are game and wildlife resources of the state. Um, and so therefore, we did have authority and our regulations could be implemented. So these regulations are in place. Um, they are still a work in progress. And we are working very closely with our Department of Agriculture um, to figure out the road forward as we're enforcing these changes. The second biggest I'd say hole in the bucket that we've identified is the is related to the potential disease risk spread related to carcasses and carcass movement and carcass disposal. We continued to see this distribution of CWD making big jumps in the state. Um, you know, all these regions where we found new clusters of CWD without any known cases anywhere nearby. Um, and so we started really looking at carcasses. And we had tried for a number of years a really uh, intensive education and outreach campaign, but we continue to, to see carcasses being moved throughout the state from CWD positive areas. So we set out, we surveyed all of our hunters, um, we surveyed our taxidermists and processors who we do permit. So we do have some authority over in terms of their handling of deer. And we found that most of our hunters were, in, were, were disposing of deer on their own properties or taking them to a processor but there were a, a number of them that, um, that were moving them around the state and disposing in, in new counties. 
Concerningly, we also found out that 23% of our taxiderms and processors were disposing deer parts on the landscape. So we did have some carcass regulations that will be in, in place this fall. It includes um, an amendment to a carcass import ban. So we used to allow whole carcasses into the state if they were going to a processor. That, that exception has been removed. The big thing, though, is the in, interstate Excuse me. Let's drink the water quick. The biggest change for our hunters is that in our CWD management zone counties, which are shaded and orange there, a hunter will not be able to move a whole carcass out of those counties this fall unless they're going to a processor or a taxidermist. And our processors and taxidermists are now going to be required by regulation to use a landfill to dispose of those parts. So Quickly trying to wrap up here. I think I already lied and I'm going over 20 minutes, so we'll wrap up. Um, in terms of what, what we've seen as success in Missouri, um, you know, when we look at our distribution here, we believe that CWD today remains relatively rare in the state, uh, where, you know, we're, where we're finding the disease. It's at low prevalence. We have been successful in detecting it early. So right now we think that's the win, and we're hoping, hoping we can keep it that way. Um, another success is it appears that our management actions are likely limiting, helping to limit the spread of CWD. Now we recognize we're very early in our CWD progression, so it's going to take some time yet to really parse out how culling is, is impacting CWD growth. Um, but what we're looking at here is that our, our original index cases up in northeast Missouri within a 15-mile radius, the, per, um, the percent of positive hunter harvested adult male time over year, over time. So within a 15 mile radius of where we first found CWD, you can see that our prevalence is, is staying close to 1%. If you focus in a little closer in our original CWD core area, um, that prevalence at a smaller scale is, is, is hovering below 5%. Um, finally, one of our big successes to date, I think, is engaging our, our hunting public a few years ago, we surveyed our hunters as part of our routine annual deer surveys that we do, and we found out that the, the majority of our hunters view CWD as a threat to the Missouri deer population. So I think that's a really good, good point to leverage. We'll, we see that 20% of them at the time either agreed or disagreed, so we've really been trying to, to, to reach those folks and bring them on board with us. Um, in terms of challenges, there's a lot of challenges with CWD management, and it's hard to just pick one or two, but one of our biggest challenges currently is this continued spread of the disease into new areas of the state. While the disease might be rare um, in many of these areas, there are a lot of regions where the disease has been introduced, um, and as we continue with our aggressive management, it's becoming very resource intensive to manage in these areas, and Paul kind of talked about this a bit too, where, you know, each new cluster we find is, is more targeted culling, more sampling. Um, and what you're looking at in this graph is looking just at our targeted culling management, the number of hours that we coded um, to sharpshooting or targeted culling through winter of 2019. So we're spending a significant amount of time and money um, on this effort, and that is often at the expense of other, other management actions or priorities um, across the state. Another big challenge is managing across state borders. Missouri is not an island. Now you can see where we are there. We're surrounded by other states with CWD, and each state's management actions are very different. I'd say we're doing a great job at communicating with our neighbors, um, but because our regulations are very different, it can be confusing to the public, and we really have to defend why our, our response might not look like our neighbors to the, to the south or north. And then finally, one point to make is that increased, increased challenge that I see from my perspective and experience here is that hunters really are becoming more concerned about getting their test, test results um, and concerns about potential human health risks. And so it seems like no matter how much capacity we build and how much faster we turn, turn test results around, the hunters and the pro meat processors and those sorts of interests just really want them faster. Um, a, a success related to this is our University of Missouri here in Columbia, where I'm located, has stepped up to the plate and, and came on board with CWD, CWD testing last year. So we now have an in-state in lab, um, and they were able to process our 18,000 samples for mandatory sampling in less than two weeks this year. So 
that's good, but it's not, I don't think in the long term it's good enough as hunters are kind of toggling on that, that, that border of losing support for hunting in areas with CWD. So to wrap up, um, from Missouri's perspective, we really believe that early detection is important. However, that importance is greater if you are actively managing the disease. So a big tenant of our targeted culling and managing is, is getting in early and trying to, to, stamp, to, to lessen the growth of that disease as much as possible. Um, another, another conclusion is that you know, all hope is not lost. When we look across North America, most of our deer are not infected today. And that's certainly the case in Missouri. And so that does leave room for us to make a difference. Um, we believe that limiting prevalence is buying us time for science to catch up. I didn't talk about research in Missouri, but I will say that we are um, now after several years of really intensive sampling and you know, targeted cooling in all, a lot of areas, we're kind of at a place where we're reevaluating and, and setting some, some priorities um, for research. So that'll be coming down the road. And finally, you know, most of our hunters here in Missouri agree that doing nothing is not an option, and I think that really is, is the case. So there, there are things to be hopeful, hopeful for, even though that this is a difficult topic that we often share bad news with. So with that, I will wrap up so that folks can get along to lunch. Awesome. Thanks, Jasmine. That was great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick lunch break until 1 o'clock. It looks like we're back on schedule, so we can start back up at 1 o'clock with Courtney Colley. Uh, Courtney's our CWD communication specialist there at the agency. Um, and so um, have a good lunch, and we'll see you back here at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Why? Okay, Dr. Schnoop, uh, it's on you. Okay, folks, so we're going to get back to, uh, uh, to it after lunch here. We appreciate you tuning back in. We have uh, two presentations specific for uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission, and first we're going to start off with Courtney Colley. Uh, Courtney Colley is our CWD uh, communication specialist. And then we're going to be followed with Andrea Corman, who is our CWD Actions Coordinator, who's going to go over the, uh, the proposed CWD management plan. So uh, to get started, we'll, we'll start with uh, Courtney Colley. Courtney, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as Matthew said, I'm the former CWD Communication Specialist. Um, I, as you see here on the slide, I currently work in social media and communications for the Game Commission. I was asked today to provide a summary of the public comments we received specifically addressing the CWD response plan. Um, so it should be noted that my summary, um, the, what I'm giving of the, the public comments are specific to the response plan. They do not represent statewide attitudes towards CWD. Uh, however, we are continually doing surveys to gather that information. So, as some of our speakers earlier today mentioned, chronic wasting disease is an always fatal disease that affects members of the deer family. Unfortunately, with no vaccine or cure, options to manage chronic wasting disease are limited. To date, most attempts to manage chronic wasting disease nationally have focused on reducing deer populations around known CWD causes through a combination of hunter harvest and agency directed targeted removals. Because target removals are a controversial management strategy, increasing hunting opportunities to harvest deer are crucial to In early 2019, the Game Commission consulted various representatives from other state wildlife agencies, representatives from conservation based non government organizations, some consulted representatives from local universities to draft a CW response plan for 2020. 
The response plan strives to stabilize CWD infection rate and slow the spread of CWD um, in the state through increased hunting opportunities. Options proposed in the draft CWD response plan include increasing harvest tag applications, extending hunting seasons, and removing antler point restrictions in CWD positive areas. The draft CWD response plan was made available on the Game Commission webpage um, for public comment from September 4th, 2019 to February 29th of this year. We created a standard forum to make public comments here to compare and also to encourage all respondents to provide feedback on each management option proposed in the draft CW response plan. Once again, this presentation summarizes the public input specifically provided through comment forms on the draft CW response plan. The Game Commission received a total of 447 public comments through phone, email, or mail. Of these comments, 357 public comment forms were submitted and were used to produce this summary. The Remaining 90 comments were received through phone calls, handwritten letters, or emails through general comments. These 90 comments did not directly address options provided in the draft COB response plan and therefore are not summarized in this presentation. However, it should be noted that while these comments are not summarized here, they did provide additional insight to better understand public concerns, knowledge, and support for CWD and CWD management. Each public comment form was collected and read by two Game Commission staff. All responses were categorized by the questions asked on the public comment form. And this summary, this summary outlines the number of responses for each question asked and summarizes the trends that we saw in responses. So when I say trend, I mean a statement, a recommendation, a suggestion, or even a concern that was commonly seen um, on multiple forms, okay? It should be noted that the responses to each question yielded no overall consensus. However, responses provided insight to the support for or lack of support for various options proposed in the draft CWD response plan. So the first question that we asked on the public comment form is, are you a Pennsylvania hunter? Out of the 357 public comment forms submitted, 341 people considered themselves Pennsylvania hunters, which represents approximately 97% of those who did respond. We did have six people who did not respond to this question. We then asked, uh, if the respondents read the draft CW response plan, out of the 357 public comment forms received, 315 respondents indicated that they read the draft CW response plan. This represents approximately 90% of those who did respond to the question, and we had 10 people who did not respond. We followed that question up by asking if respondents refer to any other sources to better understand the draft CW response plan. Out of the 357 public comment forms submitted, 341 people responded to this question. Of those who did respond, 220 people indicated they did reference other resources to better understand the draft CW response plan. This represents approximately 64% of our respondents. Respondents mentioned referencing the following resources. CW public programs, game news articles, the Game Commission website, local game wardens, response plans from other state agencies, social media, and television. However, it should be noted that some respondents may not have understood this question fully. For example, we had one respondent who noted, no, I did not reference any other materials, 
but they followed that up in a later statement that said, I attended a game commission meeting at Greenwood, and I read all of the CWD information on the game commission page. Um, so as you can see, that response there um, kind of shows that the individual may not have fully understood the question. Okay, so the remaining questions asked on the public comment form, uh, we were looking for specific input on the management options proposed in the draft CW management plan, and they were kind of posed as statements. To compare these responses more easily, each response was categorized as supportive, opposed, neutral, or non-responsive. To clarify, neutral responses are defined as a response that neither supports or opposes the management option proposed. So just an example, when asked to provide the proposal to expand hunting seasons, one responded, responded stated, the Game Commission should look into driving deer from private land. So, while this response suggests that the individual may be concerned about deer congregating on private land, the response doesn't really indicate a support for or a lack of support for the proposal to expand hunting seasons. Therefore, that response was categorized as being neutral. Out of the 357 public comment forms submitted, 300 and uh, 37 responded to this statement. Of those who did respond, 257 respondents, which is about 76%, supported the proposal to expand hunting seasons. 72 respondents did not support the proposal, and seven respondents provided a neutral response. A common trend mentioned in five responses recommended reinstating a concurrent hunting season within Pennsylvania's disease management areas. A nom I'm sorry, another common trend, uh, which was also seen in five responses, recommended the Game Commission only expand fall or late archery seasons and do not extend a rifle season. A few respondents did express some safety concerns, um, over archery being overlapped with rifle season. So um, we had a couple comments that uh, people who were concerned there may be some safety issues there if those two seasons would overlap. So um, asking for input about the proposal to remove antler point restrictions within disease management areas. Um, out of the 357 public comment forms submitted, 350 people did respond to this statement. Uh, of those who did respond, 228 respondents, which is about 65%, supported the proposal to remove antler point restrictions within disease management areas. 103 respondents opposed the proposal, and seven individuals provided neutral responses. The most common trend associated with this question, um, which we saw in 10 responses, was that respondents did not like the proposal to remove antler point restrictions, but they supported it because they understood the importance of doing so. So an example, um, one respondent noted, I like antler point restrictions, but if it needs to be done, then it needs to be done. The next most common trend associated with the statement uh, was the recommendation for the Game Commission to allocate more than one antlered harvest tag to hunters within disease management areas. Some of these respondents were not supportive of the proposal to remove antler point restrictions, but recommended the allocation of additional antlered harvest tags. Another trend commonly associated with the statement uh, recommended that the Commission not only remove antler point restrictions within in the disease management areas, but do so statewide. Um, so you can see there's kind of like a, a mixed response there. 
Next, we asked for input on the proposal to increase antlerless tag allocations. Out of the 357 public comment forms submitted, 350 people responded. Of those who responded, 52 people, which is about 72%, supported the proposal to increase antlerless harvest tag allocations. 88 people opposed the proposal and 10 provided neutral responses. Whether respondents supported or opposed this proposal, the most common trend we saw in nine responses expressed concerns that increasing tag allocations will not be effective because hunters will not harvest more deer. The next most common trend expressed among respondents um, who opposed this proposal noted concerns about low deer populations and hunting success. One respondent noted that killing more deer will not stop CWD. I would rather have today's deer herd size with CWD or without it. Another common trend associated with this proposal seen in five responses recommended the Game Commission reduce the cost of antlerless harvest tags. Whether respondents supported or opposed this proposal, Concerns were expressed about the ability to harvest deer that congregate on private land. One respondent noted, you can allocate all the tags you want, but without taking deer on private land, CWD will, will not slow down. Um, <clears throat> we then asked the public to provide input on the consideration to use target removals um, after hunters are provided the first opportunity to manage chronic wasting disease. Out of the 357 public comments submitted, 341 people responded to this question. Of those respondents, 205 people, which is about 60%, support the use of target removals if hunters have the first opportunity to harvest deer in these areas. And 115 people opposed the proposal. 21 respondents provided neutral responses. Um, it should be noted that some respondents may have misinterpreted this question or the information about target removals provided in the draft CWD response plan. We had 13 opponents stressing the need to provide hunters the first opportunity to manage CWD. So even though it clearly states that in the statement, um, we had many people stressing that in their response that hunters should have the first opportunity. And uh, just an example, we had one opponent simply state, hunters should have the first chance to remove deer. That was all they stated um, when asked for input on that um, proposal. Even though the draft COD response plan specifies that target removals will only be considered within CWD positive areas, Respondents commonly noted that they would only be supportive of the use of target removals in CWD positive areas or hotspots. Last, uh, we asked the public to give us some input on what is the best way to get information about CWD to them. Out of the 357 public comment forms submitted, 333 responded to this question. And it just, just be mentioned that um, numerous respondents listed more than one preferred source of information. Of those that did respond, the most popular preferred source of information listed was email, followed by the Game Commission website, news media, the Game Commission social media accounts, and direct mail. Other sources of information mentioned included um, game news articles, public meetings, and our annual hunting trapping digest. Uh, so the Pennsylvania Game Commission appreciates all of the individuals and organizations who took the time to provide input on the draft CW response plan. Uh, we consider all comments and recommendations provided um, through the public comment forms to make revisions to the CW response plan. And I know this was kind of a lot of information um, all at once, and it's a lot of 
Yeah. Um, so if anybody has questions about the summary that I just provided, I will be present during the panel discussion to answer any questions. Um, right after me is Andrea Corman, our CLB Actions Coordinator, who will be providing an overview of the revised CLB response plan. Thank you for your time. Okay, Courtney, thank you very much. Um, so yes, as you just said, we're going to move on to Andrea Corman. Uh, Andrea is the CWD Actions Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, but at this time I'd also like to draw attention to uh, Dr. Chris Rosenberry, our uh, Deer and Elk Section Supervisor, and Dr. Andrew DeSalvo, who is our Wildlife Veterinarian on staff. Um, this team worked together, and I think they've done a really great job of moving this thing forward and getting it to where it is today. So with further ado, I will uh, uh, turn it over to Andrea. All right, thanks, Matthew. Can you all hear me okay? Loud and clear. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, this is our revised response plan. Um, this was put out for public comment, and we used the comments from the public as well as input from Game Commission staff and other natural resource agencies and organizations to revise it. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So to start with, um, the mission of the Pennsylvania Game Commission is to manage Pennsylvania's wild birds, wild mammals, and their habitats for current and future generations. It is our responsibility as the Game Commission to acknowledge CWD as a serious threat to Pennsylvania's deer and elk populations, as well as to take appropriate actions to mitigate the effects of this disease. The management strategies proposed in this response plan are intended for the long-term benefit and preservation of Pennsylvania's cervid population. We recognize the challenges that the public and other stakeholders will face in having to endure the changes associated with these actions. However, CWD does pose a serious threat not only to deer and elk, but also to the hunting culture of Pennsylvania. Therefore, it is our duty to take the steps necessary to effectively manage this disease. And with this responsibility in mind, the Pennsylvania Chronic Wasting Disease Response Plan was developed. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the areas of Pennsylvania where management actions will take place and the management strategies that will occur in those areas. Um, however, the response plan does also include detailed information on stakeholder and partner engagement, a disease overview, um, disease implications in terms of human health, livestock and agriculture industries, impacts to deer and elk populations, and impacts to hunting and wildlife conservation. We also discuss CWD management in other states and how other states' experiences have played a role in the development of this plan. An overview of the history of CWD in Pennsylvania is also provided, along with the lessons we have learned along the way. Given that the disease has continued to spread throughout the state since the initial detection in 2012, and the number of deer that test positive for CWD has increased each year, current management efforts are not sufficient to control CWD. If the trajectory of the disease increases in Pennsylvania, as it has in other states, the sample prevalence in portions of Blair, Bedford, and Fulton counties will likely exceed 30% in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and, if the, and the potential for CWD to spread throughout the Commonwealth will also rise. Currently, the only way to effectively manage CWD is by reducing free-ranging deer abundance in affected areas. The concept behind reducing deer abundance is to limit deer interaction, which reduces transmission of the disease or social distancing, as many of us now know it. The Pennsylvania CWD response plan we're presenting here today details the management strategies necessary to accomplish that goal. So there are two main goals described in the response plan. The first is to minimize the impacts of CWD on Pennsylvania deer and elk populations. 
This will be accomplished by preventing human-caused introductions of CWD into free-ranging cervids outside of established disease management areas, along with early detection of new CWD infections, limiting sample prevalence to 1% or less in adult deer while meeting surveillance goals within enhanced surveillance units, and limiting sample prevalence to 5% or less in hunter-harvested deer within established areas. These objectives will be met through management strategies such as implementing bans on the movement of high-risk parts, feeding of free-ranging deer, and the use of deer attractants, along with refining surveillance methods, increasing hunter harvest, and implementing targeted removal. Our second goal is to increase stakeholder understanding of, support for, and participation in CWD management efforts. This will be accomplished through the development of a CWD communication plan, along with an assessment of stakeholder values and opinions on wildlife and CWD management. Strategies that will be used to meet these objectives include conducting human dimension studies, surveys, and focus groups, and implementing outreach marketing campaigns. So in the response plan, we have designated geographic areas that follow the Game Commission's response to an initial CWD detection from large areas of thousands of square miles, such as a disease management area, to areas as small as several square miles, such as containment zones. So starting at the largest scale, we have disease management areas. A disease management area is created when new CWD detections are found in either free-ranging or captive deer, regardless of proximity to any previous detection. To designate a disease management area, a 10-mile radius buffer is created around each new detection. If a new detection is in close proximity to an existing DMA boundary, either within or just outside the boundary, that existing DMA's boundary could expand to encompass this latest detection. Otherwise, an entirely new DMA may be created. If a new detection is found within the existing DMA and this buffer falls entirely or mostly within the existing DMA, then no change to the boundary will occur. The actual distance of a DMA boundary to a detection will vary because we try to use easily identifiable features such as roads and rivers for our boundary. This 10 mile radius buffer was used as the standard because this area encompasses the dispersal distances of 95% of deer in Pennsylvania and therefore includes the area where a positive deer may have been spreading prey on. So the purpose of a disease management area is to reduce human-related activities that amplify and spread CWD and to increase the probability of early detection of CWD spread from known locations. Strategies to prevent amplification of CWD within a DMA include prohibiting feeding of deer and the use of deer attractants, as well as reducing deer abundance. Strategies to prevent spread of CWD beyond DMA boundaries include restrictions on transporting high-risk parts. Strategies to detect CWD spread early involve increasing CWD sampling. So next we have our established areas which um, an established area is characterized by CWD detections that occur contiguously across a large area and consistently from year to year. In an established area, CWD is considered to be established within the deer population and environmental contamination is likely to perpetuate the infection and can also pose a long-term threat to neighboring areas. Currently, there's only one established area in Pennsylvania, which includes all of Wildlife Management Unit 4A and a portion of 2C. And as you can see from this map, the vast majority of our positives are located within this area. So 
the purpose of an established area is to maintain CWD prevalence in hunter harvested deer at or below 5% and to minimize the risk of human caused movement of high risk parts to other areas. A 5% threshold was chosen because states like Wisconsin and West Virginia and Colorado have data that show once this threshold is crossed, disease prevalence accelerates drastically, making management of the disease even more difficult. Keeping sample prevalence below this threshold will not only prevent the infection rate from rapidly increasing, but would also minimize the need to implement additional more aggressive management actions. To maintain sample prevalence at or below 5%, Reducing deer abundance will be the primary management strategy to occur in this area. This will be done through increased hunter harvest, which will also serve to reduce the potential for disease transmission and to remove additional positive deer from the landscape. In addition, due to the degree of infection in this area, transporting of high-risk parts outside of the established area will be prohibited to minimize human-caused introductions of CWD into other areas. Next, we have enhanced surveillance units. So an enhanced surveillance unit is an individual area within disease management areas that are created when there's a new CWD detection in a free ranging or captive cervid that is greater than 10 miles from any other past CWD detection. An enhanced surveillance unit is created by using approximately three to five mile radius buffer around this new isolated detection, which is equivalent to approximately 28 to 78 square miles. Each enhanced surveillance unit will have an associated DMAP unit, and the boundaries will again be delineated by using easily identifiable features such as roads or rivers. So the exact size of the enhanced surveillance units will vary. This buffer radius was chosen to balance the need to focus surveillance efforts in the area where a CWD infected deer was likely to have traveled and still be able to collect enough samples to meet the target sample size. In these new areas, the extent and sample prevalence of CWD are unknown. So the purpose of these enhanced surveillance units is to determine the extent and sample prevalence of the CWD infection through increased sampling. This will be achieved through increased hunter harvest as well as targeted removal. The target sample size will be approximately 250 to 300 deer in order to provide 95% confidence that the disease will be detected if it occurs in at least 1% of the population within the enhanced surveillance unit. At our smallest scale, we have containment zones. So containment zones are smaller areas within enhanced surveillance units, which consist of an approximately one mile radius buffer around the location of a new CWD detection. This area represents the best option to suppress the impact of an individual or an initial CWD detection. The size is based off of a deer's average home range and includes the individuals it was most likely to come in contact with and potentially infect. So the purpose here is to prevent the establishment and spread of CWD by removing the most high-risk deer from the area immediately surrounding a CWD detection. Management strategies that will be considered and these areas include increased hunter harvest and targeted removals to ensure that the deer most likely to have come in contact with the positive detection are removed. In the event that resources to implement targeted removals in all of the containment zones are insufficient, a structured decision-making model will be used to prioritize which areas will receive treatment. Given the small scale of these areas, Communication and outreach to landowners will also be a significant part of this process. Now I'll talk about um, each of our management strategies that will occur within the management areas that I just described. 
it is currently unlawful to remove or export high-risk cervid parts from the disease management area. It is also unlawful to import these parts from CWD positive states and provinces. This ban was put into place to prevent human-caused introductions of CWD into uninfected areas. Within disease management areas, it is also illegal to feed free-ranging deer. This activity causes the unnatural congregation of animals, which can amplify both direct and indirect transmission of the disease. The use of natural urine-based deer attractants is also prohibited within DMAs, along with all other CWD management areas. This is because there's currently no live test for CWD and therefore no way to determine if the attractant contains infectious prions. These lures can also cause the unnatural congregation of deer, which can again lead to increasing transmission. As I mentioned previously, the only management strategy that has shown success in the control of CWD is the reduction of deer abundance in infected areas. The best methods to achieve this involve increasing hunter harvest and implementing targeted removal. Increased hunter harvest can be accomplished through a variety of actions. So first, increased allocations of antlerless tags. Since the vast majority of the deer population in Pennsylvania is made up of antlerless deer, this action can effectively reduce deer abundance. This can be done at a larger scale, such as a wildlife management unit, to control a larger infection, such as in the established area. Or it can be conducted at a smaller scale, such as an enhanced surveillance unit where hunters can use DMS. Another option is implementing concurrent firearm season, which would allow hunting of both antlered and antlerless deer. Concurrent seasons already occur in several wildlife management units in Pennsylvania. Expanding this to include wildlife management units affected by CWD would not only simplify deer hunting regulations, but would also provide greater opportunities for deer hunters and provide a more consistent antlerless harvest. Another way to increase hunter harvest is through additional or extended seasons. There is flexibility in how this strategy can be implemented. For example, um, during existing seasons, such as all hunters being able to hunt during October antlerless firearm season. Or we could have a season extension involving a firearm season in January. But the option to modify hunting seasons could be applied at all levels of response all the way from a disease management area down to a containment zone. Removing antler point restrictions would also provide hunters with additional harvest opportunities. However, since at least 70% of Pennsylvania's deer population is considered antlerless, this strategy will likely occur in conjunction with other population reduction efforts and in smaller scale areas. For example, um, if targeted removals are going to be used post hunting season in a containment zone, the antler point restrictions could be eliminated to give hunters as much opportunity to harvest deer as possible prior to those removals. In terms of targeted removals, these are small scale operations that will be carried out by USDA Wildlife Services and will only occur post hunting season. They are most likely to be used in containment zones as the purpose of these areas is to quickly remove deer that may have been exposed to a CWD infected individual. They may also be used in enhanced surveillance units in certain circumstances, for example, in more urban areas where hunting may not be practical. Given the current size of our DMAs and the established area, targeted removals would be less effective at that scale and like, will not likely occur in these areas. However, if smaller established areas are created in the future, um, targeted removals may be implemented to achieve clearly defined objectives. And these efforts will also be heavily dependent on landowner participation as removals will only occur on properties where access has been permitted. 
We have also developed a strategy for responding to CWD if it is detected in the elk management area. These strategies differ slightly than those that I just previously described because elk exhibit different social behaviors and have farther dispersal distances than white-tailed deer. So as you can see, the elk management area borders DMA3, and there are several positive detections relatively close to this boundary. So it is a great concern that CWD will make its way into this portion of the state. If CWD is found within any elk hunt zone portion of the elk management area, all of the elk hunt zones will be combined into a single DMA and will remain separate from any other DMA. The reasoning for this is to prevent the movement of high-risk parts into the elk hunt zones and to better encapsulate elk dispersal systems. Surveillance will also increase within this new DMA to determine geographic spread and sample prevalence in the area, as well as to detect any new infections early. Hunting opportunities will also increase for both deer and elk in this area. For elk, there will be an increase in tag allotment. For deer, management strategies will follow those described for the enhanced surveillance units and containment zone. If CWD is detected in the elk management area, but outside of the elk hunt zones, management strategies will also be similar to those previously described. One important note is that regardless of the location of a CWD detection in the elk management area, elk will not be taken through targeted removals. This is because there is enough demand for elk tags that we expect to achieve management objectives through hunter harvest alone. Our surveillance efforts are essential in detecting new cases of CWD and tracking the spread and sample prevalence of the disease. We collect samples through a variety of methods, including hunter harvest from voluntary samples from head collection bins, which are only located within disease management area, as well as statewide hunter harvest samples collected from meat processors. Contractors are also employed to collect roadkill deer from state and local roads within and around the perimeter of disease management areas. These samples often serve as the first indication that the disease is expanding into new areas. Clinical suspects or individuals exhibiting the physical signs of the disease are also collected statewide. These individuals can provide valuable information regarding new detections in presently undetected areas. In addition, nearly all hunter harvested elk are tested for CWD, as well as roadkill and clinical suspect elk. To date, no elk has tested positive and no deer from within the elk management area have tested positive for CWD. As you can see from this table, we have a total of over 450 CWD positive free ranging deer since the initial detections in 2012. We have increased our sampling efforts over that time as well, and have tested approximately 95,000 deer and 1,300 elk. CWD surveillance is very complex, so one of our objectives for 2020 is to thoroughly evaluate the efficiency of our current surveillance methods. Another important component to CWD management is communication and outreach. In order to be successful, support for CWD management activities is critical. To accomplish this, we ensured public input played a role in the development of this plan through public comment, surveys, and focus groups. The CWD communications plan for 2020 has also been developed to guide Game Commission efforts in addressing stakeholder concerns and fostering partnerships. Outreach and marketing efforts will also occur across multiple platforms, including the Game Commission website, as well as other traditional and social media outlets. This final response plan is also open for a 30-day public comment period to provide the public the opportunity to review the plan prior to it receiving final approval and being implemented. 
CWD is a serious threat to Pennsylvania's deer and elk populations. Without change in additional actions, CWD will continue to increase and spread across the Commonwealth. For management strategies to be effective, we must be prepared for a sustained long-term commitment of resources. In addition, for Pennsylvania to really be successful in management of CWD, it will require continued support and participation from all stakeholders. It is our duty to continue to review the latest scientific knowledge and management techniques to determine the most up-to-date and effective disease management strategies for Pennsylvania. This adaptive management approach is critical to being successful in managing CWD. And the Game Commission will strive to continuously improve our response to CWD in order to fulfill our agency's mission to manage and protect Pennsylvania's deer and elk current and future generations. So thank you. Um, and Matthew, I can turn it back over to you. Okay, great. great. Thanks, Andrea. So if uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is call all the commissioners uh, to unmute their microphones or any of the senior staff as well. Our, our agency is run by a group of, of individuals that are bureau directors and region directors, and then of course the executive office, and, and as well as the commissioners. And if any of those folks throughout today have had any uh, questions or had any questions jotted down while they were listening to the presentations, I would ask that, that we take this time to ask all of our speakers uh, to provide a little bit more detail and um, information about that that we could dig in deeper that may be helpful to not only our knowledge but also the general public, uh, the media, and, and so on that's also listening in today. So I'll turn it over to any of, the, uh, any of those folks that have any questions and uh, we'll, we'll kind of see where this goes and, uh, um, and, and see how we can manage this. So, I'll ask, um, I'll ask you to just kind of use some patience, and, and if you hear somebody talking, just, just be patient, and, and we can uh, try to work through each one of these questions individually. So with that, I'll take the, uh, the first question. If you'll just say who the question's for, or if it's all, um, if it is all the, the folks that's on the, uh, the panel today, you can, you can reference all of them. But um, okay, so with that, I'll turn it over. Dr. Schnoop. Yes, sir. Hey, this is Jason Dikoski. I have a question for Lisa Murphy. Okay, great. As, uh, as, C as CWD samples will likely continue to increase, what is the Wildlife Futures Program going to do to decrease the turnaround time for CWD samples? Jason, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Excellent, great. Now, thank you for the question. And actually, even as we were already into the first season of, of testing, we, we sort of knew that it, there'd be a bit of a learning curve there. And we're fortunate that the staff we have in place is really forward thinking. So now that we're um, in that lull, finishing up this year's testing season and looking forward to next, and like many of us have maybe a little bit more time to think about things, um, I, I'd be happy to tell you some of the different things we're looking at. I think. One of the things that we can do is certainly look at increasing the number of personnel, um, but probably the more important thing that we can do is what we can do in terms of our facilities and our instruments and equipment and, and other resources. So um, we're looking at in our existing facilities in terms of what we can do to expand um, and actually increase our throughput in terms of the number of samples processed. So we found that one of the sort of the rate limiting steps is actually handling um, the initial sample, doing the, trim, the trimming and the subsampling. So being able to actually double that capacity by expanding our current facilities is something that we're actively working on with our facilities personnel here at New Bolton Center. And then the other thing too is then what we can do to increase the number of instruments um, that can increase the number of tests, but also give the capacity to, to work Harder, harder and work, you know, smarter um, and be able to do more with that. So there's lots of different ways that we can address it. Um, and we are putting some things in place, even with many of the slowdowns and shutdowns to make sure that we have the right resources and facilities in place well in advance of next hunting season. Thank you. Nope, you're welcome. I hope that helps. 
Okay, we'll take the, uh, the next question. If you don't mind, if you're not asking a question or answering a question, just put your phone on mute so that we don't have uh, any unnecessary feedback. Uh, so with that, I'll take a, a second question if we have one. Matthew, this is Brian Burhan. So I have a question for Jasmine Batten. Matthew, can you hear me? Yep, I got you. Go ahead. Uh, Jasmine, are you oh. there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, um, there you go. Great, great presentation, Jasmine. I noticed on you talked about uh, what changed when you took away antler point restrictions. And one thing I noticed was a small, looked like it, yeah, it could have been wrong, but maybe a small decrease in, in doe harvest uh with the doing away with aprs is there any concern that reduction in doe harvest will impact your ability to uh keep the deer herd from growing um sorry i just had to make sure i was unmuted still uh so your question was if we're concerned about decrease in in doe harvest was correct yeah i think maybe there yeah. was some misunder Listeners. Sorry, my computer my computer froze. Okay, are, are you guys still there? Yep. Yeah, no, I mean based on what we also have done, um, we're not we're not concerned at that bigger at that bigger scale right now with what we're seeing with our population trends. I mean, and the thing is it's very different in different parts of our state. One of our unique challenges is the fact that we're working in um, so many different regions in our state. So right now with what we're seeing with our population trends, we're not we're not having a concern with that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, do we have another one? Yeah, Matthew, Tim Layton. So we, we talked about, <clears throat> somebody had talked about targeted removal and, and how effective it was. Um, so I guess my question is, how important is targeted removal in the program and how do you conduct your targeted removal operations? And that would be to any of the panelists. Okay, great. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll just hand that off to the panelists. And um, I guess what we're looking for, uh, Tim, if I understand your, your question correctly, is how, you know, really how important is your targeted removal to, to the overall success of that as compared to large scale um, uh, population decreases. So I can hand that right, off. Right, because I, I, I think when Brian, I think when Brian was talking, he talked about um, that the percentage of positives in targeted removal was much higher than that of non-targeted animals. So if he could just touch on that, I, I think I'd like to hear it. Yeah, okay, great. So speakers, if you don't mind, you can answer that individually of, of, of how many more positives you are getting out of targeted removal, i.e. how much more successful they are, and, and it, just be patient, and then you guys can work through it uh, individually on, on your response. Matthew, this is Paul Sheldon. Hi, Paul. Can, the, uh, I'd just like to touch on that. You know, I, I, I showed how much more effective uh, that in, in the very first year of our sampling that, that sharpshooters removed positives at a rate of about three and a quarter times what hunters were. And, and that's simply, you know, that's simply because of the targeted nature of the removals. But, you know, one of the things, we did a lot of things with our hunting regulations. We opened up more days to hunting. We, we pretty much did away with our quotas. Permits were virtually unlimited. While during the regular seasons, you could harvest two antler deer, but, but when we moved into the special CWD management season, you could, you, you could take additional deer. The, 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 quote, the limit at that time was lifted. And our archery season was already such that, that there was no bag there was no bag limit in effect as far as the number of deer that you could take with a hundred and some day season. So we, we, we moved to a system where we had very, very liberal harvest regulations, but, it, but if you graph out the, the years of harvest before and after those CWD regulations went into a, effect, I would, I would challenge you to find where we had done it if you didn't know, because harvest did not respond accordingly. And so, because of that, these targeted removals are are the backbone. They, they're accomplishing the majority of the reduction work. Now, 
Now, during the regular seasons, our, our hunters are taking enough deer to help us control the, the overall countywide populations at respectable levels. But as far as bringing them down to levels where we actually have an impact on disease, the only place that's really being accomplished is, is in those much smaller removal areas. And, and the bleed over from that, the positive effects that we're having by by having those targeted removals on 2% or less of our landscape is, is, what's, is what's keeping our prevalence rates low. Uh, you you kind of have two conflicting things at work is that, is that our prevalence rates are seeing, you know, a, somewhat of, a, a, of an upward climb in those areas that, are, that, that have much lower prevalence or, or virtually no prevalence to begin with, whereas that's counteracted by what we've accomplished in those areas where we're removing a substantial number of deer with targeted culling. And just to give you an example, in, the, in our original three CWD counties, whereas in the first year targeted removals took five positives and, and hunter, hunter harvest took six, now after, after 18 years of working in those counties and, and the thousands of hunter harvested deer that have been taken, uh, there, and the, and the hundreds of overall positives just from those three counties, there's still only like a 30 deer difference in the number of positives that's been removed between hunter harvest and sharpshooting, even though hunter harvest figures are substantially higher than, than our sharpshooting. That's it. And, and Paul, again, this is Tim Layton. And just to be clear, because I, I originally thought that was Brian Richards who had talked about targeted removal, but this is what's being done in Illinois right now. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. So I, I want to give you credit for where you come from and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Paul, this is, this Thanks, is Commissioner Paul. Fredericks. Paul, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, this is Denny Fredericks. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, is your entire state shotgun only? Uh, we have no rifle hunting, if that's what you're talking about. We have, right. we have right. our fi our firearm season allows the use of of shotguns, muzzle loaders, and handguns, and there and and there is a special muzzle loader season, which of course is muzzle loader only. But but our regular firearm seasons and and our CWD hunting seasons allow shotguns, muzzle loaders, or handguns. So when you do your targeted shooting. What 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 is used? What implement is used? Rifles. Ah, okay. And landowners, um, people don't have a problem with that. We have very specific rules and guidelines in place. There is a there is a safety plan and a booklet that accompanies it for every site that we have, uh, and and we set up. A specific bait location, a specific shooting location, all it, any areas of concern or, or potential safety problems are shown in there. I mean, we we have sites where where your field of fire may only be less than 15 feet at the bait site, and so we we have uh, rules in place that it. Uh, that kind of take care of the problems that we see at, at any of our sites. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, down in Southern Illinois, <clears throat> um, I believe adjacent to a Pyramid State Park, there was a, a big parcel of land that I think was transferred to the state, um, that bur the Burning Star property. It, yes, sir, Burning Star 5. Yeah. The deer density in that property, when it was handed to you, was extremely high. Yes. And did you not detect any CWD in that area? No, that is very far removed from our CWD area. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would be hundreds of miles. Actually, the closest CWD positive to that site would be in uh, in southeast Missouri, just across the river. Right. Well, again, as Commissioner Layton said, um, congratulations to you guys. You've done a really good job. Keep it in check. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Yes, sir. This, this is Mike Lou or Jasmine. 
Yes, I'm here. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, yeah, this is Mike Metric. I have a question uh, for Lou Cornicelli from Minnesota. Uh, Lou, you mentioned that you put out dumpsters to drop off uh, carcasses. Uh, I'm very much opposed to uh, people leaving their carcasses on the landscape. And uh, I was just wondering uh, if you could comment on how successful that is and, or has been. And uh, if you just do it in de disease management areas or do you do it uh, uh, all over the state? Yeah, that's a good question. So it um, it actually came together at the last minute. Uh, we have a statewide contract with a company called Waste Management, who you've probably heard of. And being a state agency, we had to go through the state vendor. And they backed out about a week before deer season started because they didn't want to haul carcasses. Um, so we ended up scrambling working with local haulers. And um, uh, and it ended up working out. I think we had about 25 dumpsters in our CWD zone in the southeast, basically trying to set up a system where nobody had to drive more than 15 or 20 miles tops in order to find a dumpster. In much case, many cases, it was less than that. Um, but it was really popular. I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the the tons of waste that were that were generated. So um, we only did it in our CWD zones, one in the north central part of the state, um, then in the southeast. In the north central part of the state, we have a, a really good relationship with the local landfill that actually took our, our old incinerator and was taking waste um, to incinerate. So there's definitely interest in um, expanding the program but it cost us a couple hundred thousand dollars to run it this year and you know we're not waste haulers we're trying to mitigate disease so i don't see us expanding it beyond where we're where we're uh, managing uh, cwd but it was it was very very popular did i answer your question it, it did thank you very much matthew it's uh denny fredericks okay go ahead denny any, this, this question is for you or what, while we have all the experts from across the country assembled, if anybody knows anything about this, you know, we're talking about the use of canines and their ability to de detect VOCs. To anybody's knowledge, is there any kind of portable um, scientific instrumentation that's capable of detecting those v same VOCs like they do in the lab? Yeah, actually, well, I'm going to uh, let Lisa carry that question because she has, they've looked into that, um, oh. and and I'm I'm glad you brought up the dogs and and the the neat work that they're able to do to really get around uh, the ultimate goal of these dogs again is to have uh, and to your point a surgical response so the ability to identify it without having to kill that animal and go out and and and, and test it and so um, Lisa if you don't mind maybe you could talk a little bit about the uh, the electronic nose. Yeah, no, not at all. And it's actually a, a great question because it sort of shows you where these ideas um, start and how you get from that proof of concept to you finally get, you know, what's the final goal with something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, basically what you do with the proof of concept in terms of using those dogs is they're exquisitely sensitive and specific for what they can detect. And, you know, the thing, you know, whether it's disease or really anything that comes from nature, it, it tends to be, you know, these complex mixtures, whether it's volatile organic compounds or other components. So the place to start is to take something like a dog that we know can reliably and sensitively detect positive versus negative. And, and that's actually a really important point um, that I talked about a little bit this morning is not only is it important that the dogs can reliably detect a positive chronic wasting disease sample, but it's at least as, as important, if not even more important, that they can reliably detect or really sort of, you know, say that something is also negative. So what you can do with many compounds is if you can have the dog um, be sort of a, the gold standard in terms of that positive or negative, is then you can take that into the laboratory setting and really drill down looking at those known positives and known negative samples, what the dogs are alerting on is to figure out what is that unique component. And then you can use that knowledge to design those electronic noses. So the kinds of things that you know hazmat technicians take out into the field now to detect various hazardous substances, 
you know, that would be, you know, really the, the long term ultimate goal of a project just like this one. I hope that helps. It helped very, very much. So are, are the powers to be moving in that direction? Are we, is that the path that we're trying to go down? It's a it's a long road to get there, but but you bet it is. And and like I said, you know, there's there's some precedents for this in terms of you know where you can start with a dog and where you can work towards. So, you know, one of the great things about this partnership with Penn Vet and the Working Dog Center being a component of that is they also work with Manel Chemical Census Center, which is also co-located on the main Penn campus. And and this is really you know what they do is what is unique and specific about a scent and then actually going ahead and, and converting that over um, to other types of technologies that can be more readily deployed out into the field. I mean, you know, some of us maybe would it'd be great. We could have a, you know, a, a dog in every, every region, and I think there's probably still a place for that. Um, but again, there's so many, you know, only so many of these highly trained dogs out there. So again, sort of a, that, that electronic sniffer, I think, is the ultimate goal, and, and do we have the experience and the resources um, already in place to go there. Yes. Do you have a Do you have an estimated timeline, or does anybody have an estimated timeline as to? You know, I are... no, I I really don't, and I'll be truthful with you. That's starting to get out, outside of my direct area of expertise. But as an example, um, you know, these dogs do work really, really quickly. So Dr. Cindy Otto, who is the director of the the Working Dog Center just recently completed um, a program for USDA for plant protection and quarantine with the dogs being able to detect um, overwintered egg masses for spotted lanternflies. So the invasive species that I'm sure many of you have had the pleasure of squishing those lovely red and black little nuisances. Um, and that was something that she actually from start to finish um, to the point of actually submitting a, a, a scientific publication um, you know, it was less than a year. So, you know, having seen these dogs work and, and certainly as an open invitation, you know, if you, if we ever have the opportunity to, to show these dogs in action, um, it, it is amazing in terms of introducing them to something new and novel and having them very quickly master it. So for at least that first phase, we can get through it very quickly and have that pilot completed and actually have the dog ready to deploy um, but but again, in terms of that next stage, I, I I really can't comment more specifically on it, other than to say, you know, that certainly the the technology and and the path to get there already exists. So when when you get beyond when you get beyond the dogs, then what do you do? Contract with um, an instrumentation okay. company like oh. Fisher Scientific to develop the the, the nose. Yeah, so as so I'm and I'm sorry, maybe I kind of misunderstood the question a little bit. So I can speak to that a little bit um more. Again, I, I, I don't think I can give you is this a one year, three year, five year, you know, kind of thing start to finish. But um in our toxicology laboratory, right? So we're looking for different toxic substances. And so as you can imagine, um with a scent or with any kind of substance, um, particularly ones in this case that are putting off, you know, volatile organic compounds is it's it's going to be a unique fingerprint, right? And that some things are actually complex mixtures. So once the dogs um, are showing us, you know, what is positive, what is negative, that type of those types of samples, the positive and the negative, can then be subjected to more complex chemical analyses. And the instruments that are needed for that already exist within PenVet and also larger PEN. Terrific. If you don't mind, one more question. Um, yeah, no. We're we're getting, you know, what what we hear from our folks here is um, the results that we're getting on testing is positive or undetectable. Uh -huh. And throughout these conversations today, I heard a lot of use of the word. So, where are we? I mean, when we when we test something, is it do we get negative results? Yeah, and and. You know, some of that, and, and again, to kind of get back to the, I can sort of bring that around back to the dogs, is some of that is actually just, um, some of it is just sort of semantics and convention a little bit, right? Because, you know, the ideal test is 100% right all the time, that a, that a positive, when you get a positive, that it absolutely, you know, if you have 100 samples submitted and the perfect test 
um, would detect all of the positives 100% of the time, and it would detect all of the negatives 100% of the time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But the reality is, is that that perfect doesn't doesn't exist, right? So you want the test for the best technology available to do the best job um, in both of those things. Is is your positive really positive, and is your negative really negative? Understanding that in the in the real world, there's some margin for error. The thing about the dogs, though, and and not to make light of it, but you know the the dogs have to be um, essentially perfect at their job. You you don't want the bomb dog that's only right 75% of the time, right? Um, so <laughs> so a, again, you know, could the dogs be a path to getting closer to that um, more black and white yes or no answer on a CWD? positive or negative for a given sample, I, I think that's possible. Um, the reality is, and I think, you know, so there are other experts on this call that I think can speak to this better, but, you know, with chronic wasting disease, particularly because it takes such a long time, you know, from, you know, first exposure and then infection and then, you know, becoming ill and showing clinical signs, you know, I think there's a, there's sort of a, a lot of things happening along the way and depending on the types of tests, what it's testing for, and how sensitive it is, um, you know, are they 100% perfect in every way? No, probably not. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're very welcome. If anybody, Jenny, I just want to add in. Good. <laughs> thank you, uh, Lisa. I just want to add into Danny. This is one of the many things we're looking at, and and it, it's it should be considered a tool if it does work, and we're we're at the very early stages of it, but we're really excited to have Lisa and the whole PedVet team be showing up to the table with different ideas and and excited about trying new things, and this is obviously one of them. But it it would be a it would be a tool that we need to ultimately apply the management plan, which is a more surgical targeted approach to removing CWD deer from the landscape, and that's that's really the goal. Whether it's this or RT quick or new testing, we, we we've got to work on better ways to identify this um, without having to kill the deer uh, to to test it for it on yeah, the landscape, yeah. and, and that's I, that's ultimately what we're after. I may I may be overreacting to to the possibility of, of both the dogs and the electronic noses, but I see that as huge helping us manage the disease and the effect that, that you know, a, a revised plan with those tools in action can have on um, sure. our relationship sure. with the general public and the hunting public. I mean, I, right. maybe right. I'm reading as, it. As, it's huge. At, no, and as Andrea said, Andrea said that we, will, we, we have to be up on the most useful tools available to us. And if so, if this tool looks like it could become available and be useful, we would certainly revise the plan and incorporate it. Um, sure. But as with most things, we, we have to take with what we have right now. Yeah, sure. this, is, this is Lou from Minnesota. I'll echo that. I think, you know, we're always looking for the, the next best tool, but we can't um, ignore the tools we have in front of us while we wait for the better thing to come along. So I think that's an, that's an important point. Um, you know, use, use the best you have until something better comes along. Don't wait for the better. Right. All right. We're certainly glad somebody's looking into the better, that's for sure. Um, what does, uh, we could take a next question. I know we had had a chance to hear from Paul on the target removal. I don't want to swing it back to that if it's not necessary, but I know that uh, target removal uh, for Kristen in New York, as well as Jasmine and um, I, I guess uh, most immediately those two. I, I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that or if you felt like uh, it was pretty well covered. We can move on to the next question, but I did want to give you an opportunity to provide input. Sure, this is Jasmine in Missouri. Um, I would say that I can't remember exactly all the things that were asked about it, but our our experience here in Missouri has been very similar to Paul. Um, you know, where we're we're looking at this from from several different scales. We're at the countywide scale. We're really not looking at big population depressions, especially here in Missouri right now, where the counties where we have CWD, that area where the disease is found is is relatively limited. And so with our culling efforts, um, we are seeing the same thing where the ability to really pinpoint and be in those locations where the deer are most likely to be infected and to put the greatest effort in um, is yielding a much higher percent of those 
particular deer being positive. So, um, you know, since we've been doing this in 2012, our targeted removal samples account for maybe 5% of our total samples, uh, but, but they've been about 42% of our positive. Okay, great. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, Kristen, if you don't have anything to add to that, we can move on to the next question. I was just going to mention quickly that I think it's important that, um, you know, my point that I was trying to get across was that we moved to targeted removals in a known positive area very quickly, and that allowed us to get deer off the landscape to stop that transmission. And so having one positive uh, fawn that was likely released that might have infected a second deer just in the period of about six months since that fawn was released in the fall and then um, the deer were shot in the spring. If we had sat around and waited until fall and then after hunting season, we probably would have had a lot more transmission. We would have had a lot more deer shedding prions on the landscape and might have had more issues with environmental contamination. So I think that's where we get to the point of targeted removal and trying to do that quickly because it has multiple functions of removing deer from the landscape and lowering the deer density, which would decrease the number of transmission events. So it's a really important tool that we have right now that we should be employing. Um, and I can't remember exactly if Brian Richards mentioned this. Um, he did talk about how they took out an entire reindeer herd in Norway, but there's a paper that's been published on that showing the effectiveness of the sharpshooting compared with the hunters. Even if the hunters were told where the reindeer were and given rides to them uh, to get out to the reindeer, the sharpshooting was way more cost effective. So just something to keep in mind. This is Lou. Yeah, for target culling, we do a lot of the same thing. We constrain it around areas where we have multiple positives. It, you know, and it's expensive and we have to use the tool, you know, wisely. So we, we really focus on areas where there's positives, usually within a section of those, of, of those multiple positives. And as Kristen and others have said, you know, the Janelle paper, um, was it 2014 talking about removing entire social groups if you can and eliminate that note of positives. So we work real hard from that perspective. But like I said, it is really expensive. Okay, great. So um, we can uh, leave that target removal topic. Thank you for your input on that. Uh, I'd like to hear the next question, please. This is Kristen Schnepp Geiger. The question I'd like to throw out um, to any of the panelists that presented today. It was interesting hearing from different states and how they're dealing um, with CWD in their respective areas. Um, so here in Pennsylvania, Last year, Pennsylvania hunters harvested almost 400,000 white-tailed deer. So I'm wondering how that harvest um, and corresponding population compares with some of these other states and wondering um, if that kind of harvest number would change their approach uh, if they had that many deer or if that's something that they've faced in their states as well. I guess it's hard to know when to jump in, but this is Jasmine in Missouri. Um, our annual deer harvest here is somewhere averaging around 280,000 deer a year for comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think it, having a, a, a higher harvest than that wouldn't change our approach that, that we're doing. But again, we're doing the aggressive surveillance management already. Minnesota, we kill a couple hundred thousand deer a year. Illinois. I, I think from our perspective here in Illinois, we we harvest oh in the neighborhood of 150,000 deer a year, and I don't think it's so much a a matter of your overall deer population, but 
but whether you have the surveillance data that allows you to pinpoint those areas that are higher prevalence, higher risk than others so that you can seek them out. If you, if you have that level of data, then, then I don't think it's so much a matter of, of what your overall population size is. You can still have a differential impact by using targeted culling. So would you target more of your surveillance in those areas that are known CWD spots as opposed to statewide to try to detect new infestations? Well, you, you have to find a balance given, given the amount of money that you have. You know, here in Illinois, about two thirds of our overall surveillance is directed at at and directly adjacent to our CWD areas, and only one third is is it the downstate. Would would we like to have better coverage downstate? Well, well, certainly we would, but but you know, as with all other activities, we have to prioritize how we can get the most bang for our buck, and and this is what you know we've we've settled upon. Christian, can you talk about York? getting. Go ahead, Kristen, I'm sorry. Well, when, when we talk about getting best bang for our buck, uh, both in, in surveillance and also in public engagement, 800,000 plus licenses sold here in Pennsylvania and we're 80 plus percent privately held uh, land ownership. Um, what are some of the some of the best ways that these other states have engaged private landowners and the public in general? Um, basically, wondering if the results that came in from our CWD public comment period were in line with some of the things that these other states have been doing, or if there's anything maybe that we are missing um, and, and other avenues we can explore to get the message out. Matthew, this is Paul Shelton again. I'll just touch real briefly on that. Uh, we've, we've done a number of surveys and, and look at, at overall support for our agency's programs and in particular for targeted removal. And, and those things hinge so very strongly upon the respondents' perception of risk, whether CWD is a, is a serious risk factor to deer population, whether they believe that CWD might be a human health risk, those things play into it very seriously as well as well as their trust in the department. And so, so I can't overemphasize the the need for for having as many public meetings as you can possibly have and discussing your programs and and conveying your message and 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 explaining why you settled on the things that you have because. And, and, and explaining CWD because let's face it, there's still a lot of CWD deniers out there who just simply do not want to accept that the CWD is a real threat. And so the, the more the more we discuss it and the more in, in a frank and open fashion and, and the more materials we put out there, you know, anytime somebody in our CWD area wants to have a public meeting, we're, we're there, we're gonna go. And uh, that certainly puts a puts a stress on on personnel and that sort of thing. But but we think every minute of it is worthwhile. Can we expand on that a little bit more? Maybe I'd like to hear Nick Minazato on that. Nick, if you're available. Um, I'd like to hear, since you have a perspective from across the nation of, of hunters and, and, and the public engagement and to Kristen, basically Kristen's question about public engagement, are you seeing that trend across the state? What do you, or across the nation for that matter? What do you, what do you see um, uh, as far as that goes? Yeah. And this is really the long game. So the, the first thing we need to be honest with sportsmen about is that we're not looking at any specific end date for whenever we solve this thing. Um, 
that is um, anybody that's saying that it's it's kind of fool's gold. It's telling people what they want to hear. So it's a long game. So there's the approach that that we intend to take or starting to take is that yes, we have to continually educate about this disease because it's information is changing uh, relatively rapidly in in some aspects of it. So we need to be out in front and informing. Um, but we also, I think it's really important that broadly we talk about the importance of this animal. The CWD is part of it, but the, the bigger importance of this animal broadly. And we as a outdoors community haven't done the best job of marketing our wildlife just for the sake of marketing the wildlife. As a hunting community in particular, we've always, our first intuition has always been how quickly do we get a gun or a bow into someone's hands and get them into the woods. While I think that's important, I also think, again, just reiterate that this is a long game. The, the education and information um, is changing all the time, and we have to be out in front of it. Uh, the public meetings that was, someone mentioned, I think, are important that we continue to do those. We don't just feel like, well, we, we did those back in 2019 and we're done now. And I think also someone had referenced the honesty part of it, and I think that's that's another critical part. We can't say more than we actually know, and that goes for uh, sort of good guys and bad guys when it comes to putting out CWD information. So if we stick to saying what we actually know and we're honest in our in our answers to sportsmen, I think that the majority of them will continue to um, come along, and that that we're we're really seeking cultural change here. And um, that is not something that happens in a year or a few years. It's probably something that we will do and measure over the next couple of decades. So it's a long game. I guess that would be the take home. Matthew, Tim Layton, can we just can we stick with Nick for a minute? Yeah. Nick, and you, you, you touched a little bit on on what I wanted to ask you, Nick, but, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there that, that we're faced with. There's a lot of um, um, fake news, I guess, for lack of a better description. How, how do you handle that um, across the United States? Um, and, and what does the NDA recommend that we do to try to combat that situation here in Pennsylvania? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, it, it can be a slippery slope. We don't we don't react to everything we hear because in some cases, if we do, it just it just makes whatever was said uh, stay in the news cycle longer. So we're very selective about that. Uh, but there are some issues if we hear them recurring. If we start hearing people regurgitating some of these things that are out there, so one of them being um, the the whole spiroplasma bacteria example versus prion theory. We've heard that enough now, and it's been regurgitated enough that it's time to educate more on that point. And when I say that, that doesn't mean we're going to come out with a long scientific-based explanation because hunters don't – they're not going to sit there and listen to that for the most part. Uh, so it has to be well done just to simply say, listen, here's, here's what the overwhelming majority of science says and researchers say, and this is why we continue down this path. So that would just be one example. Um, and then there, there have been other examples where, for example, the uh, the issue of um, human health implications, where it's it's definitely safe to say, hey, we follow the the guidance put out by the CDC and uh, don't eat infected deer, get your deer tested. That is a very different message than uh, chances are we're going to start dying from eating CWD positive deer. So we had a case where that had popped up at one point, and we responded and said, "Listen, again, we're not. We can't say more than we actually know. We have to stick to what we do know, and we have to communicate it well." So I guess I guess the the that's a long answer, but the the point is, it just it just depends on the specific situation, and whether or not we think it's it's worth addressing, or if we want to just try to keep it out of the news cycle. Well, and I think you just, I mean. It's kind of what we the approach that we've taken is you, the more you talk about it, the longer it stays out there, the more people fall into it. Um, so I mean, I appreciate your comments. Yep. Okay, great. Um, 
Brian Richards, I've got a note here to, to jump back to you on a prior question. Do you, do, would you mind jumping back in I, I, uh, to, to pick back up? Brian's on his phone, and I think we need to make him a panelist for you to be able to hear him or unmute him. Ah, okay. I wondered why we weren't hearing from Brian. Okay. Um, why don't we try to do that? Um, if you, Travis, if you don't mind, we can try to get him on as a panelist. But we'll move on to the next question, and we'll try to get Brian Richards on so we can we can hear his input. Hey, Matthew, this is Denny Fredericks again. Sure, Danny, go ahead. Um, I guess it's a question for everybody, especially the, um, our other friends at, at the other wildlife agencies. Um, do, you, do you folks or your wildlife agency in particular have jurisdiction over the captive deer in your state? And if you, and if you do not, how do you, how do you go about collaborating with the agency that does? This is Kristen Schuler. I'll um, reiterate what I said for New York that uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets have joint authority over white tailed deer. Only ag has authority over other captive species. So um, our ag department and environmental conservation department worked work very well together on that point and share a lot of information. Illinois, Paul? In Illinois, uh, the Department of Ag and the Department of Natural Resources have joint authority over, over captive white-tailed deer. And so we, we do collaborate with each other. And, and one thing, when, when we were talking about implementing regulations for uh, captive deer movements and importation and that sort of thing, uh, we ended up uh, promulgating rules within the Department of Natural Resources, which were identical to those of AG, to, to simplify enforcement on our end, which I believe is something similar to, to what was done in one of the other states that was mentioned earlier. But but that's how we handle it. Thank you. Anybody else on here from another state? Sure, this is Jasmine in Missouri. Um, so we yes, do sir. have essentially joint joint jurisdiction on our our deer and, and mule deer, their hybrids. Um, so we are currently in the business of permitting those breeders and big game hunting facilities, um, and so issuing the permit and inspecting their fence and that sort of involvement but our Department of Agriculture is responsible for impl implementing the USDA's um, herd certification program. And so we do work very closely. Um, I kind of mentioned in really quickly in my presentation that in Missouri we did have um, a long litigation lawsuit against us when we passed in 2014 some in in enhanced requirements for testing and fencing. Thing. And, and our Supreme Court here, our state Supreme Court, did rule that we have pretty wide sweeping authority over any any wildlife um, species that might be behind a fence. So we we're not really changing our approach right now, but we are working very closely with our Department of Agriculture. As I said, they're still administrating the herd certification program, but our state wildlife veterinarian and their veterinarian are meeting monthly. Um, they've had a, a number of of lean events to kind of make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, you know, we're sharing test results, so so there's a lot of close work happening. So so it sounds to me like at least for the folks that we have online from other states, at the very least you have shared jurisdiction. Um, not Minnesota. Um, in my state, captive servants are classified by statute as livestock. And they're regulated by the Board of Animal Health. Now we have various uh, data sharing agreements and MOUs, and we cooperate on many things. But the regulatory authority falls solely to the board. Okay. 
Okay. Hey, Danny, while we're, while we're on this subject, I'm going to um, chime in to follow up on Dr. Schuler's point about a uh, collaborative task force. And, and for clarification, we do have a collaborative task force between PDA, PGC, USDA. There's a number of folks on that task force. Um, we are asked and, and, and uh, we meet frequently, um, I would say, for, for a task force of CWD. However, we are unique in Pennsylvania where we, I would, by no means are we shared authority of captive. It's very clear that we have uh, the wild herd and PDA has the, um, uh, the high fence facilities. And so it's very separate. And so, but we do try to work together as, as frequently as we can on issues um, through the CWD task force. Uh, I did ask Kevin Brightbill to join in today. He was unable to make it. Um, he did provide a little bit of background on where they're at with their captive facilities and, and so on. And I, I think from a standpoint of, of positive facilities and positive animals, we're, we're pretty high. I, from Kevin's email, they have 207 captive positive deer on 23 different premises in the state. Now, that was uh, a number of those have been indemnified and, and depopulated and so on. But but just based on those numbers and, and based on the areas, you know, you're talking about Adams County, Blair County, Bedford, Cambria, Clearfield, Franklin, Fulton, Jefferson, Lancaster, and Perry County um, all have uh, positive or had or have positive herds. You can see that, that it is a, a pretty broad, um, broad issue. And so I do think that we are unique in that case. And, and again, we are working with PDA as, as often as we can. We, we, we strive to do better off, uh, as often as we can. But that, that's currently the situation uh, for everybody um, on the phone and at home and uh, for their knowledge. Matthew, this is Brian. I have a question for Dr. Shore. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, Dr. Shore, um, you had mentioned, uh, I believe you, uh, when it comes to depopulating positive uh, deer farms, that you were using DEC funds uh, to do that depopulation or the indemnity money. Um, how are you going to handle that moving forward? And second part of my question is, is any idea on average, I realize you don't have any right now, but how long before you can get in and depopulate? In Pennsylvania, we've had herds positive in, in uh, fences for, I guess, well over a year and still have some there now. So just curious how New York's handling that. Well, thank you for the question. Um, right now, it uh, we have in our response plan that if we do get a detection in a captive herd, that we'll go in and ideally depopulate that. The way that it's structured with the federal indemnity money through USDA, there's only um, a million dollars available, and they have sort of a complex algorithm for how that doled out one of the factors being that you have to be a state that has not detected CWD yet. And especially with New York having detected it before, we sometimes fall into this gray area where we're viewed as positive or not positive depending on uh, the person calling the shots. So I honestly don't know whether federal indemnity would be readily available. It also depends on what's happened in that given year. Uh, some of these really, really large herds, um, you know, 300 animals in a herd wipes out the federal indemnity very quickly because the maximum payment allowable for that is $3,000. So I think we would have to take it on a case by case basis, depending on if we detected disease in a very large herd, how that might be covered. One thing that I didn't point out in my presentation is that our state ag agency pays for all the CWD testing behind fences right now. So they send veterinarians out to collect the samples, they pay for it. So they're really um, sort of subsidizing the CWD testing for these owners. That cost is not being passed along to the owners. So we're looking at mechanisms uh, where these businesses aren't necessarily being propped up by state, by taxpayer dollars. And if we detect it again, I think it'll it really just depend. We were lucky before that it was in two relatively small herds. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Um, I think we've got about uh, five, 10 minutes left here. I wanted to give 
unless there's a specific question we could address, I wanted to give the panelists a couple minutes to, to go over anything that, that they could provide that they think we missed today or, or may uh, help uh, better inform our board or our public here, our hunting public and, and um, uh, sportsmen and women in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, is there any more specific questions from the board or senior staff that we could take? Okay, well, with that being said, um, would the speakers like to provide any any more information or any more um, topics that, that you don't feel like we had covered, that you feel like we could cover more or more in depth? Uh, this is Kristen Schuler. I'm just gonna say that, you know, I've been talking about this disease for decades now and the actions that we're proposing seem rather drastic with, you know, targeted removals and whatnot. But given the current situation that we're dealing with with coronavirus, drives home to me the point that we have really just been treating CWD with kid gloves, and we have to take those gloves off and get serious about it if we want to do something about it. And my hat's off to states that have really done that, and you've heard from them today. There's numerous examples of states stepping up to the plate and, and really going after CWD. So, like I mentioned in my presentation, that it's not just Pennsylvania's future that is hanging on your decision today, that we really need to take some serious actions to curtail this disease. And obviously we're living through a pandemic right now and the implications that CWD has um, are also pandemic. So we shouldn't stop short of doing the preventative measures that we can implement today. Great, Kristen, I think that was well well said. Uh, would anybody else like to, to uh, provide some points of clarification or more information similar to Kristen? Matt, Matthew, were you able to unmute uh, Brian Richards? I was, and he, he, he was only able to call in on his phone and wasn't able to do it on, on a, a computer like he had this morning. So Tyler's working on it. I'm not quite sure if we're going to be able to get him in in time. Um, okay. But certainly we can, we can take any notes he has now. Hey, Matthew, Nick Pennesano. Uh, real quick, I just want to say as, as someone who's worked on this all across the country and with different state agencies through different phases of this, uh, I just I want to just commend PGC's leadership in this. Um, you're obviously focused within your borders, but you also, you know, leadership there recognizes that this is a national issue that we have to work together on. And just the comprehensiveness of this, I mean, we've talked about all the different angles. Um, we talked about hunters, we talked about communications, we talked about the science. And so I just would uh, encourage the commission and staff to continue pushing hard in that direction. Leadership's hard, uh, and it's not always just about standing there and, and shouting orders to people. It's about listening and asking, what can I do to address the situation? And I feel like that that's the approach that you have taken here and uh, just say that I'm looking forward to, to continuing to, to help be part of this moving forward. Thanks, Nick. We appreciate your help. Hey, Nick, it's Denny Fredericks. Hey, Denny, how are you? Good, buddy. How are you? Good to hear you. Good to hear you. Thank you very much for your encouraging words and we're going to need all the help we can get from you and your folks, you know that, right? Well, look, looking forward to rolling our sleeves up just like you all are and, and it's getting to work because that's what it is. It's hard work, but we're not going to shy away from it. Thank you for recognizing that. Really appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's... Uh... That's great. We're We're about five minutes early, so I'm not afraid to end five minutes early, but out of all seriousness, I want to thank everybody for their time today. I know this was long. I know nobody likes to sit in their computer chair for this time, amount of time listening to CWD presentations, but I think it's fair to say that it's one of the most important issues that this agency may ever deal with, and I'm glad that we're dealing with it in this way. I think we're being open, honest, and transparent as possible. I think that the motivation and enthusiasm that I personally feel from the success stories that, that other folks have, have already gone through shows that what we're doing now 
um, should be changed. We should be aggressive with how we're managing CWD. And I think that, that we can use you guys as guiding lights. I'm really um, proud and excited of, of the CWD working group that worked within the agency, uh, specifically Chris Rosenberry and Andrea Corman and, and Dr. Andrew DeSalvo have done a fantastic job of developing this. And, and like I always say, the work is not, you know, putting it on paper. The work is getting everybody's input and getting something that people can live with and move forward with that and then, and then reevaluating and changing that. And I think that's where we're at. Um, so I'm sure more to come on all of this. You know, we're going to put this thing back out for a 30-day review period. The board can be, um, provide comment on that as well as the public, and, and we can adjust as needed. And then we're hoping to roll this out in 30 days so that we can start to see some, some real positive benefits that, that we don't have to continue to see uh, our DMAs expand. We've seen every single DMA that we have in this state expand this past year or likely uh, expand. And so that is disheartening. And I think that, that today shows that we're, there are things we can do to, to turn that tide. And, and I, I would like to see this agency do it. And I think that there's a lot of people excited to, to do that as well. So. Um, with that being said, we would take a 15-minute break just to give everybody a little bit of CWD um, lag, and then we're going to pick back up with Ian Gregg, the Division Chief of Wildlife Services, and he's going to go over seasons and bags, and then we're going to pick back up after Ian with Chris Rosenberry, who will go over our antlers and elk allocations, and then finally we'll, we'll uh, finish up with Corn Jag now. Uh, our human dimension specialists and, and talk more about Saturday opener. So um, the panelists, I imagine, will jump off at this point, but I want to thank you again for your time and thank you everybody for who tuned in. And um, we'll pick back up here at uh, 3.15. Okay, folks, well, we're back here after our short break, and now we've got Ian Gregg, the Division Chief of Wildlife Services, and he's going to go over the Seasons and Bags presentation, and then we'll be followed up with Dr. Chris Rosenberry, who will go over our analysts and elk allocations. So, Ian, take it away. Thank you, and just to confirm as we go back to the public that you can still hear me loud and clear? I've got you loud and clear. All right, sounds good. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for your attention to a lot of uh, very good and very important presentations so far today. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. I promise that the next 20 minutes or so is going to be a disease-free zone. Um, on the agenda, this segment is listed as seasons and bags in general, but I'll note at the beginning here that my presentation will be focused uh, narrowly on the migratory game bird season selections, which occur outside of the board's formal voting process. So for the seasons and bag limits for all the resident species, uh, deer, bear, raccoon, turkey, grouse, and so forth, that will be voted on as part of tomorrow's agenda. Uh, the species status and proposed changes were covered at the January board meeting, and we've also provided some requested informa information to the board on various issues since that time. So since a lot of the information for those species has already been shared in the interest of time, time, I'm not going to rehash it in my presentation this afternoon, but if there are any remaining questions on the seasons and bag limits item for resident species, I'd be glad to try to answer those at the conclusion of my presentation. I'll begin with a quick review of the separate process for setting migratory game bird seasons. Migratory birds, including ducks, geese, doves, and woodcock, are ultimately under federal authority although states do provide input into the regulatory process through the Flyway Council system. And each year after taking species status and Flyway Council recommendations into account, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service provides annual season frameworks within which states select their migratory game bird seasons. And those frameworks set the maximum season length and bag limits for each species, the earliest and latest allowable opening and closing dates for migratory game bird seasons, as well as the allowable number of segments and splits within the, the overall season. Once those federal frameworks become available then at the state level, we obtain hunter input through a few different ways. First of all, an annual waterfowl symposium. This year's was held on March 6th at the Northwest Regional Office. We also take comments to a dedicated uh, email account, and we refer to results of previous hunter surveys. And once we've taken all that input into consideration, 
Bureau of Wildlife Management staff prepare proposed season selections, which are circulated to the Board of Commissioners and to staff for review and comment. And once any changes that arise from that review are incorporated, the Executive Director signs an official selection letter to the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the seasons are published in the Hunting and Trapping Digest. For 2020-21 migratory game bird seasons, most of the proposed seasons are pretty similar to last year. Uh, in this presentation, I'll briefly review two significant changes that were made to federal frameworks last year and that continue for this year. I'll also cover two uh, more minor changes to this year's federal frameworks, as well as three proposed changes to the state level selections. Mallard populations, as shown in the red line on the graph uh, on the left side of this slide, have been declining steadily in the northeastern U.S. for at least the past 20 years. Over that same time period, Pennsylvania's breeding population of mallards has declined by about 50 percent. There are probably multiple factors that go into that decline, but it does appear that overharvest has been one factor. And consequently, under federal frameworks for the 2019-20 season, Mallard bag limits throughout the Atlantic Flyway were reduced from four total, of which two could be hens, to two total, of which only one can be a hen. And that same restriction will continue under the 2020-21 frameworks. So our, all of our hunters need to be aware of that continued restriction. Atlantic population Canada geese breed in the Arctic region of northern Quebec, and they're a significant portion of the goose harvest in the Chesapeake Bay region, as well as in portions of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and New England. Uh, due to a series of late springs on the Arctic breeding grounds for the Atlantic population over the past decade, and that included a near total reproductive failure in the 2018 breeding season, that population has significantly declined. So as a result, under federal frameworks last year, regular season lengths and bag limits in Atlantic population harvest zones in the Atlantic Flyaway, which are the dark brown areas on the map on this slide, uh, those seasons were reduced last year. And for southeastern Pennsylvania, this represented a reduction from a 50-day season with a three-bird bag limit to a 30-day season with a two-bird daily bag limit. And again, that same restriction continues for our Atlantic population zone for the 2020-21 season. It is important to note that for times and places where AP geese are not present, as documented by abandoning research, the seasons are not affected. So the September season remains unchanged for the whole state, and the regular seasons are not affected in other harvest zones. So the light blue and dark blue areas, as you look at the map, are not affected by this restriction. So mallards and AP geese, two fairly important changes last year that will continue for this coming year. Moving on to the new changes and frameworks for this year, the first one is related to scop. In recent years, daily bag limit for this species in the Atlantic Flyway has been two throughout the entire season. But the breeding population, as you see on the population trend graph on the left there, declined enough in 2019 to trigger a reduction to what is called a hybrid scop season. So during a hybrid scop season, the bag limit can be two for only 20 of the 60 days, and it has to be limited to one for the other 40 days. There are some sideboards on where those 20 days can be placed with the higher bag limit. They either have to be the first 20 days, the middle 20 days, or the last 20 days of the duck season, although that choice can vary by individual duck zone. So what we're looking to do in Pennsylvania this year, um, most of our scop harvest in Pennsylvania occurs in the Lake Erie zone, and at, we looked at the average migration dates where uh, scop numbers peak in that part of the state. It tends to be late November and early December, so the proposed season for the Lake Erie zone would place that two bird, uh, two scop per day segment in the middle 20 days for the Lake Erie zone. For the rest of the state, scop are more likely to be encountered later in the season. And so for the other three duck zones, the proposed season would place the 20 days with the two bird bag limit during the last 20 days of each of those respective seasons for those zones. The other framework change for this year really isn't a big deal for Pennsylvania because we did not harvest very many Atlantic brand, but I'll mention it just for the sake of completeness. 
Uh, the Brant population increased in the 2020 winter survey, and so the framework allows for an increase in season length this year from 30 to 50 days. And so what that would mean for Pennsylvania is that our proposed season would open about two weeks earlier than it did last year and extend about one week later than it did in 2019-20. So that covers the two changes to federal frameworks, and now I'll move on to a few proposed changes that we would be making voluntarily uh, rather than being dictated by the federal frameworks. Two of those changes deal with the Southern James Bay population goose zone, which is the area in, uh, if you look at the map on the right of this slide, the area in Mercer, Crawford, Crawford and Erie counties in darker blue. Uh, on the left map of the slide is where the SJBP breeds, uh, northern Ontario and Nunavut in the area highlighted in yellow. Uh, this map has some numbers on it which are really too small to read, but don't worry about the numbers, just focus on the colors uh, that are shown on the map. Um, as you, the brighter red and at particular areas, that means the higher the SJBP harvest was. And as you can see, in the late 1970s, uh, Crawford County in northwestern Pennsylvania, of course that has climate tuning at its center, was one of the three uh, most red areas on the whole map. And so our regulations in that portion of the state had to be based on the population status of the Southern James Bay population. Things have changed, though, over the past 40 years. Uh, we certainly still do harvest some of these geese in northwestern Pennsylvania, but if you look at where the red areas are on the map from 2011 to 2015, you can see that those have shifted to Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario. And if you look at the table, you can see that whereas Pennsylvania accounted for almost 20% of the harvest on this population in the late 70s, that's declined to less than 5% more recently. And simil similarly, the rest of the Atlantic Flyway has also, also now accounts for a lower percentage than it did a few decades ago. Uh, meantime, by contrast, harvest in Canada has just about doubled in the last 40 years. So in short, the biology for this population has changed and the wintering range of these birds has shifted to the north and to the west. So along with that fact that we just covered that the SJBP is no longer a significant component of harvest in Pennsylvania, there have been some changes to overall management approach for this population in the past few years. The Mississippi Flyway has merged this population with two other populations for monitoring purposes and management decisions from a federal framework standpoint are now made exclusively on a Mississippi Flyway basis, and SJBP geese that are now harvested in the Atlantic Flyway are basically just considered to be incidental harvest that does not need to be specifically managed. So when we combine all these factors, they do mean that at least in terms of the reasons for which it was originally established, the SJBP zone in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania has really become obsolete at this point, and so it's appropriate to move toward eliminating that zone. However, that being said, there are a couple side benefits of that zone that we want to make sure uh, don't pose a major problem if we give those up, and certainly one of those is we want to make sure that we do not inadvertently, by making any changes, increase harvest on the resident goose flock at time of tuning because, because with the fact that SJBP geese are now so much rarer in northwestern Pennsylvania. Really, hunting opportunities at Pima Tuning depend on that resident goose flock, and so we want to make sure it's at least stable, if not increasing. So as we look uh, to make some of those changes, what we'd like to do for the 2020-21 season is first to maintain the September season restrictions that have already been in place in the immediate Pima Tuning area in western Crawford County but to increase the September season bag limit in the remainder of that zone from one goose daily, which it has been the last few years, to five geese per day. Also, for the regular season in the entire zone, we plan to experimentally open and close the regular season about two weeks later than we have in recent years. Uh, and the reason for that is because if we do eliminate that zone, an early October opening date, as we've used in past years, would no longer be an option for us under federal frameworks. So again, we want to try that and make sure it's not a problem before we go ahead and eliminate the zone. We would plan to eliminate or evaluate the effects of this year's changes on the resident goose population at climate tuning, as well as on hunter satisfaction in that part of the state. 
If it did turn out that we found any unexpected problems with either of those issues, we could fall back to using the existing zone for a while longer until we figure out solutions to any problems that we uh, identify. On the other hand, if everything goes well, we could move ahead with eliminating that zone in another year or two, and certainly that would uh, simplify regulations and bring us into line with the biology that we've talked about. The third and final proposed change in this year's uh, migratory game bird season selections relates to additional hunting opportunity for active duty military members and veterans. Uh, there was some federal legislation passed about a year ago that added two special waterfowl hunting days for these groups, and those are similar to the existing youth waterfowl days in that they can be over and above the 60 days of regular duck season and that they can vary by zone. And those military veterans days can either be concurrent with the youth days or one or both of the military veterans days can be separate. And last year, mainly because that legislation was passed so late in the season setting process and there were a lot of unanswered questions about it, only three of the 17 Atlantic Flyway states chose to take those days, New Jersey, Virginia, and North Carolina. And all three of those states placed them concurrently with their youth waterfowl days. And to be quite honest, there's really little data available on what that additional participation meant in terms of waterfowl harvest or how that opportunity was received from a social human dimension standpoint, although the states that did take those days last year reported both positive and negative feedback. Uh, this year it sounds like most Atlantic Flyway states are going to take those uh, two military veterans days and make them concurrent with their youth days. What we're proposing for Pennsylvania is kind of a half of a half step in that direction where we take only one of the two available uh, military veterans days and in each case make it concurrent with the second youth day in the respective duck zones. So with that, I'll try to take any questions. I know the technology is a little bit clunky to uh, have people ask questions, but if we uh, have any either on the migratory game bird seasons or again if there's anything on the resident uh, seasons and bag limits the, the board will be voting on tomorrow, I can try to answer any of those questions at this point. Hopefully the silence means that everything was good and clear. I guess so, Ian. If we have any other questions, we could we could follow up with, with them later. But um, uh, I guess one last opportunity. If not, we'll pick back up with uh, Chris Rosenberry next with the deer and elk section um, quotas. Chris, the floor is yours. taking a nap. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me? We got you now loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, this afternoon I will provide updates on our deer and elk uh, populations as well as make recommendations for our elk and deer licenses for the upcoming season. Uh, we are recommending 22 additional elk licenses for 2020. The breakdown of elk licenses by season can be seen on this slide. For the archery season, we are recommending five more bull tags and six more cow tags. For the general firearm season, we are recommending 26 bull tags compared to 27 last year and seven more cow tags. And then for the late analyst season, we are recommending five additional tags. Here's the 2020 elk license recommendations by zone and season. We are recommending a total of 164 tags with 36 bull tags and 128 analyst tags or cow tags. Across the 14 zones, zones two and 12 have the highest elk population and the highest allocations. Zone seven, which surrounds the primary viewing area and the elk country visitor center has zero tags. This slide shows the license allocation changes from last year to this year. The changes are noted in parentheses. 
with blue indicating increases uh, from last year and red indicating decreases. The increases in zones three and four are in response to uh, steady increases in these populations, as well as the relative success in last year's archery season. The increases in zones five and 14 are in response to concerns regarding existing deer, or existing elk human conflicts or the potential for elk human conflicts in the future. In addition to the elk license allocations, we are requesting board acceptance of the new elk management plan. The plan has undergone internal and public review in the last few months. During the public comment period, we received 17 comments. Most were related to a desire to expand the elk population beyond the current elk management area or to increase fees or limit opportunities for non-resident hunters. Following the required internal and public reviews, staff is requesting the board accept the final version of this five-year elk management plan. Moving on to the 2020-2021 antlerless allocation. Publicly identified and supported deer management goals guide us in making our antlerless license recommendations. The goals to manage deer for healthy and sustainable deer populations, for healthy and sustainable forests, and for acceptable levels of deer-human conflict receive high levels of support from hunters and the public. Each goal has specific questions that must be answered to determine our deer population recommendation and subsequently the allocation. Under the healthy deer goal, we ask questions about chronic wasting disease, farm to doe ratios, and deer population trends. We answer these questions with data collected by Game Commission personnel from across the state. Under the forest health goal, we ask questions about forest regeneration and deer impact. These questions are answered with data that are collected by the U.S. Forest Service who annually visit plots on public and private land throughout Pennsylvania. And finally, under the deer human conflict goal, we ask how many deer people want. This question is answered using data collected by a third party survey company. Once we analyze the data and answer the questions, we then make our recommendations based on a defined process. This chart shows the decision process we work through for each wildlife management unit, and the answers to each of these questions are based on unit-specific data. The population trends are to increase, decrease, or stabilize the unit deer population. And once we've arrived at the deer population trend objective, we then set the endless allocation recommendations to achieve that population objective. And I'll go through some of the data as well as our recommendations for this upcoming hunting season. More residents consider deer populations too high in Pennsylvania over the last decade. This slide shows Pennsylvania wildlife management units where more than 25% of residents consider the deer population too high or too low. From 2011 to 2019, more residents said the deer population was too high in more units as indicated by the in increase in red units on these maps. As a result, residents in fewer units said deer populations were too low. From the perspective of Pennsylvania residents, deer populations have increased in the last decade, and this is also supported by the increasing harvest that we've observed uh, over that same time period. In contrast to our surveys of state residents, Deer hunters indicate, or deer hunter surveys, indicate that many of our deer hunters consistently want more deer. These results are based on our 2011 and 2017 deer hunter surveys. In each survey, hunter responses were consistent, with more than 25% of the hunters saying deer populations were too low in nearly all of our wildlife management units. Forest regeneration and deer impacts vary across the state. Forest regeneration is good in three units, uh, 2F, 3B, and 4A, and they are highlighted in dark green. In unit 2A, forest regeneration was considered poor. Forest regeneration is only fair in the remaining units. In most units, deer impacts are acceptable, 
except in units 3C, 3D, and 4E, where deer impacts are considered too high. Our deer populations remain sustainable in all of our units with stable or increasing deer population trends. We have detected declines in fawn to doe ratios in a handful of units. However, we see no indication that fawn to doe ratios are affecting population trends as all of these units have stable deer populations. So as a result, we are not recommending any management changes to those units. Chronic wasting disease remains a serious and growing threat to our deer population. In this slide, the shaded areas represent last year's DMA boundaries. All these DMAs will expand in 2020. The red dots represent CWD infected deer locations prior to 2018. The red blocks represent townships where CWD infected deer were found in 2019 as well as 2020 to date. As a result of this growing problem, we are recommending reduced deer populations in units with free ranging CWD infected deer. Although this much, although there is much uh, uncertain about CWD and its potential impacts, lower deer populations do appear to be related to lower impact of CWD on those deer populations. Thus our recommendation to reduce deer population trends in the affected units. Some of these recommendations are more aggressive than in the past with an allocation to increase the harvest by one and a half deer per square mile uh, compared to our standard adjustment of one harvested antlerless deer per square mile. We are making recommendations to reduce deer populations in units 2C, 2D, 2E, 4A, 4B, 4D, and 5A. We have not made a recommendation to reduce deer numbers in unit 5B for two reasons. Uh, first, the CWD infections in that unit are limited to captive facilities, and second, both of those captive facilities have been depopulated. So this is a summary map that shows our recommendations to stabilize deer population trends in most units, but reduce deer populations in 10 units due to CWD concerns in those units in the south central and southwestern part of the state and to reduce deer impacts on those three units there in the Northeast. And although we're recommending stable populations in most units, you may notice some increased allocations in some of those units where we're recommending a stable population. Uh, one example is unit 1B. It has a recommendation to stabilize the population, but the population trend is increasing. As a result, we are recommending higher allocations to stop the population growth. So the higher allocation in that unit does not mean that we're trying to reduce it. Rather, we're trying to stop the population from growing. And in order to do that, we need to allocate more licenses in that unit than we have in the past. Uh, unit 2F has those same circumstances, and we are recommending a higher allocation in 2F as well. So this slide shows last year's allocations and this year's recommendations depending upon the length of the concurrent firearm season. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay, Chris, I don't hear any questions coming in. So um, I'd like to move on to our last speaker today. Dr. Corin Jag now is the Human Dimension Specialist here at the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And so Corin, if, if you don't mind, you can take the floor and finish up with our last presentation today. Okay, all right, I'm here. Everybody hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Okay, um, thanks for your time today and for sticking around uh, for this. So uh, I'm Corin Jagnow and I'll be talking about recruited and reactivated hunters uh, and the Saturday opener. Okay. Not quite sure how I get to the next slide here. Hey, 
it should pop up on the left hand side there it of the screen. Yep. Okay, okay. There, you go. there it is. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, today, I'll just give you a couple of definitions uh, about what we're talking about. So our new hunters are what I'm going to be calling recruited hunters. These are individual hunters who never had a CID before. Uh, these would be youth, juniors, and adults who have not bought a license in PALS. Um, a lapsed hunter would be what we're calling a reactivated hunter, someone who had a previous CID but had taken at least a one-year break from purchasing. So uh, in this particular case, since we've had PALS since 2010, we have people who can have up year to eight years of lapsing. So anyone from the last time they bought was in 2017-18, took a year off, and then purchased again this year. Up to eight years lapsed with someone who would have purchased for the last time. So this is someone who bought a license in 2010-11 and hasn't purchased a license since then, but bought one this year. All right. Um, if we take a look at as of January 31st, 2020, uh, we had sold a total of 851,536 total licenses, which was up about 0.43%, which I discussed at my uh, last presentation a few months ago. When we take a look at those 851,000 individuals, about 15% of these hunters are in what we're in this group that we're calling uh, either recruited or reactivated hunters. So these were people who were not in PALS last year. Then we have, that means 126,403 of them as of February 9th. So that's when licensing got our uh, data to us. And so I just the analysis based on what they sent me uh, as of February 9th. So what we see here, a few things we'll notice is that 17% of them were female. Uh, that is much higher than we see in our regular licensed purchasers. 87% um, of them were residents. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that the single largest group in this 126,000 are individuals who were born in the 1990s. So we have um, among those born in the 90s, those are people who uh, are roughly in their 20s. They, about a third of them were new hunters and two thirds of them were reactivated hunters. Uh, then the next to largest group, uh, so there's about 25,000 of each of these, 25,000 of people born in the 90s and then another additional 24,000 plus born in the 2000s and about two thirds of them were new hunters and about a third of them were reactivated. So we really kind of see a difference there. I keep wanting to press my forward arrow. There we go. Um, our newly recruited hunters, if we take a look at them as just one group, so these are people who had never had a CID in our PAL system before. There are about 50,000 of those individuals, and 40% of them are new hunter, 40% of that 126,000 are our newly recruited hunters. Uh, that about 82.6%, 83% of them were residents. And we see here a very high percentage of females. And this is mostly accounted for because they're so young. So we see that uh, about 44% of these new hunters were born after the year 2000. So that means they're um, up to 20 years old. That's the oldest they could be. Um, then we have 30% born in the 80s and 90s, another 19% born in the 60s and 70s, and just 88% born before 1960. But still, these are brand new people who at least had not shown up in PALS before. And then if we take a look at our reactivated hunters, uh, we have about 75,000 of them out of the 126,000. So it's about 60% of the people we're talking today are these reactivated hunters. They can occur anywhere from a one-year reactivation to an eight-year reactivation. 90% uh, of them were residents, and then we see a much smaller percentage here, but still higher than what we see in our regular license buyers, just under 13% of them are female. Um, this is still probably because of maybe being less avid that we see a higher percentage of our female uh, hunters in this group of reactivated hunters. Um, the young adults and adult hunters, uh, we see a much smaller percentage here. Not a surprise that those who are younger than 20, only 12% of them are reactivated. Uh, about 40% are born in the 80s and 90s, and then we have um, you know, smaller percentages there of those born in the 60s and 70s and those before, born, born before 1960. Okay, if we take a look here at, so we just see the age at the time of purchase. So this really starts with on the left there in the x-axis is, you know, zero to 10 up through people who are, you know, basically 
uh, 80 and older, if we look at it that way. So um, those who are under 10 up through those born in the 90s, that's all getting right around 25,000 individuals if we when we look at that total red line at the top. But of course, you might notice that the lighter green line of people who are reactivated hunters, that only goes past it when we look in the 1990s. So we have um, more, react, nor, more new hunters and those younger age group. People who are younger are more likely to be those um, new hunters and our reactivated hunters are just as soon as we reach the 90s, that obviously surpasses those. So that's just one way to look at it, just something to take a look at at the ages of these different people. Uh, another thing, and really as we get into the Saturday opener, which I haven't talked a whole lot about, and anything we look at as far as license purchase comes in this idea of correlation versus causation. So one of the first things to take a look at is, okay, well, we know when we have a lot of license purchase among just in our regular license buyers in any given year. These are just our new and reactivated hunters. We see a spike among those who are brand new hunters or those who are one year reactivated in the early months, especially July there, but then it kind of tapers off for every group. But by far, we see the most licenses sold for any one of these groups, either the new or the reactivated hunters is in November. So we have 35% of all of the licenses bought um, by new and reactivated hunters is in the month of November. And then we drill down a little bit closer, and I've talked a lot about this before. Again, these are correlations between what people are doing, but this November 29th date, I think, is a really important thing for us to look at because we know, obviously, there are a few other opportunities to hunt after this date, but the opening of the deer rifle season has consistently been the biggest draw among our licensed buyers and, you know, something that people universally participate in. We've done surveys, and we see, you know, in, over the last five years, we have usually 95% plus of people who participate in some kind of deer hunting. So to take a look at this day before, I think is a really good idea of seeing maybe people who are less avid, that they only go hunting when they know they have the opportunity to, whether it's access, weather, having time off work, whatever it could be. So we see some activity, as I've mentioned, those new hunters in that one-year reactivation early in the license buying year. But then when we get to that November 29th date, for every single group that is a, a big license purchase date, and the, it's the only day actually where the, I think the one year reactivation exceeds the number of purchases by the new year, but the blue one is just being covered up by the orange. So the blue is just like right underneath that. They're both basically right at 4,000 licenses being bought by either new or reactivated. And then all the other ones are just a slightly less than that. So this was just one of those things, obviously that's, uh, Spike always has gotten uh, our notice and one of the things that, you know, I've looked at the longer I've worked here and really something we couldn't look at until we had PALS. So if we look at November 29th purchase, if we have all of these new and reactivated hunters, we had 10% of them buying on one single day. So that was 12,451 individuals bought the license on this day. Um, when we look at new hunters versus reactivated hunters, we had about 8%, a little less than 8% buying on November 29th. Um, and then our reactivated hunters about, you know, a little over 11% bought on November 29th. And this isn't really a surprise, especially because we see how young our new hunters typically are that they live in hunting households that might be a little bit more avid, that they grew up in a hunting culture where they have people to take them hunting earlier in the year, or they might be motivated to get an antlerless license at the beginning of the year when we see those peaks in um, July for the new hunters. Uh, reactivated hunters, as we've known before, they may just be the type that they only go hunting once they know that they have the opportunity. So I'll just go I'll drill down just a little bit more if we look at the date of purchase. Um, this November 29th purchase for how many years they've been lapsed. So we look at this new, I had talked about that 7.8, but then that's an 11.4% purchase by all reactivated hunters. But if we look as soon as we get two years lapsing or longer since they purchased their last license, we're consistently looking at 12% or above with maybe one exception there. And we can even see that four year lapse. So those people who haven't bought a license since 2014, I, I think it would be fair to say that that's probably not somebody who would describe themselves as an avid hunter. 14% of those four year lapse people um, bought a license the day before the opener of the general firearms deer season this year. So I, those were some numbers that really stuck out to me. That's one single day of purchase there. So as I've mentioned before, and I, you know, I say this a lot, these are things that when 
people buy late. We don't ask them, are you buying this specifically because you want to go hunting tomorrow and because it's a Saturday opener? We, we don't have the ability to do that at a point of sale. And so one thing we do have the ability to do is focus groups and we can do some questionnaires later on too. But one of the things we can do a little bit faster are these focus groups, which we've done um, through the Center for Survey Research at Penn State Harrisburg, and they do a great job for us. And We've been asking some kind of a question about the Saturday opener since uh, November 28th, 2018. We've had 12 focus groups um, in the, about the last year and three months. And we've had over 120 individuals participate in these, and this can be hunters, lapsed hunters. Uh, we have had hunter ed grads and instructors as well. We've had them at four geographically diverse Commonwealth campuses. So anyone that isn't marked would have been a focus group at Harrisburg, but then we've also had them at New Kensington and Mount Alto and Great Valley. Uh, and just for this particular presentation, I've had um, Nicole Sturgis from the Center for Survey Research put this document together just for this presentation today. And this is just an overall synthesis of the findings of the Saturday opener. And the way it is described in this report is an overwhelming support for the Saturday opener. So um, and the, these things are all logical. And I think this was sort of the idea in creating this is that it would provide more time for people to get out in the woods and participate. Um, and the opportunity to go hunting without having to take off work or school was very appealing. And there's just some quotes here. I'll, I'll let you read some of them, but I'll, I'll read a few right now is, it gave the opportunity for a lot of hunters to get out into the woods who would normally not be able to have off on opening day. And it's, I loved it, it gave me an extra day. And so those are just some of the, the overwhelmingly uh, positive comments. I do wanna just give a, a couple of minutes to some of the people who were not supportive of it. And we do hear obviously um, from some hunters who preferred to keep it as that Monday opener. Uh, but some of the people who did not support it is they actually didn't like that Sunday in between. They, they liked an extra day to hunt. They felt it was frustrating, inconvenient to have to stop hunting on that Sunday. And for some, it was enough for them to not even to bother to go on the opening Saturday. There's a, a good quote here. Um, I didn't like that it started on a Saturday and then you had a gap since you couldn't hunt on Sunday. Uh, another group of people who didn't necessarily support it were those who just didn't like the change of the tradition of the Monday opener, which is certainly a group we've heard from uh, here at the Game Commission is the disruption of the tradition mentioned uh, by them is if I go home for Thanksgiving now I need to rush back to get to get back to prepare to hunt. Uh, I like things old school, I will not hunt that day. Uh, and then you know talking about uh, some of the camaraderie at the camp that they will miss by having the Saturday opener. Uh, another thing we asked, and this was really just since we had seen this uh, slight increase in our license sales, but we asked some of these uh, focus group participants what they thought, um, if it had any impact on the licenses sold. So they acknowledged that non-residents might find it easier to hunt. And I think in my previous presentation, uh, we had seen that the increase in that, but also, uh, one of the things that was kind of universally acknowledged at these focus groups is, of course, it was going to be more popular. And to some people, there was almost concern that it would be so popular that the state game lands and just other places out there would become too crowded, that it was logical that because Saturday was a weekend and most people don't have to go to work and virtually no one has to go to school, that it would be a uh, much more popular day. But one of the things that if we had someone at a focus group who hunted every year, obviously they wouldn't change their behavior if they were gonna continue to buy, but they did know people who planned to purchase because of the Saturday opener. And I think there's you know three good quotes here that they included is I heard that people actually purchased a license this year. Deer rifle is the only thing they hunted and the fact that they couldn't hunt the first day, which is usually the best day, they didn't purchase a license and now they did. And I knew someone who specifically bought a license this year because of the opportunity to hunt on Saturday. I know a college student who purchased since they could go out on Saturday before having to return to school. So those are just some of the things that we've gotten over the course of about a year and a few months of asking this question about the Saturday opener in our focus groups. So I'll just do a quick summary here. Uh, so our newer hunters are more likely to be younger hunters. So that's 44% of the people who have bought for the first time uh, were born after the year 2000. That means they're 20 or younger. Um, they likely live in these hunting households um, and a higher percentage of these are female. So almost 24% of these new hunters um, are new hunters compared to our reactivated hunters. Uh, but reactivated hunters are more likely to be a young adults, um, really. So anybody uh, from born uh, before the night, 
or before 2000, so 1990s and before, um, so our young adults and adults. But we do see this consistency in the month of purchase uh, for both groups. We see a little bit of a spike in July for the one year lapsed and the new hunters, but really that month of November, over one third of our new and reactivated hunters bought in that month. And when we look specifically at this day before Saturday opener, it had a higher percentage of reactivated purchasers than new purchasers. So we had uh, almost 8% of our new hunters buying on that single day before that November 29th compared to 11.4% of our reactivated hunters. Uh, just a summary here of these focus groups, an overwhelming support was the way Penn State Harrisburg described this for Saturday opener among focus group participants. It provided more time for the people to hunt and didn't have to take off or work or school to op hunt on opening day. They did express an interest in having the Sunday in between the opening day and Monday available to hunt. Um, and those who didn't support this uh, did not like the disruption to the traditions of a Monday opener. And then the participants felt that a Saturday opener would mean more hunters would purchase the license and go hunting on a Saturday instead of a Monday. So just a few quick conclusions here. Uh, I think we need to be careful what we say, you know, just saying that's absolutely the cause of this, but 10% of the licenses are sold to new and reactivated hunters were sold on that November 29th, the day before the Saturday opener. Um, and this suggests that the Saturday opener was what I would call facilitating reactivation. And the focus groups confirmed that those who have issues with time to hunt would find it easier to go on a Saturday and that it could lead to an increase in license sales. So that's everything I have. Thank you very much. I'm certainly happy to take any questions now or if they want to have questions for Ian and Chris as well. Corn, how did the license sales compare to last year for uh, 2019 versus 2020 on the day before? You know, I, I don't have that with me right now. I did present that. I think that some of it compared to it, it, it's different because we didn't have that same day. And so we, we hadn't sold nearly as many the day before the Monday opener. But it, there is sort of more of a, a weekend that goes on there. But we did see that the single day before licenses were sold this year, we were much higher this year than last year. But I don't have that available right now. And that's probably something that we can get. OK, any other questions? Well, at this time, I'd like to, we're going to close out the meeting. I want to thank the public for attending today. It was a very well done presentation. I want to thank all of our speakers for everything you've done uh, to make this such a great, successful day. We will reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m. for the uh, formal business meeting of the Board of Commissioners. Thank you again and have a good day. <laughs>